recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and good morning uh, to all of our colleagues here, those who are tuned in online, uh, and those who have joined us in the public gallery, a couple of familiar faces who I saw last night at a fundraiser uh, in the wonderful district of 24 of Angeline Muscouche. I had the pleasure to go up and participate in a dinner uh, organized by the local uh, MLA and the Minister of Economic uh, uh, Growth. And it was a wonderful, wonderful event, and we raised uh, uh, money for the uh, school, uh, uh, school playgrounds in Evangeline and Muscoach Schools. So I uh, really wanted to say thank you to all who participated. It was a wonderful night. Uh, a room uh, full of positivity, which uh, would be great if it extends uh, uh, today uh, uh, throughout <laughs> Prince Edward Island, and we could package that from uh, Abrams Village and share it with Islanders. So uh, a great night helped by all. Uh, a late night and an early morning, I had the chance to meet this morning uh, with uh, Canada's ambassador to Mexico, His Excellency Graham Clark. Uh, we talked uh, a great deal about the uh, relationship between PEI and Mexico and how it has been grown uh, through agriculture, trade and immigration. Uh, we talked a lot about the, there's an election in June uh, for uh, the, the country of Mexico where the new president, it looks, the two leading candidates are both women, so Mexico after June the 2nd will have a woman president for the first time. Uh, and we talked about the election in the U.S. later on in the year and the importance of the, the Kusma uh, uh, arrangement that will be not renegotiated, but will be rediscussed in, in 2026. So uh, the opportunity for Canada and Mexico to work together to try to uh, make sure that arrangement works uh, for all three countries. So it was a, a great meeting and uh, <clears throat> there will be a, a, a skills trade mission later on this year to Mexico where our skills trades and construction industry will look to uh, recruit some workers for uh, much needed for our industry. So, uh, a great meeting. Uh, later uh, today, I will uh, be speaking at the Tai Pai luncheon in Charlottetown. Uh, it's the Tai Pai Industry Day. Corinne Clements and Tai Pai are gearing up for what they hope and expect to be a very strong uh, year. Uh, we have a wonderful tourism offering. We keep growing our assets each and every year all across PEI. So, I'm excited to talk with uh, tourism officials and hear. Uh, about their hopes and wishes for, for what we hope will be a great year. And just finally, I mentioned that the ECMAs will be coming here in the next uh, number of days, and uh, uh, they did take the opportunity to announce uh, some honorary awards which will be given out during the ECMA event here in Charlottetown. Uh, uh, one of our great gifted musician Scott Parsons is going to be recognized with the Bucky Adams Memorial Award. Uh, Daryl Gallant is going to be recognized uh, uh, for a Musician's Achievement Award. Um, of course, Bruce Guthrow, who is not from PEI, but was almost a transplanted Islander for many years, uh, will be giving a, a Director's Special Achievement war Award for his exceptional contribution to the music industry in this region. Uh, and also, I was so glad to hear and it always makes me sad that our, our own Carrie Wynn McLeod will be the PEI recipient of the Stop and Tom Award. And of course, nobody loved music and performed music any better than my friend Carrie Wynn. She loved the ECMAs. She traveled far and wide to participate in ECMA Week. And I know her spirit will be here with us. And it's so wonderful that she be recognized with this award. And uh, I couldn't think of someone any better to get it. And uh, I still miss her every day. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and enjoy the proceedings. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today. And welcome to those watching online and those who are visiting the gallery today. Welcome. Um, it was a really a beautiful morning. I left the house around 6 a.m. There was quite a bit of frost in the vehicle, but there was no wind. But it's just one of those days that makes you feel really good about getting up early, which uh, in the past was a, a struggle for me. Uh, but now I, I do enjoy it. The driving was uh, awesome to listen to the radio. And by the time I get to town, I'm uh, at least presentable to talk to. Um, so with that, um, I was up last night quite late too. Um, there was an event at the Parish uh, Centre in Tignesh I talked about yesterday being National Film Day and uh, Anna Green Gables uh, was playing. It was three hours and 18 minutes long. So we had to wait until 9.18 to get in and start peeling potatoes and carrots and, and what have you for an event that we're um, co-hosting uh, this evening for three quilting clubs uh, in West Prince. So I look forward to that. And I also look forward to getting out in the air this weekend and getting uh, it cleaned up, although the weather tomorrow doesn't sound very favorable. 
but uh, it does help with uh, what I mentioned earlier this week about uh, those who have already done the yard work and cleaning up brush, uh, brush in the yard and uh, dead leaves and, and grass and burning it to, to be very, 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 very cautious of the fire index and, uh, and what you're doing, never leave a fire on the tent. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I wish everyone a great day of debate in this House and a great weekend. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to all my colleagues and the pages joining us this morning, everyone in the gallery, and everyone tuning in from around the island, and especially those tuning in from Charlottetown Victoria Park. Um, I had the opportunity last night to attend parent-teacher interviews at high school for the very first time. Um, and uh, so wish, I know that parent-teacher interviews continue today, so wishing the teachers particip participating in parent-teacher interviews a great, a great day, and those participating in uh, pro professional development a great day as well. And to all the students, I hope that you get outside today and enjoy some of this beautiful sunshine. Um, Songs for a Small Planet will present uh, an Earth Day concert at the Poor House tonight at 7.30. The concert will feature Amelia May, Justin Time, Teresa Doyle, and Tom McLean. The evening will be a musical celebration for Planet Earth with a songwriter circle on the theme of environmental activism, climate change, and social justice. Songs for a Small Planet is an international songwriting collective focused on climate activism and promoting environmental sustainability and social justice through the power of original music. And those core members include Todd McLean, Teresa Doyle, Rob Oakey, Catherine McClellan, Emmanuel LeBlanc, and Dennis Ellsworth. The group will also be hosting a workshop here in Charlottetown during the upcoming ECMAs. And the doors open at 7 p.m. and again, that's at the Poor House. And today is Todd McLean's birthday, so I'd like to wish that phenomenal human being a great birthday, and I hope that he's spoiled rotten. He's recently started going around playing the surprise saxophone uh, visits at people's birthday parties, and I love watching those videos because people get such great joy from that. So wishing Todd just as much joy on his birthday. And Mr. Speaker, um, we think of them every day, but especially today, it's five years ago today that we lost Josh and Oliver Underhay. And so just sending out some love to his wife, Carrie Shea, and their son, Lyndon, thinking of his mom, Sally McDonald, his dad, John Underhay, and sisters, Sarah, brother, Mitch, and their very large extended family and his many friends. Um, their le legacy lives on in, in so many ways through bike-friendly communities and Oliver's song that provides art bursaries and opportunities for children to attend summer camps and take music lessons. And um, I, there's a, a framed uh, quote from Oliver in our office that was a gift from the member from New Haven, Rocky Point, um, after Josh and Oliver's uh, untimely passing. And I'm just going to read that because I think it's important for us all to remember. If I'm elected, I will dedicate myself to serving Islanders. I will listen, I will follow the evidence, and balance the freedom of the individual with the need to work as a community and care for one another. I will work for a diverse and tolerant society that respects the dignity of the person and the rights of everyone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Borden Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, everybody, uh, and watching online uh, and in the gallery, um, and especially to the uh, good people in District 19, Borden Kinkora. Um, just a brief uh, greeting, uh, Mr. Speaker, this morning as we wind up the Volunteer Appreciation uh, Week and the importance that our volunteers uh, contribute to all of our programs and our societal events. Uh, when I first came back to PEI in 2003, I think I was back for about two days before my phone rang and it was the Kidney Foundation uh, and somehow they knew I was back, uh, knew my history with kidney disease and they got me in the, in the door volunteering very quickly and from there um, my community involvement just seemed to, to snowball and uh, I know that from working so many years with the Kidney Foundation, the great work that the volunteers do. In fact, the Kidney Foundation of Canada was the last uh, charitable organization to do door-to-door um, door knocking for, for, for money, for donations, which seems, seems like something that uh, is the thing of the past, uh, going door to door and asking people for money, um, but uh, it was part of our fundraising initiatives um, and just discontinued not that long ago. But just to shout out to all the great volunteers for all the different health charities and other organizations uh, in the province and the country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety and Attorney General. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and welcome uh, Friday morning here. It's a beautiful day outside, and uh, uh, remind, I want to wish all the farmers with their growing season ahead uh, all the best of success. 
I know I hope to get out and uh, spread some manure this weekend, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and that reminds me of uh, five years ago when, uh, after I was elected, uh, the Honourable Premier called me. He said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm spreading manure. He said, well, you're going to get to spread some more because you're going to be my agricultural minister. So um, that was five years ago. But uh, I want to wish all the farmers all the best. Uh, it's a busy household in my house today. My son is writing his last exam in university, first year university. Uh, my middle girl is getting four wisdom teeth out today, Madam Speaker. And the good news, my youngest is 14 today, yeah. so <laughs> it's uh, mixed emotions on uh, to today. But uh, I want to wish Janelle a happy birthday. The uh, Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you, and good morning to everybody uh, in the legislature. And uh, I'd like to say uh, hi to everyone that's watching from uh, wonderful District 24, if they're up, because most of them were at the district dinner last night. So a uh, uh, shout out to all of them uh, who were there last night, and thanks to everybody that uh, did attend and support the District 24 dinner. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge a special guest that we have in the gallery, my MA, called her my work wife, uh, who is keeping me on my toes and uh, helping me out in the district on a daily basis. So thank you very much and welcome Francine to uh, the legislature. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Social Development, Seniors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Welcome everyone here today and welcome to those at home who are watching and it's a pleasure to rise today to recognize Colleen McDonald, Mr. Speaker. Colleen is marking her last day with Child and Family Services today after 44 years. Yeah. It's an incredible milestone, more than four decades in child protection, helping island children and families. I would like to thank Colleen for her dedication and impactful work and wish her a wonderful and well-deserved retirement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and it is certainly is a pleasure to rise here in the legislature this morning on what is a beautiful day outside. Uh, great to see uh, one's joining us here in the gallery this morning as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as it's already been mentioned here uh, uh, this morning, this is the wrap-up, basically, of Volunteer Appreciation Week. And uh, as Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure in the MLA for District 26, I certainly want to express my appreciation to all the great volunteers right across the island from tip to tip, but certainly recognize ones up in District 26, uh, Albert and Bloomfield as well of great work that uh, the volunteers at the West Prince Caring Cupboard do for, uh, for right across the West Prince area. Uh, our firefighters in Alberton, and certainly Mr. Speaker of the Western Hospital Foundation and auxiliary volunteer members uh, for the great work that they do in raising funds for our Western Hospital. And uh, just finally, Mr. Speaker, as I had mentioned here a few days ago, there's uh, two variety of concerts coming up, two fundraise for ultrasound equipment at Western Hospital. The first one being a week from this evening, and the second one a week from Sunday evening, both of those taking place at West Isle Composite High School. So anybody that's in the West Prince area, certainly urge you to drop by. I know it'll be an enjoyable and a fun evening. Thank you. The Minister of Education in Early Years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure to rise today. Welcome back to all my colleagues and hello to everybody tuning in online, uh, especially those in District 9, Charlottetown, Hillsborough Park, and hello to those joining us here in the gallery. It's great to see you today on this, again, beautiful, beautiful Friday. Um, as many have noted, uh, we are wrapping up a Volunteer Appreciation Week, and I do want to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the volunteers across the island who are doing such tremendous work. Um, in the district at East Royalty, the, uh, the East Royalty Lions Club, uh, Mr. Speaker, they are fantastic, a wonderful group of individuals that are just so willing to serve. Um, and it's, uh, it's really an exciting time of year for them as they have their annual dinner theater. So it's happening this Saturday. 
um, at the Malcolm Dara Center at 7 p.m. It's a, a dinner theater. It's called The Rat Pack, presented by the East Royalty Lions uh, Club, as well as the Eddie May Murder Mystery. So, Mr. Speaker, if there's anybody tuning in who doesn't have plans on Saturday night, there's still a couple of tickets available. Uh, you can contact David at 902-394-5778, and I can assure you it's going to be a fantastic night. They always put on a great show, and it's, uh, it's always interesting to find out who the, the mysterious uh, players are. So, appreciate uh, this, Mr. Speaker, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Statements by members. The member for O'Leary and Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In my 18 years as the MLA for O'Leary and Inverness, I've come to appreciate the legislative process. Its nuances, its subtleties, how government achieve objectives, and how opposition play a role in holding government to account. Everyone in here is working to improve the lives of Islanders. The Premier and government boast about collaboration, how they support the democratic process, the institutions of the Auditor General, legislative committees, and the budgetary consultation process. Yet time and time again, this government contradicts themselves and are no different than any previous government or parties that they have criticized. And I'm going to give you a few examples. How fiscally responsible is a government posting a fiscal deficit of $85 million? How respectable are they if the Auditor General went under questioning? It has been shown that their budget estimates have no foundation in accuracy. Case in point would be the accessibility fund. The department admits this is underfunded, yet has significantly less money in the column. How does this respect the legislative process of showing fiscal accountability or transparency? It doesn't. How about the two private member bills brought to the Committee of the Whole recently? The Farm Vendors and Machinery Act was debated in the fall, sent to an all-party legislative committee, and after hearing from stakeholders and got feedback, came to a consensus on changes to strengthen the original bill. The committee presented a report to the legislature with four recommendations, yet government felt the bill was flawed, yet no amendments were tabled, and voted it down along party lines. They argued the same this week with the third party bill. The Legislative Assembly staff worked very hard on these bills, writing them, organizing our committee meetings, lining up presenters, and the list goes on. We are told government departments, they do a better job. I find that insulting to the legislature and our staff. We in opposition take a role of holding government to account seriously and have very few legislative tools to do so. Unless you have been in opposition, you wouldn't understand. But hey, you keep on making the legislative moves you're doing to crush opposition, you will find out sooner than one expects what it's like to be in opposition. <laughs> Honourable Member, just remind you that according to Rule 23, uh, sorry, Rule 24, that 90 seconds are supposed to be 90 seconds. And I know you've been warned uh, on at least one occasion uh, again and now again. So if you could practice perhaps your member statement beforehand. And, and <laughs> questions by members, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So this week, I think we began to get a glimpse of uh, the Premier's idea of government. Like too many Conservatives that preceded him, the Premier seems to believe in the idea of providing a few people taxpayers' resources, with the idea that this wealth will trickle down to everyone. And for the most part, I believe this is lazy thinking and reflects a deep unwillingness to do the hard work and invest properly in public services that benefit everyone. Will the Minister please tell the House why, why is this government giving so much money to the private sector to provide long-term care to Islanders? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think we've discussed this uh, at length for a number of days now. Uh, our government continues to invest in all aspects of our health care system, our approach as a small island that is growing and the, with the complex needs in health care that all islanders are needing access to. Uh, we've taken the approach that we need all hands on deck. We need all aspects of our health care working together. Uh, we'll continue to do that uh, and we'll continue to make the record investments that we've made in health, in the public uh, delivery of health and also those who work to make sure we can deliver it for islanders. Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Yes, we've had lots of discussion, but still no answers on accountability or transparency. So essentially, 
This government failed to keep up with the long-term care needs of this province. 2021, an internal long-term care review said that we needed to increase the number of beds from 1,244 to nearly seven, uh, 1,700. But, Mr. Speaker, do you know that, that record, what that record is? I mentioned it earlier in the week. Since that report was issued, there's been one, one bed added. They went from 1,244 to 1,245, an increase of one bed. And now they hand over $25 million to the private sector, and they pat themselves in the back because at some point in the future, the private sector will create 54 bids. Now, that's some record of success, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. My question, Premier, when did you approach the private sector with this incredible deal? Mm. The uh, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, I couldn't be more clear. I, I, we brought in the uh, Long-Term Care Association to talk about a number of issues. And one of the things while we had them there was to say, what capacity are we missing within the system? Uh, we know we need these beds. Uh, what can we do? Uh, they came back to us and said that, uh, you know, with a little bit of, of, of quick work, uh, we could provide 54 beds, which would help decant the hospital beds that Islanders are in. Uh, that's costing Islanders somewhere in the vicinity of $1,100 a day to keep them in there. Uh, there's better care for them in a facility like a long-term care facility that we can offer. Uh, so we work together, uh, as I said, at an incredible speed, and we come up with the 54 beds, uh, which we, uh, the minister announced. Uh, that's just the start. We need to continue to build more. Uh, we're going to build more in our public sector. We're going to build more with our long-term care association and keep working every day until there's a bed for everybody that needs it in our province. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So it's our information that this government basically got in a panic. They then someone from the Premier's office went to the private long-term care operators and said, how much do you want? Now, from what I heard, the operators didn't know what to say. They were amazed. A blank check and after they got there uh, through their amazement they came back with a ridiculous number and the government said here you go deal so my question to the premier who made the decision that 25 million dollars was the right price to pay to the private operators the honorable premier uh, mr. speaker I would have to say that everything in that preamble was fundamentally wrong and false uh, that's not how it happened at all uh, we have been working along the way with our long-term care providers uh, following up on the Dorsey report, which talked about the need for us to invest in the increasing of wages and to bring more parity within the sector. Uh, that was part of these discussions as well. Uh, so everything he said was patently false, but I, I, I think that seems to be par for the course in here, man. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I won't even touch that one, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, because it's really... The, answer, the questions that I've been asking him and the Minister of Health this week, it's really, really hard to follow. So on February the 14th of 2024, this year, the most senior government representatives from long-term care appeared before the Standing Committee on Health. And at that meeting, the public servants said there would be up to 16 new beds in 2024, but that depended on finding staff. Then, on February the 27th, the Premier said, 54 beds will miraculously appear. So, Premier, was this $25 million payout government's idea, or did it come from the private operators? The Honourable Premier. Again, I think for the 17th time, uh, we brought in the Long-Term Care Association and many of their partners, and we asked a very simple question, what is the capacity that you have uh, that we can develop more beds so we can uh, help our emergency rooms to get are uh, people who are in beds that don't need to be there and aren't getting the best treatment and the best quality of life. They can get a better quality of life in a long-term care. How can we work together? Uh, that's what we did. Um, I think I would call that uh, a, a good collaboration. I would call that trying to utilize all of the resources that we have. Uh, unlike the honorable member, I believe that the care that you get at the John Gillis Lodge or the Whisperwood Villa or the Mount uh, Community Care, Continuing Care Facility is a first class care. Those are Islanders providing care to Islanders and we need more of that if we're going to actually deliver the best health care we can for Islanders. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much Mr. Speaker. And nowhere did I ever question the ability of the service that was provided by any long-term care, whether it's private or public in this province. What I'm talking about is accountability and transparency. Now, it's one thing to work with the private sector, and it's another thing to just write blank checks. 
and it appears from this timeline that the public servants were left out of these discussions and this deal. So what bargaining position did the Premier take when he handed over the $25 million? Because from what I hear, the bargaining was, how much do you want? The Honourable Premier. I don't put a whole lot of credence into when I hear, I hear or somebody said. Uh, that's usually code for this is a good way to deliver a message uh, uh, that may or may not be uh, factual. Uh, as I said, I explained the process. We brought in the operators. We asked what their capacity was, what their needs would be, uh, and how quickly we could access uh, and open up more beds. I, I think if, if, if someone... Uh, would be upset that we would be offering more beds to our seniors when the preamble to the first question talked about the vacancy that we have and that we need to be moving quick, more quickly to do that. Uh, again, uh, it wasn't uh, here's a blank check, fill it out. It was let's work together so we can make sure we can adjust uh, the pay scales for those uh, based on the recommendations from the Dorsey report so we can pay Islanders more and we can provide the quality health care uh, for those individuals who muchly deserve it, those seniors who have paved the way for us to get us to today, Mr. Speaker. Can I believe the opposition? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly what we're looking for, accountability and transparency. So we know that the Premier and the Minister of Health met with the Long-Term Care Association somewhere between February the 14th and February the 27th. And at some point in that time, the Premier and his minister decided to hand over $25 million to a handful of private businesses. And I assume there is paperwork that would accompany that $25 million handout. So will the Premier commit to tabling the contracts that he and his minister signed with the private operators? Honourable Premier. Uh, or, or Mr. Speaker, uh, Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition, I, I think there's this, this false narrative that's being created that there's somehow nobody can access this money. We did use this legislature to pass the follow the dollar legislation so that money can be tracked at any time uh, if, if need be uh, through our Auditor General's office. We know where the money is going all the time. We're very open and honest with the spending of taxpayers' dollars. We've increased the spending in our health care delivery by 60% since we came in here. I have have said time and again it isn't about money. If there's money that needs to be found to invest in the health care delivery and to make it better for Islanders, I'm prepared to do it and I'm prepared to do it today, tomorrow and every other day I'm in this chair. Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So thank you very much Mr. Speaker. So maybe I need to rephrase the question. Are there contracts governing the $25 million handout or was it just done on the back of an envelope? The Honourable Premier. Uh, uh, obviously, there would be contracts. Uh, um, I would say that everything we do from a government perspective would be uh, available. Uh, we would certainly be open uh, and, and would make it available. Uh, and, and again, to classify this as a handout is, has to be taken as very, very offensive to the people who provide this care each and every day for Islanders. Uh, as I say, uh, if you go to South Shore just, Villa, just uh, I don't think that they would consider uh, that the RCWs and the LNAs no, getting no more money would be considered a some sure. kind of undermined sure handout on the back and of an fancy. envelope. I think that would be and should be very offensive yeah. mm -hmm. to everybody it's who's providing care. To Honourable members, the Premier has the floor. Everybody who's providing over care, and over and over. every Islander who's providing care to Islanders, to the seniors who paved the way for us to get here for now, to call that a handout, I think it's, uh, I think we've probably stayed in here too long this session, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Okay, Mr. Speaker, let's change her up. So as I said before, we appear to be at a point where this government is no longer updating the patient registry. Now, a few years ago, the registry was updated weekly. Now, it seems Islanders only get updates when the minister and his new CEO feel like sharing this information. Premier, it's been six weeks, six weeks ago, that it has been updated. That was on March the 4th. Question to the Premier. Since you have failed to meet your own targets to reduce the number of Islanders on the registry, was it your decision to stop updating it, or was it Health PI's new CEO's idea or is it more of a political direction from your staff and your office? Can you please explain? The Honourable Premier. Uh, I would say it's no to all three of those scenarios, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable uh, the Member for Charlton, West Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Educating our students is a wonderful, uh, is a wonderful career, and the staff of the PS, PSB and CSLF 
a highly skilled and dedicated staff that inspires students every day. Question to the Minister. The PEITF, PITF Federation recently shared an open statement voicing their concerns <coughs> over teacher shortages, and I'll table that later. Minister, while I know you have created positions, they are not all filled. What are you and your team doing to recruit teachers to permanently fill these important positions? The Minister of Education early years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. Thank you uh, for the question. You're absolutely right. Our teachers, um, they serve a tremendous role ensuring that our children uh, get the best start in life. So thank you to all, all of our teachers across the island. Um, also the Honourable Member mentioned the historical investments we've made in education. We've added more frontline staff to help support our education system. So I think we can all be really proud of that. And currently to date we really have been able to fill all of our positions. And I, I want to give a big um, you know, thank you to the both boards uh, who work very hard to ensure that those positions are filled at the beginning of each year. That being said, I recognize that there are challenges across the country and uh, we need to be prepared for the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Sheraldton West Royalty. As the number of teachers go up, which is needed because of population growth, so do the amount uh, of substitute teachers that we need. And there's a massive shortage. There were over 1,000 unfilled absences last year, Mr. Speaker. Um, question to the minister, what are you doing to recruit qualified substitutes who can fill, on, fill in on short notice to ensure sure students can have a continuous learning experience. The Minister of Education in early years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, yes, recognizing substitutes, it, it is a challenge, especially in the more rural areas and especially as it relates to French teachers. That being said, there have been significant efforts made over the last couple of years, especially um, through COVID and post-COVID, to ensure that we do have some strong sub pools. So in looking at the numbers that were provided to me this morning, um, we have about 550 in the sub pool for the PSB and around five or 50 uh, at the CSLF. So again, I, I understand that there are at times challenges and there are some early mornings for folks that are trying to juggle schedules and ensure those vacancies are filled. Um, but the teams do do their best, and, um, and at most times they're all, mostly always successful. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Sheraldton and West Royalty. I'm hearing different information there. A lot of times that, that we're having to move resource teachers, and a lot of times principals are having to go and do this. The PEITF also noted that sometimes we're relying on unqualified community members to work in the PSB and CSLCF without an education degree. And as the minister said, this, this situation is, for, is further worsening up west. This, of course, impacts quality of learning experience for our students. Minister, is this a suitable solution to have our students learn in a classroom by well-meaning but not educated in the aspects needed to optimize student learning? The Minister of Education in early years. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you, Honourable Member, um, for the question. Uh, it's certainly not ideal, um, and absolutely, we'd like to ensure that all of our subs are certified. Um, over the last couple of years, we have added itinerant uh, subs to our system, so those are full-time uh, permanent staff that help support a number of different schools, and they move based on vacancies, um, you know, uh, depending on the day. And so that model has really, really helped um, with address some of our sub shortages and the challenges associated with it. And I think that's an area that we can continue to look at um, and ensure that we have a really strong itinerant sub model um, and look at other creative ways to help support the system as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Sheraldton West Royalty. Yeah, I think we all want what's best for our students. And I'll quote the president of the PEITF, quote, our student success hinges on well-trained and educated teachers. It would be immensely unfortunate if the response to these shortages is to lower the bar and standards for becoming a teacher. Question, will you confirm now, Minister, that you will not lower the standard that our students will continue to receive the highest quality learning they need to be successful in their future aspirations? The Minister of Education in early years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think we can all be very proud of the education system we have here on Prince Edward Island. We have incredible folks on the front line that are delivering high quality educational services to our students and supporting their families, so I do want to thank them. Uh, no, it's certainly not our intent um, to draw back on any of those requirements. I meet regularly with the union, I meet with both boards, I meet with the Department of Education at UPEI, and um, I think collectively we're all on the same uh, page. We want to make sure that our, our system remains of quality and uh, certainly we'll continue to meet in, in the months ahead and ensure that we address, we're there to address the, um, the future of education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The member for Willary and Burness. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Energy answered a number of my questions regarding the Naguset Solar Project in Mount Pleasant. <clears throat> the Minister of Energy told the House that the lease agreement that needs to be signed with the Lennox Island First Nations has been held up because of the duty to consult arrangement with the provincial government. This is their project. Who do you expect the Lennox Island First Nation to consult with themselves? Question to the Premier, who is responsible for Indigenous Affairs. Since the Lennox Island First Nation is proposing to lease the land from the provincial government, why is a, would a lease be subject to the duty to consult agreement in this instance? The Honourable Premier. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I think the process through this has taken a number of different turns. Our full intention would be, uh, as the First Nation has identified this land, uh, we would love to go through the process as quickly as possible to actually give them title to the land and to do what they want to do with it. Uh, I think the challenge is uh, while we're working with Ulnaway, which is the uh, representative group for both First Nations in terms of our, our, our future land uh, um, uh, initiatives and, and conversations, uh, I think our staff were wanting to have identified property by the First Nations, uh, granted title to them as quickly as possible, and then to make sure that would count for whatever the future uh, um, uh, arrangement would end up being, with, when and whenever it could happen. Uh, I think there is a, a hesitation with uh, their internal processes for that process to happen. So as the Minister said, we're trying to find ways to work around that to the best extent we can. We'd like to see the project move forward. And I've had nothing but a real positive relationship with both First Nations since 2019, Mr. Speaker. Member for O'Leary and Press. <laughs> on this project. Uh, if the Nagaset Solar Project cannot secure land that is suitable, uh, their project could be in jeopardy. They have already applied to the federal government Smart Renewables and Electrification Pathways Program. Already the delays have impacted funding possibilities through the Geotechnical Planning Fund. Uh, question to the Premier, responsible for Indigenous Affairs. Premier, there are four provincial departments that could have a role in this worthwhile project, yet one doesn't seem to know what the other is doing. The Minister responsible for Indigenous Affairs, the Department of Transportation, the Minister of Environment and Energy, and the Minister of Innovation. What department is the lead uh, department in navigating this project to a successful conclusion? The Honourable Premier. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, and thank you for the question. And as the Honourable Member would know from spending a considerable amount of time in government and working in various cabinet portfolios that oftentimes there are issues that arise that require uh, department, depart department uh, involvement. Uh, all of the departments are trying to work together, uh, as I say, and as my, in my responsibility as the minister responsible for Indigenous Affairs, I'm trying to make sure we can come to a quickest conclusion as we can. But as I say, there are some uh, circumstances that we're trying to work through and find our way uh, forward. Uh, the Minister of Environment has been pushing very, very hard. He would like to get this project going, uh, as I would. And, and as I say, we're, we're uh, it's taken many different entities along the way, but I, you know, we're, we're hopeful we can do something as quickly as possible and get it rolling. Member Leary and Burness. Well, I'll go quick here, uh, Mr. Speaker. Actually, the interesting part in all of this is the Lennox Island First Nation believes it's your department, actually, that's been the holdup and has, has uh, suggested an outright rejection of this particular project. Can you shed some light on why your department seems to be the barrier? Honourable uh, Premier. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I would use the word barrier, uh, I, but as I say, the conversations that we're having, which, which are very, very complex around the negotiation process and all the future negotiation process, uh, we're trying to make sure there are some <laughs> I, rules of engagement wouldn't be the right proper term, but that there are some agreed upon terms that we could all uh, move forward on. There is land in the uh, speaker's district, which is also uh, we would like to move quickly on and we would like to uh, transfer as quickly as possible to say we're just trying to find through the negotiating process, which is a, as you can, you know, uh, uh, attest to, it's complicated. Uh, it's very long term in its thinking and uh, at the end of the day I want to be uh, making as many positive moves as I can to transfer uh, land to our First Nations, particularly around the development opportunities that you talk about. I just want to make sure there's a process that we can agree to going forward whenever this gets to the end years and years in advance that we could say 
uh, you know, X is the amount, but we've already transferred this much along the way type of thing. So it's complicated. I'm sorry for the long drawn out process, but it, it is a complicated and it's a national issue, not just one in PEI. We're all trying to figure out uh, what the, the best process is to get this done along the way. So thank you very much. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Every time the Minister of Education has been asked a question on teachers over the past year, she has provided us with some very comforting words describing a system that is well staffed and running efficiently and the record investments her government has made. From the front line paints a very different, well, unfortunately, what we hear from the front line paints a very different picture. But she's not alone, Mr. Speaker. This seems to be a common trend across this government. As in my member's statement yesterday, nothing to see here, everything's fine. Question to the Minister of Education. Should Islanders believe you when you say our schools are well staffed or should they believe the teachers who show up every day and are faced with the shortages? The Minister of Education earlier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. I think when I rise, I'm always honest in, in my responses. I think our education system, our, I look at it and I think that you know we, we are leading the way in the country. I think we're doing a tremendous job. We've got tremendous staff in the department and both boards. So yes, I think we're, we're in a good state. That being said, I recognize that there are challenges and unfortunately, you know, there are some, um, some, some gaps as it relates to substitutes uh, and that's, you know, that's been a an issue, unfortunately, over the years. It's not a new issue, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we are addressing it. We've got staff that understand the data and they are looking at it and trying to find creative ways of addressing it moving forward. We will be working on a workforce strategy here in the fall, um, and this relates both to teachers as well as our EAs, uh, our custodians, our bus drivers, um, a very holistic approach to ensure, again, our education system is well staffed to meet the needs and the demand of the future of our island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we do have tremendous people in these positions. And it's, it's challenging to hear we're leading the way when we hear from the front line such a different story. And the island education system has become an unattractive system for many new graduates. The P PEITF found that UPEI graduated 17 French immersion teachers, of which only three stayed to teach at island schools. If this is the kind of retention our education system has, I'm seriously concerned to find out how many of the 20 medical students we graduate on PEI will actually stay in PEI. Question to the Minister of Education. With more than 25% of our students in French immersion, we need these teachers to stay. What change Changes are you implementing to retain these new graduates? The Minister of Education early years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the release had just gone out yesterday, and um, I haven't really had the opportunity to dig into the numbers um, with regards to the retention rates. I do understand that um, the majority of those uh, individuals who were taking uh, the program were from away, so they had come here to take the, the program, and then they, they left and they didn't stay on the island. They weren't islanders, unlike the medical school where we will be um, taking in islanders and hopefully we'll be able to retain them here on the island. Um, certainly there's a number of initiatives underway to help support our French teachers. We are recruiting um, intensely within our high schools. Um, we are recruiting specifically in our Atlantic region. Um, we are, there's some focus energy on the retention side of it, lots of uh, supports around the language, ensuring that the language is uh, maintained and of quality um, to be able to teach that French language within the school system. So there's a lot of work underway and I'm really pleased we've had a great partnership with the federal government so we do receive a couple million dollars each year to help support these efforts and uh, we'll continue to work hard on this and recognizing that it is important and it's not easy, it's never going to be and it never was. Was, but uh, I am committed as minister to um, ensuring that we keep the uh, the foot on the pedal and um, keep the efforts going. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That that letter came out yesterday, but this issue is certainly not new. And as far as resident residency seats, they're not even on the island. Unlike this program. Substitute teachers play a critical role in the education system as well as in the retention of teachers. Substitute teachers allow teachers to take sick days, make appointments, and so on. In response to a lack of teachers, government has lowered standards for substitute teachers, and that is not the right response. The PEITF said that this year there are unqualified community members working as teachers in island schools. This is about ensuring quality education for our island students. Question to the minister. 
Will you commit to ensuring teachers and substitute teachers have appropriate levels of training and provide pay and other incentives to make PEI an attractive place for teachers to work? Minister of Education and Early Years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think PEI is a very attractive place to work, and I think that, again, that's why we've been successful in filling all of our new positions. We've added, again, historical um, numbers in terms of frontline staff, and we've been able to successfully fill those at both boards, so uh, a big kudos to all those that are working hard. Um, and I do want to stress, again, the importance of our itinerant uh, sub-model. Um, that has been incredibly successful, and I think there's an opportunity to really build on that and to hire more into those permanent full-time positions to help support those gaps when they exist and those vacancies. Um, but again, willing to always look at creative solutions. I know that's what the boards are continuously doing and uh, appreciate the honourable members' uh, questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Chair. Change things up a bit here. A little while ago, I asked questions about the Alternative Caregiver Program. The Minister told the House that the amount of financial support given to grandparents is the same as that given to foster parents. A question to the Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Do you stand by that statement? The Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Uh, thank you for that question. And um, I, I, I do stand by it because it's the, the grandparents alternative program plus the, uh, and it is equal to the kinship foster care program. So those are, those are equal. Um, the other the other program that foster care um, that's supported with foster care is is a different uh, level of um, yeah yeah so uh, if if I miss if I may have misunderstood but but it's the kinship foster care that's the same as the grandparent foster care thank you the leader of the Mr. third party minister with all due respect now there are three programs that's not at all what you said we were talking about the foster parent program and the alternative caregiver program. What is this new kinship program you speak of? That was not part of our conversation. The amount of those who receive support through the alternative caregiver program is $700 a month. For foster parents, it varies depending on the age of the child and, child and level of maintenance fee applied to the base amount. But it is at least $1,100 and goes up to $2,400 per month. The Canada Child Benefit, a federal program, is indeed available to grandparents who are primary caregivers, but many of them do not apply for it to avoid confrontation with biological parents. To the same minister, will you table the documents that validate your statement that support payments are the same for both groups? Mr. Social Development and Seniors. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, be I believe I just um, corrected that. I can certainly... Um, uh, Table, table some documents to say that the kinship foster program is the same as the. Um, and if I if I misled that, it was it was a mistake on my part because I I wasn't familiar with the two different costs. So, the yeah. leader of the third party, Mr. Speaker, this is this is rich. It's very shocking to me and very very upsetting. You, uh, oh. One significant barrier to grandparents accessing the alternative caregiver program is the fact that the children must be involved with child protection services. Many grandparents are the primary caregivers for their grandchildren, but cannot access the program because child protection services is not involved. These grandparents are doing the exact same work, providing the same love and support, but are in ineligible for any financial relief at all. They get nothing. To the same minister, why is this barrier still in place beside, despite years of advocacy from Don Avery, Don Avery with grand families and others? And will you table the policy finally later today during estimates which states this restriction as nobody, myself, Don, or anyone else has ever seen it? Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The grandparent program is through child protection. So it's a whole separate program. And if children... Um, are not um, in in that that program, then the funds are not available. But there are funds, of course, available through social services for uh, grandparents and children who are not involved in the child protection program. Thank you. The member for Time Valley Sherbrooke. I'm ready. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Agriculture is one of the country's largest industries, and it's the bedrock of rural communities. So, question to the Minister of Agriculture. Earlier this week, the federal government tabled its new budget. Was there any noteworthy new announcements in the federal budget to support farmers on Prince Edward Island? The Minister of Agriculture. Much. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke, uh, for his question. Uh, we haven't really had a deep dive into that. We are, have a meeting scheduled Tuesday with the, the federal partners to discuss that, but uh, on our first look, the agriculture wasn't mentioned a whole lot in that budget. Thank you, Mr. The member for Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The federal and provincial government partner on different programs to support agriculture and to help the industry to lower its carbon footprint. Your own department saw a funding increase for the coming year in our own provincial budget tabled back in February. So the question to the Minister of Agriculture, did the new federal budget contain any new funding to, to, to support the ongoing work by island farmers to lower their costs and carbon footprint? The Minister of Agriculture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, First look, as I said, we're having that meeting Tuesday with the federal partners to discuss that. Early look, there wasn't a whole lot. I mean, that we still have the pressures from the carbon tax that are directly going to affect our, our farming industry here in Canada. Uh, and that's, uh, but we are taking steps ourselves with our energy efficient program, pilot program that uh, was a huge success the first round and hopefully we can get another round of that out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One part of the budget that I have heard about from farmers were the changes announced to the capital gains tax. No one likes to shoulder a tax increase, but some of the concern I was hearing was that this could affect retiring farmers. So the question to the Minister of Agriculture, have you heard similar concerns from farmers, and do you have any worry about these tax changes might have negative impacts on nurturing our next generation of farmers. The Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member. It, it is concerning. Uh, we have to look at this uh, deep dive into this because, uh, as you said, uh, farmers work a lifetime with no pensions or anything, and at the end of the day, their farm uh, is their pension and uh, when they go to sell it. So they don't need to be... Uh, irreflectively uh, t taxed on that and uh, we have to look into that new new uh, proposal that came into the budget and see if how it will affect our farmers. Thank you. The member for Surrey Elmira. Thank you Mr. Speaker. I've been following with some interest a discussion happening uh, in the letter to the editor around the idea of reducing the number of waste collections from twice monthly to once a month. So question to the Minister of Transportation. Has uh, Island Waste Management Corporation looked at the idea of reducing the number of waste collections each month? Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the honorable member for uh, the question. As uh, the member, uh, I'm sure, is quite aware, IWMC is a crown corporation that operates at arm's length from government. Uh, having said that, occasionally, uh, yes, you hear uh, these, uh, I guess I would almost have to call them, Mr. Speaker, rumors. Uh, here, a number of days ago, it was brought forward uh, in the legislature a question if uh, private roads, uh, if IWMC was going to discontinue pickups on private roads, and I assured uh, the members of the legislature here that was not going to be the case. Again, I thank the member for bringing this question forward. I have heard this, have reached out to IWMC, and what I've got back from IWMC is absolutely not. Thank you. The member for Surrey, Amira. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for the clarification on that. So essentially the idea was that by going from twice a month collection to once a month collection, there would be less trucking and less carbon emissions created. The counter argument to that would be that it gets pretty darn warm on Prince Edward Island in the summer and a brimming black bin sitting out for a month and bags of garbage lying around, well, might not sit so well, Mr. Speaker. So a question to the Minister of Transportation, and you, you essentially answered this, but do you or your department have any plans or interest in pursuing this idea? The uh, Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank uh, the Honourable Member for uh, the follow-up question. Uh, as I had mentioned in answering uh, the first question, IWMC is a Crown Corporation operating at arm's length 
from government, but again, I've received complete assurances from IWMC that there will be no changes to the pickup schedules, either black carts or green carts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you again to the Minister. It's great to clear the air on this topic, and you're answering my questions before I even ask them. So, The argument uh, in favour of fewer black bin collections seems to be an environmental one, albeit the thought of having overflowing uh, bins and garbage bags lying around for an extended period of time each month does not sound environmentally friendly to me, especially from an aesthetics point. So uh, my question is to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. What is your take on the idea of reducing black bin collections to once a month to reduce carbon emissions? The Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we have ambitious targets and we're tackling them with a action already. I think that, um, you know, it's, it's great that as we start going down the road, people have their own ideas. I've always said we didn't have to, to make changes to read our, meet our tar targets that were going to intentionally punish people. And we didn't need to do things that were radical. And I would say that this idea would be both punishing people and radical. And uh, it'd be way outside the scope of how we intend to tackle climate change here in Prince Edward Island. We, we view all, every islander as partners. We want them to come along willingly. And uh, quite frankly, I've lived here my whole life. And you do not have to punish islanders to get them to come on board. You just have to talk sensibly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Sherald and uh, West Royalty. Question to the Minister of Social Development. You were just talking about foster families and people in the alternative caregiver program. Can you clarify and can you talk to my constituents who are in the alternative care program and are not being treated the same way that they are people in the foster family care program? Can you talk to the, my constituents right now and clarify what you were just talking about? The Minister of Social Development of Seniors. Well, I would, I would certainly be willing to meet with your constituents at any time, um, member. Um, thank you for that question. Um, the, the difference in, in, the, in the grandparent program is that children are in child protection and children get to go and live with family members. They go and get to be with their family, which is, which is wonderful. You know, it's, it's proven that children who are brought up with their family members will do better. And um, children who are in foster care, um, God love them, go, go into situations where they're not familiar and the foster parents take children who they don't know and um, they take them in the middle of the night, they take them for two days, they take them for a month, you know. So those are, those are the differences in the two programs. Um, financially, there are some differences as well. There's not a whole lot of difference, I might add, and but but there is a difference, and and depending on the level of um, level of uh, complexity um, with the children, um, that that really can depend on the the skill level that the foster parent has as well. So that's that's the difference. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition, final question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So for the first uh, six weeks of this year, 2024, many people commented that the Premier seemed to be absent most of this time. So I had taken a look at the Premier's calendar, and his calendar seems to back up that perception. Now, in fact, the calendar shows that except for a couple of Cabinet meetings, the Premier had a total of 16 and a half hours of meetings over a six-week period. And in all that time, his calendar shows one single hour at Cabinet committee meeting. One hour, Mr. Speaker. So I will table that calendar because the Premier's caucus colleagues may be interested because I hear that they have a hard time getting meetings with the Premier. So, Premier, what were you doing all this time? The Honourable Premier. I've been doing what I've been doing since April of 2019, and that is waking up every day and going to work and working hard and doing the best I can to make this island better. Uh, when I sit my head down at night, I worry about what we did or what we didn't do. Uh, and we'll continue to do that for as long as I have the privilege to be in here. Uh, if the uh, Honourable Leader of the Opposition wanted to job shadow me for a week, he might have to get up a little early. <laughs> he might have to get up a little early on the 6 o'clock in the morning, Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Statements by Ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Deputy Premier. Speaker, I have the 
of by leave of the house I beg to table the justice and public safety take backs and I move second by the honorable premier that this said dog may be now received and do lie on the table shall carry the leader of the opposition thank you very much mr. speaker uh, so by leave of the house I beg to leave the table the premier's calendar from January the 1st 2024 to February the 12th 2024, and I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Does the said document be now received and do lie on the table? So, Kerry? Kerry. The Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table Department of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture requested take backs from budget estimates, and I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. So, Kerry? The member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Mr. Speaker, I leave the House. I beg leave to table a uh, letter outlining issues that affect student learning from the PEITF regarding staffing for substitute teachers and other, other important issues reaching critical level. And I move seconded by the leader of the third party that the said document be now received and due line the table. Shall carry. Anybody else? Uh, reports by committees. Introduction of government bills, government motions, orders of the day, government, the Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move, second by the Honourable Premier, that the first order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Carry. I'll ask the member for Surya Amari to chair Committee of the Whole. Oh, I, my apologies, members. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. I got a little uh, ahead of myself there, Deputy Premier. That's quite Deputy right. Premier. No problem, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Honourable Premier this, that this House do now resolve it itself into the Committee of the Whole House to further consider the grant of supply of His Majesty. Shall carry. carry. Now I'll ask the uh, member for Sir Yomari to chair Committee of the Whole. The House is now in the Committee of the Whole House to consider the grant of supply to His Majesty. Shall I carry? Here. Minister, uh, would you like to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, I would. Shall I carry? Here. Welcome, stranger. Could you please state your name? Uh, for hands. Uh, I am Trish Cameron McDonald, uh, Director of Finance, CFO for the Department of Social Development and Seniors. Welcome. Thank you. Minister, do you have anything you'd like to add before we start? No, nope. just go right ahead. Okay, we're on 150, page 156, members. <laughs> I'm good. Am I done? So, but we're still on. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. So, members, we're on uh, child and family services. Shall the section carry? Okay. Uh, member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, so thank you for coming back in today. Um, 
just I wanted to uh, just pick up just just about um, protective services. Um, we talked about having a 19 percent uh, vacancy rate. Are those for permanent FTEs? It includes temporary and permanent staff. Okay. Charlotte Thomas Road. Yeah, I'm just wondering, so 19%, I'm just having trouble translating to how many actual people were short. Related to the budget in what way? Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, Charlotte Thomas Road. I could ask it this way, if there's a 19% shortage, how much is the value of those, those people that we don't have? Uh, so for last fiscal year, we were 1.3 million underspent in salaries. Child and Master Royalty. And that would just be in protective services? Child and Family Services, that division. So it would include uh, youth worker positions and social workers and family service workers. One more question for this set. Sure. Yeah, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just concerned because this is very important. I mean, um, in that area, and I'm just looking for continuity and allowing. And I know it's hard for minister. I know it's hard, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to make sure that <laughs> we're doing everything that we can to. Get higher to ensure that okay. child protective services, that, that children are protected in the province. And I know you've made big steps, but a 19% reduction is, that's, that's where I'm coming from on those, mm -hmm. that line of question. It is very concerning for us as well. Um, so we have hired a targeted recruitment coordinator uh, to support us. Uh, we have also made quite uh, significant advancements um, to, ensure that we offer our social workers the same package as Health PEI yeah. offers their yeah. social workers um, so that we're no longer competing with yeah. other government agencies. Yeah. Um, it's more about the position and the work. Uh, we also looked at our youth worker um, job descriptions. We call them position questionnaires in government. Um, there, was, there were updates made to it. It was reclassified uh, to uh, one step higher, so a little bit more pay. Uh, which we've seen significant results um, as a, from that. We filled all the youth worker positions. So we have made like, incredible improvements, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just not there yet, yeah. and need to keep making more. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks, Trish. Appreciate it. I'll put you back in the list. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Welcome back, Trish. Um, so I know one of the really positive steps forward that the department took was raising the, the age of in yes. which pe children age out of care. And I'm wondering what the cost associated with that is. I know that you, you mentioned a little bit of that yesterday, but I don't, I don't know if that's the extent of it or... Yeah. So you're, you're speaking of the extended care being increased from age 21 to age 25? Yeah. Uh, so yes, we did speak to it. We touched on it really quickly yesterday. It's about $125,000 added to budget for that. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And and I don't know the number of of um, young people that would be. Is do, is one hundred twenty five thousand sufficient for for the costs associated with that? Uh, when we estimated the amount, we looked at the number who are currently in the extended care uh, services, and use that to estimate. Um, the cost to continue to support them to age 25, so we believe it's a very good estimate. It's always dependent on what the, what the young adults require, right, and what they need for support. So it is something we will be watching closely, but we feel it's properly funded, it's adequate. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair, and I guess I guess that'll, it's, that's gonna be a learning process because we don't know what necessarily the costs are associated with the difference in age. So. And it's dependent on the individuals as well. Yeah. Right. Very dependent on the individuals. But the best estimate could co could only come from the individuals we're aware of now, and this the spending trend. Yeah. And using that to forecast. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Peter, third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so.
So last year we implemented the new uh, Child, Family, and Youth Services <coughs> Act. Is that what it's called? Okay, Child. Yeah. Child, and youth called? Family Child and Youth Family Services Act. Family Services Act. Thank you. It's, it's <laughs> hopefully to be turned on in June. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah. We have a third party. Last one for this. Okay. Side. Thank you, Chair. So I'm just wondering if there's any additional appropriations in, that, in this budget for, for the implementation of that act? Yes, there is. Uh, so the 125,000 for the youth extended services that we spoke of, um, about the same 124,000 for uh, providing uh, legal services for children from age newborn up to 12, um, and numerous positions. Yeah, numerous staffing dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Charlton West Royalty, do you have any more yeah. questions? Yeah, um, I just wanted to touch on um, uh, group homes particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the budget, I know, I don't know if I can ask about staffing levels in that area, uh, similar to my questions before. Are we fully staffed there? Is that an area that, that we, I know we struggled in the past, but we were doing a little bit better. I'm just trying to look for an update now. Thank you, yeah. because I'm very happy to be able to say we've made great strides. Yeah. The reclassification of the youth worker um, has we're fully staffed at this point, and uh, we've opened. I know. Yeah. yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, good. It's good. good. The team's worked hard to accomplish that. Well done, Mr. Royalty. Yeah, and I'm glad to hear that. And I know that the staff worked very hard, and and it's been. Uh, that's what I'm. So we hear things in the community that like it's it's stable. Things are doing okay right now. Yeah. Um, so that's a real confidence. Are we? Are our numbers of um, people that we're serving in there? Is it is does it always remain at max? Do you know what I mean? Like the the where are we for? People using that service. So the children in the homes, um, in the group homes, are typically they they're around 50, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little under. Um, the changes that we've made in the last year that have really improved um, staffing levels yeah. have also improved um, services to the children in the home. Yeah. Uh, we've been able to open a few new group homes, which means we've been able to reduce the number of children in homes to around four to four to five which is a nicer living condition. Um, and then provide, we created uh, 33 permanent positions yeah. uh, by adding a million dollars to our salary budget and using um, the temporary staffing dollars as well. Okay. So it will create a consistency in for youth workers. Yeah. So they've wanted to stay in their roles yeah. and also consistency for children, which is the most important piece. Yeah. And I, I just again I want to compliment on on you on that it's because it has been it's always a struggle and 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 I, I want to recognize that the department has done good things and we're hearing it on out in the, the community and I think that it'll allow kids to if they have greater supports it'll it'll allow them to to feel supported to move on with wherever they need to get to so I just want to compliment you uh, you can put me back in the list I Okay, uh, leader of the third party. Could I, oh. Sorry, could I? I oh. should have said this when I first sat down. Let's take backs for yesterday. So okay, thank yeah. you. Sorry, thank you. I can go. So, Minister, I'll have you table those. Okay. I'll table these documents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, leader of the third party, if you're thank, ready. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for those take backs. Um, so I'm moving to child protection data, and I missed part of the question. Was it child protection you were talking about having a full complement of staff, or was that something different? It's our youth workers. So okay. youth workers uh, work in the group homes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So I'm wondering, I know in the annual report from 2019-2020, um, which is the last one, there was 3,000... 3, Sorry, 3,763 child protection reports and 1,993 investigations. Can you give us a sense if that number is going up or down? I'm just wondering if, if the department feels they have the resources necessary to respond to those, um, those, whether they be just a report, the reports and the investigations, I guess. I'm trying to think of how I tie this into the budget discussions and I'm, I'm con just a little concerned too because I'm not fully briefed on the number of reports. So 
Okay, I I'll would not want to speak out of line. It's not something I came prepared to speak to. Okay. So, so leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Moment. I will re reframe my question. Yeah. So do does the department feel there's enough money in the budget to respond to reports and investigations? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, I'm wondering about child protection staff. That's why I double checked. What would the vacancies look like there? Uh, for social workers, yeah. we have a 28% vacancy rate, which is 20 FTE. Yeah. Well, leader and third party, one thank more, and I'll put you back on the list. Okay, right thank you, there. Chair. And that's, I mean, I know that's I'm, that a huge challenge for the department and, and yeah. devastating for, for people involved. Is there, any, is there any money set aside for any sort of, um, or is there ongoing recruitment for social workers, or how does that work? Okay. Um, so we do have a recruiter we mentioned earlier as well a targeted <coughs> recruiter um, and we do have as you see we were 1.3 million dollars underspent in our salary budget so if we have any initiatives that we can um, partake in to recruit more social workers that is that spend would be available okay right and once we came back to full staff and complement we would if we needed to continue with whatever that initiative was, we would um, add more money for the budget for the next year. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask one quick follow-up to that, Chair? Yep. Thank you. I'm wondering that, Minister, this would be just to you kind of just very quickly. Does the department do any sort of, whether it be exit interviews or, or interviews with so current social workers to see if there's anything within the environment of the work that, that is kind of a deterrent for people or like anything that we could change within the department so that we make it more, uh, you know, a better environment for people if that's the issue, if there's an issue there? Y yes, they do. And that's just what the CFO spoke about with pay parities and, and you know, hiring recruiters and trying to, yeah, yeah. I think okay. we have some, we do have some content people yeah. in the department right now. Um, it's, it's, it's very positive. Yeah. environment right now our human resources team has been very helpful in um, and involved um, and when we did go forward to receive the approval to offer the same package to um, our social workers that health PEI offers to theirs it was a, a group effort and it was very much based on feedback from the social workers as well so okay. yes thank you thank you okay. Charles Thomas Road yeah, thanks. Um, I was just looking through the salaries, and I, I'm not, I, mean, I, I don't know what the, the budget line is for that targeted recruiter or what the what the uh, job title would be. Uh, I'm just going to catch up to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just looking through it. And so, the targeted recruiter would not be here because it is a temporary position and does it depending on the success and whether or not we need a continued would determine whether or not we would add a permanent position for the targeted recruiter okay but, but if it's not here how do we how do we find it in in, in the but in the budget is it on is it under professional services uh, no it'd still be in the salary line. But if it's in the salary line and it's not in the salary line, the salary line is um, comprised of permanent FTEs as well as temporary positions. And the salary list in the handouts is the permanent positions. Okay. Charlottetown yeah. West Royalty. Okay, but the money is accounted for. How much would be in the salary line but not in the budget line? How much are we spending on, on that position? Is it just for the full year? I could do an analysis and bring it back for you. Yeah. Okay. One more, Charlottetown West Royalty. And then how does that line, how does that line get to be a permanent FTE position if it's, you know, I just don't know if it's a temporary thing or if it's a... So when we bring on a new position, yeah. um, like in this case, if we if we determine that there's a long-term need for that position, then yeah. we would need to follow Treasury Board policy and uh, request approval to create a new permanent FTE number, okay. yeah. and then it would be a permanent position. We can ask for funding yeah. in a budget, 
and not yet have created a permanent. Gotcha. Until we know there's a long-term need for it. Gotcha. Yeah. I can put you back on the list. Okay, please. sure, yeah, yeah. Good answers. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. One of the things that, uh, that we talked about the last time that you were on the floor as well was the request from, uh, it actually came from the child and youth table. I, that's not the full name I recognize. Yeah. But they were just saying how growing up through the, like being in group homes that they felt they didn't have the life skills necessary. And so I'm wondering if there's any additional money in this. I, I recognize we've upped the age, but I'm wondering if there's more money specifically designated in this budget for that. And would it require? There were two yes. funding for two FTE youth extended services um, yeah. coaches last year. So okay. it was, it's still here this year, okay. but it was uh, at at last year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yes, very good point. We did go back to Treasure Board and get the approval to turn them into permanent, permanent FTE, so they, they are need. permanent positions. Yeah. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I'm I'm wondering about adoptions now, um, and you may not have this information, but it, it will lead to a question. How roughly how many adoption does the pro uh, province process in a year? We don't disagree. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have that information. No. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm wondering if, given we have the new child, oh my God, Child Youth and Family Services Act. Yes. Um, one of the things that we noticed in our office and that we've heard from people is how much it butts heads with the Adoption Act now. There's certain, there's certain aspects of it that just don't work well together. I'm wondering if there's any thought to or if there's any funding in the budget for a review of the Adoption Act. If there's, sorry, can you repeat, any funding in the budget to review the Adoption Act? Yeah. No, not at this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. We do have, like, if we were to review it, and it was, probably would begin with departmental policy people looking at it, then we would, their salary budgets would be, are here for that. If we needed to consult uh, a third party, we do have general consulting budget lines that we could, but we did not add any specific dollars to do that task. Okay. If it was necessary, we have money that we could pull on. It would just mean that we may not be able to do something else. It would have yeah. to be the priority. Okay. Yeah. Leader, third party. Thank you, Chair. And I might just put a little plug in if there is, just to kind of briefly go through, and because it was kind of, there were just a few things. I can't think of them off the top of my head, mm -hmm. but there were a few things that just didn't complement each other very okay. well in the new act, and it would be nice if they were both new progressive Act. So yes, just thank you. throwing that in there. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm gonna. I want to jump into alternative care provider program. I think I'll finish my questions and then wait till I have a full slate to go there. Um, I'm looking at the grants. So uh, Triple P Parenting. It looks as though they received a reduction in their grant from last year, from 162.9 to 63.323. Um, and, and I know that that's a program that we talk about a lot. It's a program that, that works very well, that a lot of people are referred to, sometimes two or three times they do the program. It is a wonderful program. Yeah. Uh, we did not change the budget for that program. Oh. Can you help me find where oh. you're seeing that? Um, it's not in the grant section. I don't know where I would have seen that. Then. Maybe I will bring that back. Oh, okay, well, thank you. Yes. Yeah. No, it is a wonderful program, and we have not reduced funding to it. Okay, it's good. It's not even something we would consider reducing funding to. So. I wouldn't yeah. either. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. One more for this. Yep, session. that's great. Thank you, Chair. The, the PEI Federation of Foster Families, yes. um, the grant is identical this year, I think, <laughs> compared with last year. Um, and I'm wondering with the, the advertisement campaign, um, why there wouldn't be an increase there. I think it's separated. Um, let me just think now. Uh, can you repeat that? So the, the PEI Federation. Federation of Foster Families. Yes. I know what the, there's been a, a big campaign to, to get more. Yes. Of which mm -hmm. we desperately need. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why we don't see an increase anywhere based on that. So we, sorry, uh, we fund uh, foster families in two ways. One of them is uh, like a core operating budget to the Federation. Uh, we also pay um, an insurance on their behalf. Uh, we also provide uh, funding to help promote the foster families. And um, 
Last year, we added $75,000 to the budget, and we did a significant blitz um, promotion effort, um, which we've brought that back down to 50000 because we are going to continue annually supporting the promotion of foster families. Um, but last year's promotion was meant to be um, heightened more because it hadn't... We, we wanted to do a big blitz, and we wanted to... Um, I'm not sure when we had made such a significant promotion for them as well, but that's not the dollar value that's required every year. Gotcha. So there was a bit of a drop, and that's the, the reason why. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, go back. Well, back on the list? A couple more questions. Uh, Charles, I yeah. think just a couple more on the, on the recruiter. Um, so when did that position start, and uh, is, 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 there, is there somebody in there now? Yeah. Yes. 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 Oh, sorry. No, that's that's good. And so there's somebody in there now. Do they have recruiting experience? Yes. They do. Great. Yes. Well done, Mr. Rosen. Firing through my questions here too fast. But it would seem that if, like, unlike the Department of Health, who have a team of recruiters, if the person recruits and there's only recruiting for social workers, what happens if if you get a full compliment? What happens to the recruiter? I got they working themselves out of a job. I uh, hope so. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't. No, for that but person. you know what I mean. No, no. But um, that would I, be wonderful. yeah, I, I really find it hard to kind of think ahead to yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would like to think that um, it would be fantastic to have a full complement. Yeah. yeah. Um, that never changed, um, but I, I think there probably would be a need for a recruiter for quite no, some time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even if we get to full complement, it's it's sometimes a turnover, too. So. Um, I'm finding it very hard to kind of guess ahead to that point and what would we do. Um, I guess I could say that we would do whatever we needed to be able to get a full compliment and, and hopefully keep it. Great. Charlton, Mr. Rose. And a great answer. And that's, and that's exactly what I'm saying. So my question would be, do we need two, do we need a team of recruiters at that time? Because Health PEI, or not Health PEI, the Department of Health has, they recruit for doctors, nurses, and allied health professionals. So they could theoretically be short social workers and doing the same thing. So, but this, our recruiter in this section only works as an individual position. So are we gonna look at a team yeah. there? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. And we, I will take it back and yeah. talk to the team. Um, I know what's most important is to be able to provide services to the children yeah. in mm -hmm. a healthy workplace. And uh, I will take that back to the group Excellent. and talk. Excellent. Thank you. Have any more questions, Cheryl Thomas Drill? Um, just uh, the minister, you talked about the kinship program yes. during. Uh, um, I apologize because I might not be fully up to date on that program. So, can you talk a little bit more on that program and how much funding we're putting in towards the kinship program? Yes. I'm very thankful to have a chance to um, talk this this piece over. Great. Um, and yeah. I have um, talked with the team and uh, especially the, the social workers and the Director of Child Protective Services. Um, the, there is foster care and there is um, the alternative grandparent and alternative care program. I'm going to refer to that as GACP. Um, and the most important um, overriding and most important um, objective um, to Child and Family Services is to use the least intrusive means possible to support the children and that means only taking them into the care of the province when it is necessary mm -hmm. and there's not a family member um, available um, and then when the um, family members are sorry so let me go back this is not incredibly budget related but there's been a discussion so I wanted yeah. to be able to support everyone with some understanding on it so when the Children are in the care of a family member. However, the province has had to take um, guardianship of the child. Then the it's not a new program. It's still it's considered kinship foster because the province has had to become the legal guardian, but they are still staying with a family member, and that's so we call it the kinship foster program. If we have been successful and not having to take that intrusive means of having the child come into the care of the province and they are still with a family member, 
they are in the GACP program. And the uh, child tax benefit from the federal government is required to be paid to the um, party who is, uh, sorry, <laughs> right, it depends on, if the child has had to come into our care, then the federal government has to give us the um, CCTV, the child tax yeah. benefit. If they are still in the care of a family member, the federal government requires that child tax benefit to be paid to the family member, the legal guardian. Yeah. So okay. I guess I'll say kinship foster care is not a new program. Mm -hmm. It's simply um, it's called that because it's a family member who's taking care of the child. And it is different than mm. typical foster parents because they are only caring for that one family member. They are not making themselves available to any child at any time of the night with any need um, and possibly multiple children. So they are categorized differently because they are very different. So thank you to our stranger for going outside of the yeah, budgetary uh, process here to explain a very important uh, program. So leader of the third party, do you have? Thank you, Chair. And, and Trish, I, I do really appreciate that. I, I, I guess I disagree in terms of the fact that there should be much difference, but that's not a discussion to be had right okay. now. Um, I'm wondering if you have like a breakdown. Is there a line, I, I don't, there's nothing in here, but like kind of a breakdown. What do those numbers look like? Kinship, alternative caregiver, and foster. Mm -hmm. I know foster's between a couple, maybe they all are. I have some that I can give you, okay. and I can be more detailed in a take back as well, if you like. Okay. Um, uh, for foster care, we have $946,100. And for grandparent and alternate care program, we have 854900 in budget. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I, I really actually would appreciate a take back because I've been trying to understand this since 2019. Yes. <laughs> and it's been very frustrating. Okay. Um, it uh, is the, the challenging piece to explain and understand is that uh, we are being, we're taking the means that is least intrusive to the child and we are doing our best to leave the children um, in the guardianship of a family member and dependent on who is the guardian determines where the child tax benefit goes to. Yeah. Leader third party. Okay. I think I'll leave my questions there for now. Sure. I look forward to digging into those numbers. Thank you, Trish. Okay. So yeah. you, you would like a take back I that would. Yes. And even even if we could sit down and have a conversation. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna to go to Board and King Cora for a couple of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just quickly I'm I'm looking at the line for community grants in the small book, um, and then I'm, oh, yes, okay. I'm comparing and contrasting that with the grants page uh, SDS 5, page 5 of 5, Thank you. <laughs> and they just don't seem to, they just don't seem to add up to me, and um, the um, leader of the third party had asked a question about triple P, which doesn't seem to be listed in the Child and Family Services grant section. Um, but I also can't get mm -hmm. the numbers to add up um, from what's revealed mm -hmm. in, the, in the table that says Division Child and Family Services. Mm -hmm. There's Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Family Service. But when I look at community grants in the little book at page 156, it's 554, 300. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just wondering if mm -hmm. you could explain the discrepancy. Yes, I can. That's a very good question. And I can see that's kind of glaring um, so a few things that I talked about yesterday applied to here too but I'm, I'm gonna um, this handout that we provided so the SDS page 5 SDS dash 5 um, we needed to have these we were required to have these prepared and bound in time for the house to open so I believe I'm going up by memory, the deadline for us this to be prepared was sometime early February. Um, and so the end of the year had not yet happened. So I couldn't provide, we could only give the payment amounts and grants for up to um, January 31st of 2024. So it's missing February and March payments. 
The other thing we said yesterday was that uh, we had our, our financial analyst uh, work with the groups to make sure that all of the invoices had come in from the non-government organizations. Um, and so we had to make a call and, and ask them to get their final invoices in so we could pay them in full. So in February and March, payments were made to bring uh, the total amount in line to what you're seeing in this book. Okay. Because we await an invoice from them. And when we realized they hadn't given their invoices in February, we worked with them to get the full amount paid. Thank you. Gore. Th thank you for that. So it's largely a timing timing issue yes. and you're working with the information you have and the timelines you're given. So yes. I, I, I get that uh, fully. Thank you for that great explanation. Um, as, it, as it pertains to the omission of Triple P, is there, is, is there, would it not normally be identified in this section if it's receiving funds? Um, can I bring that back because um, we did not change the budget for Triple P in the amount. I think we reallocated it um, from grants into because um, we reallocated it, but I'm, I can't quite remember exactly why or where, and I can confirm there's been no reduction in the budget for Triple P, um, but I, I could bring back the detail and a take back, if that's okay. Yep. Thank you. Warden King Gore. No, th thank you for that. Um, is, is, it, is it possible that it's, Triple P is not the same it, as, as we look at the three um, community organizations, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Family Services, Triple P administered differently, and that's why it wouldn't appear in those lines. I mean, I'm happy to wait for the take back as well. I guess I'm just surmising. Um, when Triple P began, we had been making payments to an organization that was helping teach us how to run the program, and at that time it was in our grant line, and we actually had some budget in different departments as well. And over the last three to four years, we had uh, moved the budget dollars all into one department. And we have staff now trained to run the program. So I think it was, sorry, not that I think, I can't remember exact dollar amounts. It was reallocated to where it's actually being spent. But I, I can be very specific in a, in a take back for you. Okay, thank yeah. you. Warden King Cora. Uh, so with respect to the three community organizations that are itemized there, um, I often will ask when it comes to, to, to the grants how it's determined who gets the funding and in what amount. Does that come from them? Is, is it open to, to anyone? Are there other organizations that would fit within the parameters of this section that could be eligible for grants that, that aren't receiving grants? Uh, we have, there are four non-government organizations that we fund annually. It's, a, it's the same amount with the an increase each year. So there's Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club PEI, Family Service PEI, and the Federation of Foster Families. Um, we do have in our another division, our strategy policy and seniors, we have a bit of, we have a fund that we use for project type uh, funding. And if we, if, if NGOs uh, are asking for funding, we could ask them to apply to that project funding. And if we determine that the project was a success and there is a long-term need, then when we sit to discuss grants for the next year for every division, we would take that into consideration. Yeah. So we do have a, an ability to support new NGOs or new projects. It's just not in this division. It's in, a, in another. Okay. okay. Warden King Cora, one more. Uh, this would probably be my last one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess it's always to, you know, determining year-over-year -year needs and whether the organization has fulfilled its mandate and expectations, there's a, whether there's a metrics or a balanced scorecard or some, some measurement that's administered to determine um, the eff efficacy of the use of the, spend, of the spend of the money. I guess that would be my question if, if, if that program is, is in place, obviously, to determine and uh, if it's effective in, in determining outcomes. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay, Thank New you. Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. Hi, Trish. 
Um, and Minister, I, I'm going to carry on in the line of questioning regarding the alternative caregiver programme a little bit. And I know you're having you're bringing a, a take back to uh, the leader of the third party, but I just wanted to, and I've, I've been listening very intently. So it's an issue I've been following for many years. And back in 2017, the budget for the program was about $400,000. And did I hear you say it's now somewhere between eight and 900000 Trish, did I pick that up right? I'm just going to reconfirm. $854,900. Right. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Uh, so back in 2017, that... that uh, was enough money to provide care through the ACP, you had a longer acronym but the, than yes. I do, uh, for 54 children. So given that it's doubled with inflationary costs, are we talking about a 100 or so children who are now in that program? Um, very fairly. In 2017, I was not here as sure. the Chief Financial Officer, and I would not want to lead you astray with my response. Are you... Would it be helpful if, if we prepared some type of an analysis since that time as a take back? I, I, I'm not prepared to answer that question because I don't sure. have the information from okay. them. Sure. New Haven Rocky uh, Yeah, just maybe I can ask it in a different way, Trish. And I was just looking at, the, because the fee per month has not changed, it was 700 back in 2017 okay. and it's still 700 today. So I was just extrapolating, if we're spending twice as much money, probably that means there's around 100 kids who are, uh, who are in the program, and I just wondered if that was correct or not. Yeah, right now um, there's 157 care providers and 203 children 203. in the program. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. You Thank you. Question? And I, I heard you in, in question period, Minister, say that this program is run through CPS, and therefore that... Um, exclusion of children who may well be looked after by, it, I, it's called, a, I think of it as a grandparents caregiver program, but there are, there are other family members who may be doing that. Um, why have we maintained that prohibition of the child having to be, having to be in an open CPS case? Um. Not a because that I, would that yeah, would yeah. significantly impact the budgetary sure. uh, allocation for this program if that were changed. That's why I'm asking yeah. this question. I, I'm so not. I can't not, speak no. to that. I'm very sorry. I would need to consult with the director of Child and Family Services. So, member, um, I'm going to give you one more and just remind you to keep it sure. related to the budget, please. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand. Thank you. And although I'm going to ask a policy question, it is if, if this policy were, if I could see the document to verify that that is indeed the case. I, I wouldn't ask this question, but uh, I've been asking for many years um, for a policy document to validate that statement that only in kids under an open CPS case will qualify for this, and I've never seen it. I can, I can speak with the, the director. I cannot make a decision to um, bring back a, a policy, but sure. I'll certainly speak to the director. Okay. Okay, so member, she, uh, the stranger said she would take it back, so um, I'm going to move right. on to yep. Shelltown Western. <clears throat> yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the, for the take backs. I appreciate them. And, and, um, um, but I just need to ask a couple of clarification questions yes. on those if I'm, if I'm I'll allowed. I'll do my best. Yeah, so, uh, so in here we're talking about the Accessibility Transportation Task Force, and it says um, uh, the amounts were changed. Um, and uh, the rebate max was increased to $20,000 after a meeting with a task force with resource abilities of the city of Charlottetown and the staff in the Department of Social uh, Development and Housing at the time. And it says uh, Social Development and Seniors has a copy of the March 22 meeting minutes. But that would be a change to the policy. That would, be, that would have been a change to the actual agreement. And will you table the, that those minutes? For we me? spoke about this yesterday, yeah. and it was the that we were rec in recognition that the funding was not being spent quickly enough. Yeah. Which meant the improvements to vehicles were not happening quickly yeah. enough. Um, there was a meeting to look at the parameters, and there were updates based on that meeting. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was. That's yeah. outlined there. Yeah. Thank you. Well, down well, can we see the minutes of that meeting? Because that, that would be a change. 
And I'm just wondering why, like, we still don't have the service running in Charlotte. So. Well, I'd like to also add to the discussion is that yeah. this is funding we provided to Resource Abilities. Yeah. It is their fund. Mm -hmm. Okay, Charlottetown West Royalty. But, but you're the overseer of that money, and the program isn't working. And, and as a result, the, the director, there was a meeting. Yeah. We talked about the fund parameters, and we've asked that they be more inclusive. Great. Okay, if you have another budget question, Charles. Well, Thomas, Charles yeah, Thomas. and so I, I have to. I'm, I'm going to leave that for now and just move on to in the in the report. And I'm glad to see this. And it's it's more about us, so we can see the funding outline. So uh, the the bought back Stars for Life included in the specialized residential placement payment. So they get their grant yes. and then they get that. Yes. Should those not be separated? And was that so? It says 147 thousand was under that grant but they get their regular funding and shouldn't that be separated out in a different line? And does that make up the, the $647,000 they're getting? Um, so we're kind of going back to the last section. I realize it's I because of the handout. So what I will um, say is that those are very good questions. We've had them ourselves and yeah. it's something that we, this, this $350,000 review or the, the budget yeah. of three hundred fifty thousand dollars for a review of the AAS program, yes. those are things that we are wanting to have looked at, like the structure of how the funding is received and should it be in two different lines? Should they be same agreements? Should they be separate agreements? How much th should come through the AAS line? How much through specialized residential? How much through community grants? So I'm with you. Yeah. I think they're very good questions. Okay. Um, and. We're, we're looking for an informed um, decision through this review. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, one more. And, and it's great to hear the guests do that. And this is, and I'm, I'm just doing this quickly because I, I got mm -hmm. this back, but I, I would agree. And then it says the next line, it was the 300 uh, social development signed a letter of commitment to Stars for Life confirming the department will provide up to $350,000 annually to support the expansion projects and add five beds to the future residence services. This has been going on for a number of years according to Stars for Life and the government, when does that funding start? Are they, are, is this like a buildup of funds or how are you going to, Is when does it start and how are we doing So this is a great example to, for me to help explain one of the pieces we spoke about yesterday Perfect. is that when an NGO is trying to put together a package for a new specialized yeah. residential location, they come, they put together like a, almost like a business plan, not as detailed, mm -hmm. but it's an application. And then when the division would be sitting down with them and understanding it, and then we'd be working to support them in their capital costs. And then also determining what their operating costs would be once they are able to either build the house, buy the house, find the house, and put it into um, operation. It started, is it, so they have the money now? We have made a commitment uh, for their operating, and we have made, I'm trying to remember what was in that, I believe yeah. Stars for Life, we have made a contribution towards the capital costs. Once they have the home ready, then we will, we've made a commitment to fund their help them with their operating costs as well. Gotcha. And yeah. that will begin once the house is ready and clients are moved into the home and we're on board to support them. Excellent. Absolutely. I know you are. I just yeah. want to make sure we clarify that because I'm getting these questions from all over the place. Yes. There, so. yeah. Again, thank, thank you, you. Thank thank you. for doing an exceptional you. job on uh, on explaining that out. Chella, Section Carey. Carey. All right. Total Department of Social Development and Seniors. One hundred and seventy six million seven hundred and forty five thousand nine hundred Charlotte Carey. Carey. Great. Right. Um, that concludes social yeah. development and seniors. Thank you. So we are moving on to transportation and infrastructure. Page one sixty. And at this time I would again like to thank our stranger. Thank you. <laughs> oh dear, thanks God.
objection to the chair? Minister, would you like to invite a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. Okay. Shall it be granted? Did I hear it carried? <laughs> Welcome to our guest. Uh, would you please state your name and position for answer? Uh, Wendy McDonald, Director of Finance for the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Welcome, Wendy. Uh, Minister, do you have any opening remarks? Uh, just very briefly, certainly I'd like to uh, personally welcome Wendy. I want to thank her for all the great work that she has done in the preparation together with her team in the preparation of uh, the budget. And uh, I look forward to a discussion here today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So, corporate services. Corporate services appropriate provided for operation of the Office of the Minister and Deputy Minister, support staff and departmental centralized administrative management functions. Administration, 41,700. Equipment, 500. Materials, supplies and services, 11,300. Professional services, 1,500. Salaries, 798,400. Travel and training, 23,800. Total corporate services, 877,200. Shall the section carry? Carry. Highway safety. Registration, safety and scales. Appropriations provided for the administration and enforcement of the Highway Traffic Act. The Highway Weight Regulations under the Road Act and the promotion of safety on the highways. Administration, 60,000. Equipment, 16,900. Materials, supplies and services, 370,100. Professional services, 32,500. Salaries, 3,403,200. Travel and training, 47,900 grants, 100,000. Total registration, safety and scales, 4,030,600. Uh, uh, total highway safety, 4,030,600. Shall the section carry? Question, Chair. Sure. Okay, uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you. Uh, firstly, just a couple of questions on the, the, the numbers here in the section. I see that the salaries are down from last fiscal, Wendy. Is there a, can you explain why? Uh, Yes, we had a number of vacant positions during the year. Um, the, we were uh, short-staffed on some commercial vehicle officers. Uh, recently, they have since graduated. Uh, we're in the process of going through the hiring process to fill those positions. Okay. All right. New Haven Rock Point. Thank you. Uh, I think it was in the last sitting we had a discussion around, and, and if this is not the, section, the right section for this question, Minister, please tell me around the frequency of vehicle safety testing. I'm assuming that that would fall under highway safety, but maybe it doesn't. Um, I'm wondering, you may, I think the commitment was that you were in the middle of a review. Has, can you give us an update on that? Uh, yes, uh, certainly, and thank you uh, for the question, uh, member. Uh, yes, that was uh, brought forward by yourself as, uh, as uh, an item, I'll put it that way, to be looked into or looked at. Uh, certainly have uh, compiled a fair bit of information from staff. Uh, it's not complete, so I'm not at a point right yet to make a decision one way or the other. I think uh, the two things on that, though, member, is that, as I've said numerous times, throughout the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, safety has to be paramount. That is an aspect. Uh, in the consideration of a decision. And then are there any implications, side implications, such as insurance premiums, things right. along that line. But uh, yes, it is still under review. Great. Thank you, Minister. New Haven, Rock Point. Thank you. I appreciate the update, Minister. And uh, I, I look forward to the conclusion of that. And like you, I've, uh, I've spoken to others and, and had a, a wide range of opinions. It's very, very interesting to talk about, but I, I appreciate that you're in the middle of that review. Uh, a question on this section again, um, wondering how much money is spent to promote safety for cyclists here on Prince Edward Island on our provincial highways? I don't have that number here with me. I would have to bring that back. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, final question for this section, Chair. There were, I see there were consulting fees under the highway depart, uh, under this section. Can you tell us what that consulting was for? <clears throat> uh, this would be consulting fees to um, aid in 
um, reviewing internal policies and practices and that within the division. Um, yeah. I'll put you back on the list. Okay, I'm just going to ask a follow-up to that, but that, that's uh, fine. Yeah. I'll grant you one follow-up. I, I appreciate that, Chair. So, Wendy, would that include such things as the review of the frequency of safety testing for vehicles that we were just talking about, or, or, or is that entirely internal? I would have to look at that and bring okay. that back. Okay, I'll just wait for that. Thank you, Chair, for granting me that. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. Chair, um, question to the Minister. Um, a few weeks ago, I had a bill on the floor that was an act to amend the Highway Safety Act, in which it was going to, um, I guess the purpose was to have a one-time only payment or registration, and that status would stay with the vehicle for the lifetime of ownership. Um, at that time, you had a few questions, and when we tried to question you, you said... Leader of the you, Opposition, do you have a question? I yes? have a question, and I okay. could have a hundred more, too. Okay. So, you had said that you don't answer questions. We can't ask you questions, but here's my opportunity to ask you a question. So, you thought there might be some issues with uh, highway safety regarding that bill. Can you explain now what issues may have occurred or could possibly have occurred had that bill passed? Minister, if that's not a budget question, we can... I, yes, so if the Honourable Member can tie it into a specific budget line question here. So, is the administration of the Highway um, Safety Act under this division? Is it, sorry, could you just... The Highway that? Safety Act. Is yes. the administration of that act under, this, under division? this division? Yes. Okay, so therefore, I'm asking what implications that act what that bill, had it passed, would have on the Highway Safety Act. We are referring back here, Chair, to a bill that was brought forward, which was debated, which was voted upon, which was voted down, the decision of, uh, and that vote of the Committee of the Whole was upheld. Thank you for the clarification, uh, Minister, and that might be a good question set on the floor. Actually, it's not. It's a good session question right now. So another we're, question. Yeah, we're asking, uh, I'm asking questions on what your department, what advice they gave to you regarding this bill, why it would have uh, safety issues or implications if it was passed and what they were. Again, this is not a budget-related question, Leader of the Opposition. So if you can ask a budget-related question, I will grant it. Otherwise, I'm moving on. Um, Chair, this is about administration salaries that are paid for individuals who are hired within this department to make decisions and to give recommendations. There's a salary line item here. There's professional services. There's administration lines on this budget. I want to ensure that those individuals are what information they're passing into these acts that are listed, whether it be the Highway Safety Act, the um, Roads Act, or what have you. Again, Minister. I, uh, I will make a very general comment here, and Minister. this is the last comment that I will have on this, is that the salaries of professionals in right through transportation and infrastructure infrastructure and without a doubt within registration safety highway safety do a fantastic job the member brought forward a bill that was debated there was uh, very little consultation with ones that i had brought forward questions i had brought forward at that point in time i've said over and over again chair that safety has to be paramount Obviously, from my opinion at that point in time, that the member had not addressed that, and based on the vote of the Committee of the Hall, that uh, was shared. And with regard to going back to the bill that was debated, uh, I have no, no further comments. It was debated. Thank you, Minister. Yeah. And I'll give you another question. Then. Thank you, Chair. This so. A general question, if uh, one was to have registrations, a one-time only pay, what implications would that have on, on um, your department or safety? Because this is the department regarding highway safety. And again, Minister, it's at your discretion. If this and that's not, not I'm not talking about a bill, I'm just talking about changes that could possibly take place. 
We could speculate, I think, on a number of things. Uh, there was uh, a question that was brought forward here just a few minutes ago with regard to uh, uh, inspection, which, you know, uh, I do appreciate uh, the Honorable Member bringing that forward. And again, I have complete confidence in staff in the information that they will provide on this. Uh, and again, the, the caliber of staff that we have, the information that they provide, the work that they do day in and day out is of, uh, of top, it's top caliber. Thank you, Mr. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. And I am not um, at, at any point during this conversation questioning the ability of any of the staff within highway safety or within the Department of Transportation. I'm asking about specifically if the legislation was to be brought, for, brought forward that had, because registration is underneath this part right here, it's right in the title. So how, if registration was, a bill was brought forward, let's say, or the registration process was changed where it was a one-time only payment and that registration stayed with the owner of the vehicle on, until it was sold or, or, or whatever, um, what safety concerns could possibly be there? Once again, Chair, I think that we have discussed this to a fair extent already here today. Going back, any bill that is brought forward is to be debated. One of the first questions always is, who have you consulted with? If a committee of the whole feels that, that there are aspects of that legislation that they had concerns with, any individual member can vote for or against. What uh, the Honorable, the Leader of the Opposition is bringing forward mm -hmm. here is complete speculation. And I'm not going to sit here and speculate on what legislation could be brought. So, forward. Minister, I'm going to cut in here for a second. Yeah. We've debated this bill. I didn't talk about the bill. We voted on mm -hmm. this bill. This is not mm -hmm. the appropriate place to question that vote. So, please, Leader of the Opposition, question. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. And nowhere is that I question the vote on this bill. And the last three questions that I asked, nowhere is that I indicate anything about a bill that was passed or debate it in this house. I'm asking about potentially, and he's talking about speculation. Well, there was speculation from this minister that there might be potential implications with such a bill if it was to come forward. So I'd like to know what these are, what those would be. How does that tie into the budget? Uh, highway question. safety, registration, safety, scales, Highway Traffic Act, we have the uh, Highway Safety so Act, what, we have the what Roads line, Act. Leader of the Opposition, yep. are, you, are you tying this question to? What line in the budget here? I'm Please. talking about just, Chair, what I just said. All of these acts are either developed, uh, changed, regulations come out of these from the administration, from the uh, employees within this division. So, I'm asking about a question on the work uh, that potentially um, could be, I guess, prepared for legislation or, or has been prepared or questions that go to these individuals that are on these salary lines. So, are you tying it to the salary line? I'm tying budget? it to administration, salaries, professional services, uh, maybe even grants. Minister, if this is something that you would like to take back. Again, uh, the leader of the opposition is talking about potential legislation that could be brought forward. By talking about potential legislation that could be brought forward, the leader of the opposition is asking me to speculate on something that I have no idea what the details of that legislation could be, which I am not prepared to do so, Chair. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. As Minister of Transportation, I'm sure you have conversations within your department, whether it's uh, division um, managers or what have you, on um, potential or any bills or any 
any uh, regulation changes, uh, policy changes within that department and that particular division. So I'm going beyond specu speculation. Um, I'm asking you what potential, and I'm asking this directly, what potential hazards, implications would taking or making a registration a one-time uh, deal and that registration staying with a, the ownership until it is sold or what have dispersed out, what impact will that have on highway safety? This is a highway safety division. It's not related to the budget, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Leader of the Opposition. So thank you, Chair. And I, I'm really trying to get an answer because this Minister has a tendency, whether it's in the floor of the House, whether uh, for question period, bills or what, or, or today when he's sitting here trying to present his budget uh, and defend his budget, um, to never give an answer. So this is something that I'm just not coming up, but this is what Islanders are coming up with, with asking why this minister specifically said what he said in the House uh, as to why he would not support this bill, representing the Department of Transportation, representing highway safety. It was a highway safety issue. We are in the highway safety uh, section of this report. He is the minister responsible. I'm asking why or what implications any such legislation would have on the owner changing the ownership of a vehicle registration to a one-time only fee and that registration says valid for as long as the ownership of that car doesn't change. How does that um, have any implications on safety? Uh, Thank you, Leader of the Opposition, and if I may intervene here for just a moment and weigh in as uh, someone that does operate a, mm -hmm. uh, a shop and sees uh, hundreds of cars come through the doors every year, uh, in, in my opinion and in the opinion of many of the graduates that I talk to, um, it is uh, of the opinion that registrations yearly uh, provide accountability to the registered owner of the vehicle, that they have a valid inspection slip, that they have valid insurance. And it's an opportunity to put eyes on a vehicle yearly. Now, again, that's, uh, I just wanted to intervene mm -hmm. with that thought. So, we're fed, the opposition. Uh, Sorry, we're fed, Minister. We're uh, fed, Chair. Uh, we have reverted back to discussion on the bill that was debated. Uh, Chair, what I will do is bring back uh, to the legislature complete rationale on what the Leader of the Opposition is speaking about. Thank you, Minister. I look forward to seeing that. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Chair, and I, I'm not going to debate with you on what, uh, what the implications that could have because that is incorrect. Um, a one-time vehicle registration, the vehicle is registered for the lifetime of that vehicle. That registration does not change ever, so it has nothing to do with a yearly inspection on a vehicle or, or anything else. The vehicle is registered, it's registered. So nothing changes on that. Do you have a question? Minister, will you bring that, back that information on Tuesday of next week? Yes. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Okay. On line, the administration line, there is a, the budget estimate was 60000 The forecast uh, is 113200 Can you tell me what that change was due to? Uh, we had an increase in our, our postage fees and courier costs related to the mail-out of driver's licenses. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. And was that a one-time, um, one-time, I guess, mail-out, or is this going to be a continual? It uh, varies from year to year based on where the cycle is at in the five-year registration driver's licensing. Leader of the Opposition. Wouldn't that cycle be based on an individual's birth date along with the time of the month date that they register it in year? Uh, yes, it would. However, we're in the process of moving from a three to five year. So we're, we're cycling through the end of the three year and moving to a five year cycle. So some people are at different points during that cycle. Leader of the opposition. So the postage uh, will not have any impact on the 2024, 2025 um, licensing year? We are hoping that it will stabilize back down to prior years once we get through the cycle. Leader of the Opposition. Okay, again, back to the mail out. What specifically were they mailing out again? Driver's licenses. Leader of the Opposition. 
For who? Like for for how many people? How was that determined? Who had their licenses um, mailed out in that period of 23-24? I'm, I'm not sure what you're saying. Licenses were mailed out, but mailed out to who? To the owner of the license. Okay. Leader of the opposition. So. Again, what would it? What would be the reason to send those out in the mail to individuals? When you go into an access PEI mm -hmm. site or service PEI site, you re renew your driver's license, mm -hmm. and your driver's license is mailed out to you. Yes. Okay. Leader of the opposition. Thank you. So, how is that? Again, you mentioned a three moving to a five, but we have almost a double the amount in this budget for postage, but yet that doesn't show any change in the uh, budget estimate for 2024 and 25 year for postage. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think uh, probably the best on this is we will bring back uh, the complete breakdown that resulted from the budget estimate to the budget forecast uh, that shows uh, as to what Wendy has put forward here. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. But I guess my question is, it's just, I guess I'm trying to get my head around these licenses are whether they're renewed or a new license. Yes, I understand the process. They get their picture taken and then the, the license is sent to, into the mail a couple of weeks after they receive them. But this happens on a daily, weekly, and yearly basis. I'm not understanding why this particular line item was doubled in this year and there doesn't reflect any change for the 2024-2025 budget estimate. So Leader of the Opposition, I think the Minister just clearly stated that he was going to bring back uh, information on that and a breakdown on it. So Yes, Chair. So question. question is, because we've seen this so many times in this House of budget takes backs that we either don't get them uh, taken back or they're taken back after a certain section and um, division and uh, department has Tuesday. been approved. So that's why I'm asking this question now because it's $60,000. Uh, change on this line item, and I think sixty thousand dollars is so again, a significant amount of money. Leader of the opposition, that was your opinion, and uh, the minister clearly stated that he was going to bring back that information on Tuesday of next week. Do you want him to repeat that? No, he did not say he was bringing it back on Tuesday of next week. Minister, go ahead. Uh, I do appreciate uh, where the leader of the opposition is coming from on this, and uh, I think it is important uh, the discussion that we've had uh, to be provide. Obviously, this is of uh, great importance to the leader of the opposition. Mm -hmm. This uh, fifty-three thousand two hundred in, in this budget uh, line. Uh, it will come back on Tuesday. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, $53,000 would go a long way to a, a, any family struggling on Prince Edward Island to make ends meet. Uh, so it is a significant dollar amount. The equipment line, 16900 was a budget estimate, estimate for 2023-2024. Present or The forecast for 23-24 is 31300 What changed there? What equipment was purchased? Uh, there was a uh, requirement for increased uh, purchases of field and shop equipment. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Could you be more specific, please? So it was a one-time only purchase. It's not a reoccurring purchase for uh, Panasonic tough books and mounts to go in commercial vehicle and highway safety vehicles. Leader of the Opposition. Um, uh, excuse me. Can you just amount for... They're a, a tough book, is what they're called. Mm -hmm. They're like a, a, a more durable laptop or tablet to go and in a, an enforcement vehicle. Leader of the opposition. And the mounts would be the mounts inside the vehicle, Mr. Correct. Okay. And that's a one time only? One time only. Okay. Initial purchase or okay. upgrade. And you, Leader of the opposition. So obviously, I don't, you don't foresee any new uh, out of the regular um, buys or equipment needs for the upcoming budget year? No. Leader of the Opposition. Um, let's go down to Materials, Supplies and Services. $370,100 was a budget estimate for 2023-2024. In the forecast for 23-24, it's $437,000. Could you please explain what that, uh, the difference, uh, what was purchased? Yes, um, the increase that, uh, 
from budget to forecast is for uh, driver's license, uh, sorry, driver's license, drivers, uh, license plates, I'm sorry, is what I'm trying to say. There was a new license plate issue during the year. Um, so we would have had to increase our stock, then we would go back down to our normal buying cycle. Leader of the Opposition. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the salaries. There was a decrease in salaries um, in, the, in the forecast. Was Is there a position that's vacant? Was Did someone retire? Did someone leave in that period? Um, as I believe I just answered a few minutes ago, the we had some commercial vehicle enforcement officers that were vacant. There was a program run. The people have run through the program. Um, we are in the process of staffing those positions right now, so there were vacancies, but they are currently with the PSC in the staffing process. Well, you're the opposition. Thank you very much. So if I'm looking on this line, I can assume, but you can confirm, are there any new um, hires that may be happening within this particular division? Uh, are you asking if there's new positions? Yes. Uh, no, there are no new positions. No. Okay. Leader of the opposition. Uh, thank you very much. So on grants, um, 50000 was the budget estimate for 2324, uh, uh, but there was 20000 more spent uh, in the forecast, and the budget estimate for 2425 is up to 100000 which is double what the estimate was uh, this time last year. Can you just give me a little bit of an explanation on those line item changes? Uh, it, uh, certainly a part of it going from uh, 50 to 70,000 in grants. It reflects increased funding support to the PEI Snowmobile Association. And then going forward uh, in the 24-25 year, up to 100,000 reflects uh, grants going to uh, the ATP Federation as well. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. So back to the ATV registration, they would then require a, a license plate, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Would that license plate also be listed in the budget uh, estimate for this coming year? Yes. So why wouldn't Leader that line item... Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. So why wouldn't that line item change then for materials, supplies, and services? Is um, there... I would have to... I'm not 100% sure, certain on this, but I believe right now there isn't a requirement for them to have a license plate. Leader of the Opposition. Okay, so you're saying there is not a requirement in the, the registration promise, or there is? There is. Okay. okay. Leader of the Opposition. So therefore, I would anticipate if there, uh, that there should be an expense for licensing, license plates, for the purchase of license plates, but that doesn't reflect that in the material supplies and services. Why not? If there's a current requirement to have a license plate and that requirement continues, there will be no change from year to year. Leader of the opposition. So when the requirement uh, come in place for ATVs to, uh, for registration to have a license plate? I would have to bring that back. Leader of the opposition. Because it's, I don't think that was reflected in last year's budget line and it is not reflected in this year's budget line. So that's where my question is coming from. If you could bring that back, it would be greatly yes. appreciated. Shall the section carry? Yes. Total highway safety, $4,030,600. Shall it carry? Yes. All right, moving on to land and environments. Land and environments, appropriations provided for staff environmental services to department operations, management of provincial crown lands, and survey operations of the department. Administration, 144,700. Equipment, 11,700. Materials, supplies, and services, 256,100. Professional services, 372,000. Salaries, 2,581,000. Travel and training, 99,400. Total land and environment. 3,464,900, shall it carry? Total land and environment. Uh, oh, sorry, questions? All right, speak up there a little louder for, <laughs> didn't, have, didn't have my hearing aid turned up. O'Leary and Verness. Uh, Minister, just on a, a couple of issues, and it's back to some of question period in the Mount Pleasant situation. Is this where leasing of land uh, comes under, falls under land and environment in the Mount Pleasant property? Just, just I don't want to start, and if it's not. 
I would have to see where that property is. Are we leasing it from somebody else or are we leasing it to somebody else? I guess it would be my question. Okay, O'Leary. So, uh, sorry, if I could. Sorry, uh, O'Leary and Vanessa, we're going to let the minister maybe. Uh, yeah. uh, just for if you could provide a bit more clarity maybe on that, please, uh, member. So go ahead, O'Leary. Okay, so my understanding is the province owns the land of Mount Pleasant, and it has an arrangement with uh, some leases that it leases out to uh, other individuals. I, as I think the minister stated the question period, there, there were three leases. My understanding is, is that one would be with a particular farmer, uh, the, other, the other would be with an asphalt plant, and the third is the government itself has a lease uh, with the, on uh, a parcel of the property, I think, uh, if that may be described. Uh, so can, is that confirmed? Well, <laughs> Have I got the three right? Yeah. Uh, I think overall, like uh, what I would ask uh, Wendy is just for clarification or information, we're figured because the department has a number of leases out right across the province. Mm -hmm. So these leases uh, would be no different, like lease right. area on this particular parcel would be no different than on other areas. So just maybe if you can provide any clarity on that. Wendy. Yeah. Um, Yes, again, this, this will be the section where government leases out property. If that okay, so, you, so this, this is Mount Pleasant then, because you do have leases, and there's still one that's about to expire, as my understanding is, in May. He's talking about revenue from leases. So, so if I could again for go ahead, clarity, Mr. you were talking about revenue to the department from leases, am I correct? O'Leary and Vernesco go ahead. Well, that would be one portion of it. I guess the issue would be is that if you're receiving revenue, then obviously there's a lease and it's current. Um, but ultimately, where I'm trying to get, get at here is that we, my understanding is, is that there are three leases uh, on that particular property, one with the Department of Transportation, one with the uh, Department of uh, uh, Nashville Plant, and the third is, is uh, with a farmer. Uh, the issue I have in, in this is that, as you're aware, that there's the Lennox Island First Nation is in the process of trying to uh, establish a solar farm on that site, and that's where my questions and question period were stemming from. But we're seeing activity on the site, uh, in other words, big piles of gravel and uh, smoke from asphalt plants and stuff, but the lease is supposed to expire in May. So I'm just wondering ultimately what the status of that lease, if this is the section, I, I just don't want to waste my time. I'm, I'm assuming it's a section, but uh, and it sounds like it's a section. <laughs> okay, so what is your question? The, the question is what are the status of those leases? Because as I understand, one lease is about to expire. And uh, what is the status the, on the leases? So there's activity going on there. So is it going to be <laughs> renewed? <laughs> okay, if this is not related to the budget, then we can uh, that's what I'm uh, questioning, to be honest here, is how the status of an individual lease, mm -hmm. and it's been clarified that lease revenue, how the status of an individual lease fits into any, you know, any of the lines in this section. And if a member can tie it in, certainly, but uh, is I this, still... Is this something, perhaps, a conversation in your office would... Absolutely. No, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> so, O'Leary and Vanessa, if you can figure oh, out a way It's quite easy. So, so what positions in the, under the salaries category of $2,581,000 administers the lease of the Mount Pleasant property? I think that covers it, should it? <laughs> exactly. What position in the salaried line administers the lease on the Mount Pleasant property? It would be the same individual or the salaried position that administers leases across the province. Uh, just to wrap up, if I could share in this, I think there was a great uh, uh, dialogue exchange between the Honourable Member and the Premier earlier this afternoon, or earlier today in question period. Uh, but I think I felt at that point in time provided a lot of clarity mm -hmm. to the honorable member. And uh, uh, certainly I would look, uh, welcome the opportunity to sit down with the honorable member to discuss this in a bit more detail. But I fail to see where 
falls into the scope of an overall operating budget or even in this section of it. Duly Thank noted, you. Minister uh, O'Leary and Vernas, do you have another question? So, under professional services, so for some of your land uh, that you had work to be done on that particular land, so if I go back to uh, uh, Mount Pleasant again on the particular property mm -hmm. where you had a uh, holding site for a lot of uh, waste wood, is is the uh, contracts that you had with the Carbonator 6000 under professional services, or is that, where is that contract? I'm not uh, we'll bring that information Thank back. You. Next question, O'Leary Inverness. Um, when it comes to uh, travel and training, so I'm assuming with, with some potential work that's going to be going on in the Mount Pleasant site, uh, there's going to be a lot of travel from ever who that person is that deals with leases uh, in discussing uh, an arrangement with uh, possibly a Lennox Island First Nation lease. Do um, you think that's enough money in that travel and training budget? That's really, uh, you, you underspent last year and you're really only allocating the same amount and mileage has gone up. Yes or no? Go ahead, Minister. Would have been easier to answer the first question. Oh. <laughs> um, the travel and training would vary from year to year based on what properties are being negotiated either to purchase, lease. Um, today with technology, um, yeah. sometimes there are teams meetings uh, and travel to the actual site is not required as it can be done via cell phone, office phone, teams meeting. Mm. Indeed, technology is a wonderful thing. So, O'Leary and Vernes, uh, I'm going to have to put you back on the list. Sure, appreciate uh, that. New Haven, sir. Rocky Point. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in the management of provincial crown lands as well, but not perhaps in the same way that O'Leary and Vernes was. Um, could you tell us what, what's encompassed in, in management of provincial crown lands? I would have to bring that back. Okay. O'Leary, uh, Rosary, uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Yeah. Uh, specifically, I'm wondering whether there are any of those provincial crown lands on which hunting is permitted. Uh, that's not really a budget question, is it, mm. New Haven Rocky Point? Uh, Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, sure. I, I see that this section is tasked with management of provincial crown lands, and presumably there's there are costs and salaries and uh, well, all, all of the line items here. And uh, I'm wondering whether there is <coughs> hunting allowed. There would, there would be, presumably, you have to put up signs if it's, if it's prohibited. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody would have to monitor and enforce that. So I think it is absolutely a budget question to ask whether hunting is allowed on any of those provincial crown lands. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> no, I uh, appreciate uh, the question uh, from the honorable member. Uh, as uh, you can realize, of a number of acres of crown land across this province uh, and it is increasing as additional lands are purchased. Uh, what I will do is bring back uh, information on that as far as what criteria may be utilized or things along that line. Wonderful. Uh New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks. I, I didn't hear all of your answer, Minister, but oh. I, I, you did say you'd bring something back. Yes. Uh, I think I feel pretty, pretty comfortable saying that s at least some provincial crown land is, uh, there's somewhere there's a prohibition, but there's somewhere hunting is allowed. I'm just wondering whether you were consulted at all on the Sunday hunting bill, which is coming forward later this sitting. Uh, personally? No, your department, you personally or well, your department? Uh, personally, no, I was not, uh, but again, I don't have my head around how that is a budget question. Nor do I, uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Do you have a way to frame that in a question that ties to the budget? Well, no, the minister answered the question. He wasn't consulted. That's all I wanted to know, so thanks. Okay. Uh, are you uh, asking? I'm done on questions? this section, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, O'Leary and Vernes. Uh, just to get back to uh, when it comes to acquiring land, there's no money in this budget on this section for the actual acquisition of land because you had mentioned you may be dependent if you're looking to acquire land. It might be in the wrong section, so I'll just. That would be part of our capital budget. That's under capital? That is under capital. Next question, O'Leary and Vernes. What about the issue is, is uh, when it comes to the, this buffer zone buyback program that the Department of Environment offers, um, is it Eventually, does that property that they acquire come under the 
control of the Department of Transportation Hello. under land and environment. Um, again, that, that would be a capital acquisition. Any land by, bought for the buffer zone? Valeri and Burness. I, I, I clarified my question. I thought I clarified it, but was it's after it's acquired. Does it fall under this? So when it comes to salaries and services and travel and training, uh, does it, and maybe if it does not, then I totally, that's the answer. But if it does, then do you, because my understanding, they're hopefully trying to acquire a fair bit of land. So the acquisition or the, the um, people that acquire the land are part of this division. Uh, the Department of Transportation through the Public Works Act would hold the ownership of the land. Uh, the management of the land through the buffer zone acquisition would be that of the department responsible for the buffer zone acquisition program. So we would own it, but they would manage it. Okay. Well, you're in Vanessa. And that would be very comparable with forestry. I know there's some land that forestry. Okay, that, that's, uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Yeah. All set. Uh, Charlottetown, West Royalty. Yeah, um, just looking at your professional services, um, there's one vendor under 5,000 in that section, but doesn't that mean it has to be under 5,000? Can you, which yeah. handout are you looking at? I'm sorry. It's on D, DTIC1. So okay. vendors under 5,000 include, mm -hmm. and there's one. Is that the right under land environment? Yeah, I have numerous ones listed <clears throat> there. Oh, you have numerous ones? Well, why is there only one in the book? Do I only have one in the book? Can you read off what you're... <clears throat> yeah, so, sir, the vendors under $5,000 include, and then there's one, and it's uh, uh, Brad Oliver Realty Incorporated, Cox and Palmer Law Firm, um, Finance, ISE Limited, Shareholder Solutions Incorporated, <coughs> Three Rivers Town, and they're a specs company. Okay. So those are all different vendors. Charlton West World? Why are they in the same box? Because they're all under 5,000. Charlton West World. But then on the bottom line, it says vendors under $5,000 expenditure to January 31st, 2024, $5,723. <clears throat> That's uh, correct because if you took the summation of what was paid to or the vendors under 5000 which are a number of ones there, the sum of that would be $5,723. Thank you, Minister. Charlottetown West Royalty. But how much is like you have one box that says vendors under 5000 like so each one of these, but the, the total. The total is not here. Usually in the budget, it's it's if you're going to do professional service in the budget, you have the vendor, you have what the pay paid to that person, and it goes down in the line. But in here, it's in a box, and it doesn't say how much. And then it says vendors under five thousand dollars to January thirty first, five thousand seven hundred and twenty three dollars. This makes I I, I'm, I'm I don't understand. I don't understand. Could I just get a clarification on this? I felt that I did give uh, clarification, but uh, what we will do, Chair, is bring back uh, the details that bring in show that 5723 Thank you, Minister. Cheryl Thomas Geraldi. So under professional services in the in the budget book, you're, you're going to expend, uh, you're looking at expending another $75,000 exactly under professional services. Uh, can you talk about what, what you're forecasting for 24-25 in that uh, budget increase? Um, the information that I have, member, is that the increase if, uh, of 75000 is for consulting services required to support three department uh, responsibilities, which are described in the Provincial Climate Adaptation Plan. Charles Dalmas, Royalty. So the three are in, in another section, but they're going to be paid for out of, out of here. Is that, is that correct? And what, what are those three? So DTI is going to bring in a consultant or work with it to, um, we are a member, we have parts of the Provincial Climate Adaptation Plan that we are responsible as a department. Yeah. So we are, our consult, 
consultation or for action plans that we are responsible for as a department through the Climate Adaptation Fund. So this is um, where we are doing consultation to, to provide the information for the Provincial Clim Climate Adaptation Fund. Sorry, I have no time with that yeah. word. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Charlton West Royalty. So those are there's three specific ones, just so that we know, like just just the, con, the con, one consult seventy five thousand dollars. What are the what are the three things you'll be looking at for for that? Um, so con consultation will consist of action item number four from the adaptation plan, uh, increased power backup for critical infrastructure, action eight, um, increased resilience of public infrastructure, and action seven. Develop province-wide storm sewer or sorry storm water management standards. Um, DTI is anticipating spending um, these to help with spend money to help develop the plan for this. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. No, that's Sorry, very much, That's very helpful, and um, now we can start to see because some of those are very important. The storm water. Yes. And we, you're, I'm the consultant. Just, just when is the consultant's report scheduled to be back? So that we can know in future budgets what we what we could expect on on that action. Uh, this in, this wouldn't be started yet. Our budget is not passed in the house. We yeah. would have to go through a process to hire a consultant, and that. So sure. um, I couldn't say when. Yeah. Thank you, no. Charlton West Royalty. I think I'm good. Thank All you. set. Okay. Total land and environment: three million four hundred sixty-four thousand nine hundred Charlotte Carey. Thank you. On to highway maintenance. Highway maintenance administration. Appropriations provided for administration and supervision of the highway maintenance functions. Administration, 19,800. Equipment, uh, we're empty there. Uh, materials, supplies, and services, 2,336,400. Professional services, 116,000. Salaries, 928,200. Uh, Travel and training, 17,900. Total. Highway Maintenance Administration, 3418300 Shall it carry? No, questions? Okay. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple in, in the administration section. Uh, I'm not surprised, of course, to see in the operations part of highway maintenance a, a large materials, supplies and services budget line there, $28 million. But I was surprised to see in the, in the administration that materials, supplies and services, which is the bulk of the... the this uh, depart uh, this section's budget uh, is two, two, over two million. I'm wondering if you could explain or tell us what that that relates to. Um, this would be for um, uh, equipment rentals, culverts, road and roadside maintenance. So majority of the culvert installs and that the the actual purchase of the culverts are done through this section. Oh, okay. Um, as well as equipment rentals. So this is the overall arching part of the, di the division, so the overseeing of the division, I would say. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks. I really appreciate that clarification. I, I wasn't aware of that, Wendy. So, so that's rental of equipment to carry out work, uh, presumably rental of equipment that the province doesn't own or doesn't uh, have access to within the department. And, and you said culverts specifically. Is that... Is that the, the only sort of capital expense, if I can put it that way, under material supplies. And they wouldn't be capital. Uh, this, or or the, the only operating budget. This, sure. There wouldn't be a capital item. They're, they're culverts. Yeah. Right. But uh, why are why are culverts carved out into the admin section rather than operations? Just for my own benefit, I'm just surprised. Uh, the provincial inventory control belongs is a part of this section. So provincial inventory control oversees the the purchase of the culverts. And that. Um, okay. Sorry. New Haven, Rocky Point. Uh, I, I don't think I have any more questions for this Thank section. You. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, O'Leary, Inverness. Uh, just a quick one here. Uh, under uh, professional services, uh, we have uh, compiling documentation and submitting the DFAA claim for post tropical storm Dorian, 90,436. Who's that with? Uh, CBCL. What, what was it? CBCL. CBCL. Uh, question, O'Leary, Inverness. So is there a reason why you'd have to go out of uh, your department to get that done? i just just wondering. Uh, the amount of documentation required to submit a claim to the federal government under the DFAA requires us to have 
before, after, work orders, financial information, supporting backup document. Uh, it's a significant piece of work. Yeah, um, okay. the, the staff that are in the division are already tasked with mm -hmm. a lot. Well, Larry Inverness. So for uh, next year, are we dealing with the Fiona? Would this be the same contractor you do, or do you tender that out, or how, do, how does that go about uh, determining? Because I would have to only assume that for doing the same process for Fiona would be far more. If, if I'm... Um, we would be looking, um, we've already started a Fiona process, obviously, because Fiona's you know, a year behind us. Unfortunately, we're still seeing um, work related to it. Uh, CBCL would be most likely continuing on doing this work because of their um, their, pa their past practice doing this. They're, they've been doing um, DFAA claims for a number of years since Hannah and Juan and... Mm -hmm. O'Leary and Vernas. So, so the the money that would go to professional services for this coming year would not be Fiona. Like it may, we're still doing. You're saying still doing some work and dealing with that. So that might be in another budget year. It could. It would potentially be in other budget years as well. Okay. Larry and Vanessa. Uh, no, that's else? fine. That's fine. Too. All right. Uh, total highway maintenance administration three million four hundred eighteen thousand three hundred. Child carry. Provincial Highway Maintenance Operations, appropriations provided for staffing materials, equipment and services for the repair maintenance, uh, contracted snow removal, sanding and summer maintenance for Provincial Roads, administration, 164,400, equipment, 7,500, materials, supplies and services, 28,459,500, salaries, uh, professional service empty, salaries, 17,569,100, travel and training, 270,400, so total provincial highway maintenance operations, 46,470,900. Uh, we have questions from, uh, we'll start with you, O'Leary. Uh, Minister, you made the commitment about the seasonal roads for island waste management, uh, and uh, I'm just wondering, when I look at material supplies and services for maintenance of fixing up some of those roads, and you're actually spending less money than you spent last year, 38 about 35 million last year. Now you're going down to 28 million. You think that's enough to make that commitment to uh, now? Uh, and I don't know what standard you know you're going to have to. How much work you would do on each particular road to bring them up to a standard that island waste management vehicles can normally get down. But I'm just questioning that budget line to say that seems like a low number to do. What I just know in my own district is mm -hmm. going to be a fair bit of work. I think you know. I'm not an engineer. No, uh, it's, uh, it's an excellent observation and question from the Honourable Member. Um, as I understand, like in the increase uh, in the budget that we're going for under your materials, supplies and services of uh, in the range of an additional uh, $1 million, uh, there is an increase of 275000 to support summer road and roadside upgrade maintenance, uh, an additional 178000 associated with the purchase of shale, gravel and fill. Uh, as uh, the member, I'm sure, can appreciate, it's, uh, it's always difficult to nail it down right yeah, to no. the cent of what, uh, whether it's uh, with regard to seasonal roads, whether it's with regard to break up of, uh, you know, our, uh, our arterial highways and I could go on, but uh, this certainly is the estimate that has been put forward by staff as to what will be required. Yeah. Minister Tuff, when you have every MLA in the province uh, lobbying for <laughs> road repair in this district, uh, and I'm sure O'Leary and Vernes does as well, yeah. so go ahead, O'Leary. Uh, when it comes to the issue around gravel, I mean, we're, I, I, I'm just, and it does reflect, reflect the budget side of, uh, once again, the material supplies and services issue, but it seems like it's getting harder and harder and harder to find decent island gravel. Uh, are you finding that you're going to have to import significantly more off-island gravel, or what, what's your sense of that from a, and, and you're comfortable with that budget line that mm -hmm. can address that issue? Um, Am I comfortable with a budget line? Uh, yes, I am, because that budget line was provided 
by staff mm -hmm. that have worked in the department, obviously, in some cases for a number of uh, years. Thank you, Minister O'Leary. Uh, the other part was, uh, and I asked questions, this is previously about the issue of uh, sand, for sanding the roads. And as you're aware, this coming year there will not be sand coming from a number of, uh, at least two sand pits in uh, my riding. Um, once again, I'm assuming, going with some assumptions here, but maybe you can provide more clarity. Uh, where are we going to have to bring our sand, or, or do you have, is there new pits going to be opening up to address that particular issue? Uh, I'm not absolutely sure how that ties into the budget, but having said that, I will make a comment, and I know that uh, one of the areas that uh, the Honourable Member is referring to is what uh, is referred to as Mount Misery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's in my right. There was no, road. there it's was no, road. Is it? <laughs> we were certainly able to acquire sand uh, for the last year without any coming from Mount Misery. So uh, that would lead me to believe that, yes, there is an adequate supply elsewhere. Mm. Go ahead. And, and why I would say it applies to the budget, though, are, are you getting, I mean, I might understand it's always been tendered. Will, will you see a situation where those tenders are going to increase significantly because now you've got less competition? For, so you know, that's why I'm going back to that budget line of 28.5 million, which is less than what you spent last year. I question... Just to, on all the things I mentioned, that I think gravel is going to be more expensive. I think uh, sand would be that way. But uh, do, do you have a confidence that you can get all the sand replaced at the same price that you would have uh, past years? Uh, do I have confidence? I have confidence in uh, department staff that put together mm -hmm. budget projections and what those projections are based on, what the costs will be. Great. We're going to go to oh, uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. I'll put you back in the sure, list. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm, not, I'm wondering whether you have stats in front of you there, Wendy, about what the average cost per kilometre to maintain roads on PEI is. I'm, I'm obviously different for paved roads and, un, and unpaved roads. I don't have those stats with me, now. New Haven, Rocky Point. Could you bring that back, please? Yes, I will see what I can mm -hmm. bring back on that. Uh, just an observation on that, though. Uh, that would be under capital unless it's short patch. So New Haven, Rocky Point? Right. But, I mean, we have $28 million here of materials and supplies going out to maintain our, our provincial roads, presumably uh, but some of that. Just for clarity, are you talking about recapping? No, no, okay, just, the ma just maintenance, all maintenance of our provincial roads, okay. what, what we typically pay out per kilometre. I know the lifespan of our province's roads is much less than anywhere else, and I understand the reasons for that. Um, but I would love to know whether the, where we sit with the maintenance cost, and, all, and particularly the, how the cost that we put into the average kilometre that's paved as opposed to unpaved, because we have, as you know, a, lot, a bunch of... We'll bring that back. Thank you very much. Chair? Go ahead. Um, on the paved roads, are there testing standards for the quality of the pavement used? Like, is that something that you, you test? I know you do it as the paving is being done, but is that something you test regularly? Uh, uh, it would be part of, as you said, when we're paving the roads, that there is testing performed at the, the time the paving is done through the material testing app. Right. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks, Wendy, but none done on a sort of regular basis after that, just as the work is being carried out. I would have to bring that back. Could you bring that back? That would be great. Okay, New Haven Rocky Point, I'm going to go back to O'Leary and Vaness. I know I have to bring the question up about the bush cutter situation, not the capital cost of a bush cutter, be clear of that. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's one coming, but I don't know where it's going. But my question. I don't think it's going there. No. My, my question to, on the, when it comes to uh, uh, salaries, will there be a person uh, put in, in an, this a new bush cutter that's uh, going to be at least one bush cutter in my riding, <laughs> whether it's a new one or, the, or a used one? <laughs> <laughs> I've got. I got a feeling I'm going to get the. I know I'm going to get the oldest one in the fleet. But hey, <laughs> if it's better than what we had, Larry Inverness. If it makes you feel any better, I think I right now have the oldest one and share it. So. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah. Oh. Yeah. oh, thank I'll be getting that one. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> I'll put in a good word for you. <laughs> I am 
Sir. I'm absolutely shocked that there's any Thing, any reference here today to bush cutters. Yeah, yeah I figured yeah, it would be, but you know. Uh, just uh, overall, uh, there are nine bush cutters um, owned by the department across the province, three in each county. Of uh, those three in each county, two are two years of age or newer. Go ahead, O'Leary. Oh, I'm well aware that there's two that are two years of age or newer. I get the one that's old, and it's, uh, in fact, I'm told it's totally obsolete and it's uh, it, it been gone for scrap. So that's where I'm going back to. Uh, I'm of the awareness there's, there will be another bush yeah. cutter coming. Yep. But the question is, goes back to the salaries part of it. Will there be somebody in that bush cutter? <laughs> in the bush cutter? <laughs> I hope not. Well, there, no, I'm just saying in the machine that r runs the bush cutter. So uh, that, that would be great assurances. I, I say I, I, I've given up hope. I'll probably get the member from Surrey Elmira's used bush cutter. But uh, uh, a good word. Well, uh, put in a good word. Yeah, but will, will you make sure that there's enough uh, maintenance budget to see that that bush cutter at least be in working condition when it arrives in Nolari Inverness? <laughs> We will do our very best. Uh, that's thank great, thank you very much, Minister. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I think that's enough. Um, I believe New Haven Rock Just points, guys. A couple to finish off. I'm wondering how much, if any, maintenance work is done by private contractors on our provincial roads. Can, can I ask for clarification on that? Are you talking winter maintenance, summer maintenance? Is would some of that not be covered in here? Just generally, Wendy. Generally. Yeah. Um, so we, there are external contractors that would be performing maintenance as in uh, sweeping. Yep. Or um, some of the winter snow contracts or private contractors. That's in this budget. Okay. Right. Rock Point. I'm good for this section. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. Total provincial highway maintenance operations, 46470900 child carry. Excellent. We are going to page 162. Mechanical operations. Appropriations provided for operational costs of the government garages to supply equipment. Support to the highway maintenance operations. Administration, 79900 Equipment, 49200 Materials, supplies and services, 7 million. Uh, three hundred thousand. No, sorry, three thousand. <laughs> Seven million. Three thousand four hundred. <laughs> sorry, professional services fifty nine thousand one hundred. Salaries eight million seven hundred and seventy two thousand one hundred. Travel and training uh, three hundred forty six thousand eight hundred. Total mechanical operations sixteen million three hundred ten thousand five hundred. Shall it carry? No questions. Uh, Let's start with New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Choice. There was a, a, a big overspend here again on uh, on material supplies and services. Um, I'm wondering what was driving that increase. <laughs> um, this section is where the cost to maintain government fleet, light and heavy fleet, is. Yep. Uh, as so, the increased cost would be. Uh, parts for snow removal equipment, um, vehicles and that, so it's the parts to maintain those vehicles. Okay. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. So you're telling me that last year we spent more than expected on all of those parts and things? Uh, it also includes fuel as well in here. I'm sorry, okay. I should have clar clarified that. Uh, yes, we did expend more on parts and fuel than expected. Okay. All right. Uh, we have also increased or up. We have some new tandem trucks, some new snow removal gear, so hopefully as we replace aging gear, newer gear will, re will require less repairs and maintenance. Okay. Oh, New Haven, Rocky Point, Jerry. Th yeah, thanks, Chair. Is this the section where we would see uh, costs related to the maintenance of school buses? Or is that under, under education? Education. education. Uh, so all of the maintenance and repairs on school buses would be on under the education budget. Okay. 
Yes. Do you have another question? No, or? that's all I have okay. for this then. Let's move on to O'Leary and Verness. Not to belittle the fact on the bush cutting issue again, but no. uh, I did focus on the salaries the last section. Now I'm looking at the mechanic repairs. So if the fact that you're saving about one and a half billion dollars, that probably just the new bush cutter is going to make a big saving right there. Is it? We should be able to get two. <laughs> yeah. So is that your question? <laughs> well, uh, the question comes back to you got your save your. Uh, Reducing your expenditures over last year uh, by one and a half million dollars. Uh, once again, I'm questioning uh, how that's going to justify. Is the bush cutter issue going to solve all that while you're saving money, or is it a case where uh, the, that bush cutter I get from Surrey Elmira is not going to be repaired the, the first week it breaks down? <laughs> I'll get it fixed up for you. Before I well, start. I know, but the, but I'm just wondering. You got less money to fix those things up, and from what I see from parts, they're getting more expensive all the time. Just from my own farm experience, so so uh, do you do you feel comfortable that you're going to have a good fleet of bush cutters for the coming year? That we won't be running into the types of problems that both Surrey Elmira and myself have been facing <laughs> over the past year. Uh, again, the acquisition of equipment such as that is under uh, capital budget. Go ahead, O'Leary. But I go back to the issue that more than likely the uh, acquisition is, but the repair is not. The repair is under this section. Is it? Is am I under that understanding? So, once again, I'm assuming that I'm going to get one of those uh, two-year-old bush cutters, <laughs> or maybe the one from Surrey Elmira will be shipped up. And I'm questioning whether there's enough maintenance budget to do that, knowing that there's less money in the budget to comparable to last year. I thought I had uh, given the honourable member uh, complete, a complete level of comfort in the previous section. Well, that was the worker. That was not. the person operating the machine, not the machine itself. <laughs> so, O'Leary yeah. and Vanessa, uh, we'll both be yeah. keeping an eye on keeping that. Keeping an one. eye on this one. So I think let's, if let's I move move on. On. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm Just fine. in general terms, certainly. Uh, there's repairs that are required to equipment right across the board, and those repairs are done in a timely manner. I know that uh, the staff work diligently to ensure that, and I'm sure it'll be the same with regard to the bush cutter that the honourable member is referring Thank to. Thank you, Minister. Any more questions for this section, folks? Okay. Uh, total mechanical operations, 16,310,500. Shall it carry? Moving on to Confederation Trail Maintenance. Appropriations provided for staffing materials and services to maintain the Confederation Trail System. Administration, 3,400. Materials, supplies, and services, 426,900. Salaries, 1,208,600. Travel and training, 23,000. Total Confederation Trail Maintenance, 1,661,900. Uh, questions, we'll start with uh, Cheryl Town West Royalty. Uh, Materials, supplies, and services uh, were overspent in this section, and I see a, a flat line for future spending as opposed to what's that? What was he overspent for? Uh, shale, gravel, and fill. Shale Town was royalty. And was that because it got more expensive, as we talked about before, or did we get more of it? We actually purchased more of it. We had an opportunity to um, do a, another, reinforce another part of the trail. Okay. Uh, Charlottetown, West Royalty. And uh, you see there was uh, uh, maybe, it looks like maybe a couple positions short last year in this section in salaries. Is that, was that the case? We had a couple vacancies during the year, yes. Charlottetown, West Royalty. And uh, just what were those positions? Uh, I believe they were um, crew members, to be honest. Okay. Like trail crew members. And Charlton West Royalty. Will Last question in this that. section was, uh, Minister, we had a, a lengthy discussion about jackhammers uh, recently. <laughs> um, it was. We 20, all recall that. Twenty-five thousand dollars for two jackhammers and a couple saws. Um, just want to make sure the maintenance is is keeping up on those. I won't ask any questions today about them, but I'm very interested to see if there's any updates on those jackhammers. Thank you, Cheryl Town West Royalty. We're going to move on to hey, New Haven Rocky Point. Question. Thank you. Um, firstly, I want to say that I've, I'm amazed that the full length of the Confederation Trail can be maintained in the shape that it is uh, with that budget. Uh, you know, I, I travel it a lot, and almost everywhere you go, the trail is in tip top shape. So good, good on the folks who are doing that. <clears throat> I'm wondering with the uh, increased 
to more ATV crossings, if that will represent uh, a, an increase in the budget here somewhere? Uh, I would have to say, Honourable Member, it's uh, premature at this point uh, to say yes or no to that, uh, you know, the process of, of putting together what that tip to tip ATV trail will be, where it will be located at, where additional, how many additional, if any additional crossings may be required. So, uh, uh, as I say, to be premature, and since we are just getting started going down, going through that process, uh, it would be something that would be m more reflected in subsequent operating budgets. Okay. New Haven and Rockville? Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense, Minister. I get that. I'm wondering whether you keep track, and we know clearly ATVs are not allowed on the trail, but we also know clearly that sometimes they do go on the trail, and we've all seen pictures of damage. Do you, do you keep track of how much it costs to repair that damage, specifically caused by <laughs> ATVs? It's not, sometimes not difficult yeah. to tell, sometimes um, very difficult to tell. We can bring back whatever information we have on that. Sure. Okay. New Haven, sure. Rockville Point. And, I mean, one of the things that astonished me following Fiona was how quickly the trails system was brought up to snuff again. And I'm wondering, is that the extra cost of that reflected in last year's operating budget at all, or would that have come out of somewhere else? Are you referring to the 23-24 budget? I'm sorry. Uh, to... Yeah, I, I see material supplies and services. There was a fairly large overspend there, and I, I, uh, Cheryl Thomas Royalty just asked about that. But I'm just wondering where we, presumably that costs a fair chunk of money, and I'm just wondering where we would expect to see that. There is a general uh, Fiona contingency fund under general government. So they, that's where the cost associated with Got Fiona it. cleanup okay. would be. That's great. Uh, I have no more questions on this. Sorry, Thanks, uh, Chair. Leary Inverness. Yeah, uh, when I'm looking at the material supplies, so you had from last year's budget, you were overspent by 150000 something somewhere along that line. The project that you had as a pilot for the horses on the trail, did you get a, any kind of an assessment? Like, was there more money spent on maintenance on those sections? Because I had a section in my district, went from O'Leary, I believe, to your, into your district, Minister of Piesville. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if we're saying there's 150 more spent, would that be attributed to extra cost to maintain those horses on the trail section? Or am I totally wrong on that? Um, I, we had an opportunity to purchase additional shale gravel fill. Where that shale and that was placed on the trail, or the, the I, I can't speak to exactly where it was placed. Mm. Well, Larry Inverness. So, as the minister responsible for the maintenance of the Confederation Trail, what kind of <coughs> feedback have you gotten from staff regarding the horses on the trail? Uh, has it been a, an additional cost to maintain the trail in that section? Because my understanding is it's a pilot, and you are looking at. I'm, assuming a fairly thorough review to whether you want to expand that over the whole entire trail. So mm -hmm. can you? Um, just, uh, I guess, in general uh, terms, uh, you look at uh, the Confederation consultation process was probably one of the most, uh, uh, one of the consultations that we have seen take place on the island that had the level of involvement, the level of input into it. And uh, as you're aware, we've already received the first portion of the feedback, the what we heard uh, mm -hmm. portion of it. Uh, the final report will be forthcoming mid, uh, no, late spring, early summer. And I think uh, that will be one of the things that will be in that. I would anticipate, obviously not having seen it, but just with regard to feedback, with regard to uh, horses on the trail. Larry Inverness. But wouldn't your department have, have uh, just at least the numbers, uh, like say, I know there's a bigger picture besides just what it costs to maintain, because there's the value of people accessing the trail with horses or whatever, but it, you have to balance that with the cost of maintenance and try to figure that out, and, and safety, and there's a whole lot mm -hmm. of big factors. But just from a purely cost perspective, would you not have a sense of, at least one section to say how much more it costs to maintain it than just an, another section or not? Wouldn't that be part of your review in, in the pilot itself of the horses? 
Uh, we'll go back to the department, see what breakdown, what information there is, and bring that back. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chair. That's all. All set. Uh, any further questions in this section? No. Uh, total Confederation Trail maintenance, 1,661,900 child carry. Thanks for chair. All right. Thank you, member. Oh, uh, hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, hello out there. Uh, the total highway maintenance is sixty-seven million eight hundred sixty-one thousand six hundred. Shall it carry? Carry. Carry. All right. Public works and planning. Public Works Operations Administration appropriations provided for division staffing materials and travel for administrative supervisory and trade staff in building maintenance and accommodations. Administration 113,100, equipment 9,500, material supply and services 1,843,300, professional services 150,000, salaries 1,650,400, travel and training 38,500, total Public Works Administration 3,804,800, shall carry? Charlotte Town West Royalty? Um, uh, their professional service is 150000 uh, scheduled for next year. What is that? What is that for? Um, so the, that's a new line item this year. It's $150,000 uh, funding for con uh, consulting service required to carry out the review of government space and usage, a needs assessment for future government spaces based on growth of government and overall government services. Charlotte Town West Royalty. In what sections, the overall government, um, so we're, we're out of space, are we, and we're looking at trying to fill new space, or is this to do with health BEI or, or any, anything in particular? So transportation overseas, or public works overseas, all owned and leased buildings within government property. Mm -hmm. Charlotte Town West Royalty. Owned and leased buildings, I'm sorry. $150,000 to consult on that, it would obviously be a pretty big consultation. I know you said overall government, but where are our, where are our deficiencies and weaknesses that the consultant's going to look at? Uh, they're going to look at this, the space needs people, where people are, what space is required for them, um, to see what government needs are. Charlottetown West Royalty? Because we're at a, are we at a position where we're totally full at this time in in government right now? I would have to bring that back. I, I don't know if we're totally full. That's you Haven Rocky Boy. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, is this the department in which Holly Hines would have worked? Yes. Sir. I only asked that because she recently retired, and she was a wonderful, wonderful civil servant. I just yeah. thought the world of Holly, and I just wanted to say thank you. She did, and I'm sure she's she's going to be missed in your department, Minister. Um, just a couple of questions here. We asked a uh, actually leader of the third party asked this a few weeks ago to uh, for you to table uh, the assessment of the Rosedale Manor, which you did. But the assessment we got was from 2017, and I know that there was a more recent one done in 2022. I'm wondering whether you can table the more recent assessment, the 2022 assessment. Certainly can get back and, uh, yes, bring that back as, uh, as soon as possible. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. Do you know how much was spent, because uh, a large chunk of renovations were done between the assessment that we were given and the one that we're going to get from 2022, do you know how much was spent on renovations during those five years? Oh, I don't know. I'm towards my is, is that the former um, in Montague? Yes, in Montague, the yeah. manor in Montague. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, it goes wondering. by a number of names. I know it's yeah. the Rosedale Centre. Montague Manor. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. <clears throat> you have Rocky Point? Can, can I ask you to bring that uh, data back as well, along with the, the assessment from That's 2022? That's a health problem. Yes. Uh, and certainly, if it's available through my department or through uh, uh, TI, that was uh, 
a health building under HPEI. So I would assume, speculate uh, that uh, whatever <coughs> renovations, you know, upkeep, maintenance, it would have been out of their budget. But if it was out of uh, anything out of ours, we'll commit to bring it back. Okay. And Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. Final question on this point, uh, on this section. Uh, how much is budgeted for demolitions? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, Chair. Could uh, the member repeat the question, please? Yeah. How much in this section? I mean, the part of. Um, looking after buildings is unfortunately at some point, well not unfortunately, but inevitably uh, will require demolition of publicly owned buildings and that's what we are being told might happen with the Rosedale Manor. And I'm just wondering how much we budget for, for demolitions of public buildings each year. There's, there's no budget in this section for demolitions. Okay. In, in this section. Charlotte, now what's royalty? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I, I, budget estimate for salaries was uh, uh, 1.4 million budget forecast was exactly the same. I never, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen them hit exactly the same, but here they are. Same thing with material supplies and services, exactly the same. The only difference is salaries, we have a major increase and the material line, we have a decrease. I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't understand, but I just want to kind of ask two questions in one. I guess I could ask them individually line, but Salaries, why are we looking the same and then budgeting more for the future? And materials, why are we budgeting the same and, and, and getting less for the future? Uh, we're prepared to be increased over uh, the budget uh, estimate and forecast for 23-24. Mm -hmm. uh, the increase in the 24-25, uh, certainly uh, you have the normal step increments that take place, position reclassifications, benefit rate increases. And there is also funding for the creation of one of a new accommodation officer position to work with required to work required for government space needs assessment as well as day to day needs. Uh, with regard to the one million four hundred and seventy five thousand that was a budget estimate and forecast. Uh, uh, good management. Good management. Uh, there's there's no change between budget and estimate. Um, we were fortunate enough to be able to um, fill or backfill positions as needed um, due to timing of vacancies. Uh, we were able to remain yeah. within the, the budget, but great management. Charlottetown West Royalty. <laughs> I just felt those numbers very, very odd because it's normally yeah. there's increments and they were flatlined each time. So one accommodation officer looking at, um, is that the same? Are they going to be working with the consultant? Is that what's happening? Because that's would they be looking at space issues for the future, but don't we have to wait for the consultant's report to come back before we hire somebody? So the accommodations officer will work with the, the um, consultant, but they also will address day-to-day -day needs within... Every time somebody moves offices, changes floors, gotcha. a department moves, there's there's work that has to go on behind behind the scenes to either revamp a floor layout or do something like that. So this is what this accommodations officer will do. Perfect. Good answer. Right. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. Um, a follow-up question. I, I think it was Charlotte Town West Royalty asked about the 150,000 for professional services, and you mentioned I think your answer was that it was a sort of review of the inventory of uh, public buildings, was that correct? I have a follow-up. Uh, sorry, I flipped pages here. Uh, so it's a consulting service uh, to carry out a review of government space usage and a needs assessment for future government spaces based on growth of government and government services. Great. You have a rocky point? Yeah, thanks. So w we, when we were discussing the issue of creating more childcare spaces, one of the barriers to that is the cost, capital costs of either constructing new or repurposing an existing building. And I remember in that discussion, obviously in the education department, uh, one, one site was, was uh, identified as a potential place that could be repurposed into uh, a childcare centre, an early learning centre. 
And I'm wondering whether the, the data, that report that you just mentioned, whether that is available? And if so, could you table it? it it's, this is part of the current year budget that we're debating now, so th this hasn't been done. It has not been done. Okay. It, it has not begun. It has not been done, no. You okay. have an rocky point? So, in order for, so would that cost have been absorbed within the salaries or the work done typically in the department before for them to be able to tell us that only one site exists that's suitable for an early learning center, for example? I'm, I would be making an assumption that it would be done as part of a capital project. I'm not, I'm not sure how, to be quite honest. Okay. You have a rocky point? Yeah. So I, I, I know there's a, a lot of uh, unused, if I can put it that way, or underutilized uh, publicly owned provincial buildings. And I would love to see them fully utilized to their best potential. Uh, I look forward to seeing this review. I, uh, I would have expected that that would be an ongoing part of the job of the department. Is, is there just a, f a final question on this? Uh, is there an ongoing review of the inventory we have and an assessment of what its most, uh, its best purpose could be? Uh, our staff, on a daily basis, as requests come in to make, uh, again, to move offices, to change, to hire new people, that they would be reviewing what space is available and where they could be. Um, so as part of an ongoing just existing space or allocation of people. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't you have a right point. On yeah, thanks, okay. Chair. Uh, on a, on a, I appreciate that, Wendy, so I'll just look out for the report when it comes out. Uh, when, during Fiona, uh, I'm sorry, during COVID, and for some time afterwards, buildings were constructed and brought in uh, in Borden and at the ferry as well. Uh, and those buildings were then presumably moved or, or sold or whatever. Can you tell us what happened to all of those structures? Uh, what we can do, Chair, is bring back uh, the information with regard to those specific buildings that uh, your structures that the member is referring to and where they were transferred through to. Uh, thank and you, Minister. For that question is probably a little outside of this section. I think yeah. it's in one of the upcoming ones, so oh, okay. that's fine. I, I would guess. But, uh, All right. Thanks, Chair. Right. I'm done with this section. Shall carry? All right. Direct building maintenance, appropriations provided for regular maintenance, janitorial services, power, heat, and water to provincial government buildings. Administration, $1,366,200. Equipment, 18,500. Material supply and services, 7,201,400. Professional services, 663,900. Salaries, 2,657,800. Travel and training, 5,000. Total direct, direct building maintenance, 11,912,800. New Haven Rocky Point. So I see that we overspent here on building maintenance. Can you tell us what that was for? Yep. Uh, the primary overspend uh, were the operating costs to do with the Park Street location. Transportation operates the right. the old garage there, so that would be the heating fuels, the lights, the electricity. Okay. You have rocky point. Thanks. I appreciate that, Wendy. Uh, can you tell us how much in this uh, in this budget section is devoted to? A maintenance of publicly owned uh, long-term care homes, senior homes? Uh, the maintenance of long-term senior care homes will be under health PEI. They're, they're not in our department. Okay. Hey, Rocky Point. Okay, just so I'm clear on that, so when we, we talk about uh, maintenance of provincial government buildings, it's not all provincial government buildings. Correct. Okay, all right. Uh, you have Rocky Point? Under professional services here, I see that health PEI is listed. I'm, I'm wondering what health PEI did as a vendor. That would have been that we would have done work on behalf of health PEI. Our, our staff would have been contracted um, to have work done on behalf of health PEI and then 
build health PEI back. So that's actually a cost recovery in there. Okay, I figured that was yeah. how it worked. Yeah, I'm good with this. Uh, Charlotte, can watch Charlotte? Can you just tell me a little bit more about the Park Street? Um, so it's, you said it was heating and fuel. How much was that in all? And are you talking about the government garage part? Or are you talking about the, the, the building? The government garage part. Charlotte Town West Royalty. So, but nobody's using it. It was being used as a COVID testing facility for. Oh. Right. Charlotte Town West Royalty. Is it being heated now? I would have to look into that. Charlotte Town West Royalty. Is there anything, is it, is it operational or purposed right now? I would have to bring that back. Charlotte Town West Royalty. And around there, so that was, that's for, this section is for direct building maintenance. Um, I'm just, I don't know what, how far out does that go? And is, was there any, was there any, like, there was environmental, assessments being done on that area, but it didn't have anything to do with the building itself, did it? I'm sorry, with the building itself? Yeah. Is that included in the environmental assessment, number two? I would have to bring that yeah. back. I'm not We can bring back, uh, honorable member, uh, the full scope of the assessments. Oh, Shall I carry? Yes. Yeah, so just like, just hold on. So you, oh, you can bring sorry, back the, yes. the, 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 you can table the actual. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, okay. shall I carry? Okay. Accommodations, appropriations provided for lease and rental costs, janitorial services, power, heat and water costs for lease accommodations. Administration, 15 million, 28,600. Material supply and services, 649, 400. Professional services, 405, 800. Salaries, 20,300. Total accommodation, sixteen million one hundred four thousand one hundred. Uh, you have Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. So I see that the the government spends a, a lot. The department spends a lot on leasing building space, and I'm wondering whether there's ever been an evaluation done on whether it would be more cost effective option to to use or own have publicly owned buildings. Um, in the previous section, we have $150,000 for a consultant study to evaluate government lease space, government owned space to determine the needs of government. So that will include um, what space is required for government. You have a rocket point? Right, so it would include more than then just publicly owned buildings. It would look at the places that we lease and, f and uh, presumably to answer the question that I just asked. It would include... Yeah, it would make it would include the space that government occupies. Like, are we in the right space? I guess you'd say, or is there additional space? I, I'm not sure. I don't know the exact parameters of the, the work going to be performed. Okay, no, that, that's that's good to know. That's Charlotte Town West Royalty, an important report. Um, yeah. There's a there's an increase. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry, I wasn't. Um, I got back you and have to your hand up. I, re I forgot. Charlotte Town West Royalty. Entirely forgot. Yeah, I don't worry about it. Happens all the time. Um, what? Well, the Shellatown Library Security Services, 67,935. Can you talk about that? Uh, that's for the new Shellatown Library that's located in the old Dominion building. And there, that's for like the security services, commissioner services for that building. For that much royalty? Does that have any, was that, a, was that an estimated number? Um, and is that number going to go up next year? I'm hearing about security services being needed there uh, at the, the library. Is that having to do with that or was that a forecasted amount? That is the dollar amount spent to date to the end of January. Charlotte Town West Royalty? That's the actual, to the end of January. Does the minister, are you, are you getting requests about security services at the Charlottetown Library? And is that, what, is that an, I mean, that's a 10 month number mm -hmm. for last year. What's the forecast for next year? Uh, I would have to bring back the actual, the total forecast for next year. Um, if my memory is correct on this, that this was a tendered, this went out to RFP and was tendered. So. Oh it would be locked in for more than a one-year contract. So we'll be, we would be forecasting and budgeting based on the contract that they, we have with them. 
Right. One more member, and I'll come back. Yeah, sure. And just, royalty. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just asking that because, um, yeah, that's just what I'm hearing. So, like, and I appreciate the the minister and the, any other security services in the Shelton area that that are under this section that um, have to do with Park Street or anything. Where, where, where are those, where are those security numbers coming so, from? So the security numbers for the Charlottetown Library, you have the, yep. there's also under professional fees, there is the uh, Commissioner of Services. Yeah. That's where the Commissioner of Services will reside for the Davies Courthouse. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. Um, because this is a lease building and this is the services provided for them. Again, this is under a contract with them yeah. as well. Okay, and that's it, yeah. Do you have an hockey point? Thanks, Chair. Um, Charlottetown West Royalty just asked a couple of those questions that I was I was going to ask about the Charlottetown Library. So is that is there full time security there? I'm not sure whether that question was asked or not. I'm not sure of the hours that they would work. My assumption is they would be there when the library is open. Okay. Sorry, uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so is there security in any other libraries? on Prince Edward Island? I would have to look into that. I really don't know the answer to that. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point? Um, and I, I don't spend a lot of time there, but I love the space. And I, when I go in, it always feels very welcoming. And I'm wondering whether there's any concern that the presence of, and I don't know how they're how these security folks are, are dressed or person, presumably, if we're only spending that much money. But are there any concerns expressed by anybody, either in working in the library or the folks who use it, that it makes it a less welcoming place? Uh, what uh, I'll commit to, uh, Member, is uh, part of your question, if I understood correctly, was there were any security services at other PEI yep. libraries bring that information back? And second part of the question is, what brought about uh, the, uh, the implementation or the requirement of security services yeah. at the Charlottetown Library? We will bring that back. Okay, just before we continue, I just had a question. We are on page 163 in accommodations for anybody that uh, wanted to gotten lost or was trying to figure out where we are following along. You hate an Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I see that there's an increase uh, to professional services budgeted for the coming year, and I'm wondering what additional work you have planned. So the professional services is made up of the commissioner, <coughs> sorry, the commissioner fees for the Davies Courthouse. Yep. Um, there was an RFP issued in February, February of 2023. It was for a two or uh, for a three-year contract, uh, and that was the increase is what is what was negotiated or what was, came back through that RFP process. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. So all of the increases related to the commissioner services at yes. the courts? Okay. Great. I'm good for this. Chair. Chair. Planning and building construction, appropriations provided for staff and related services and providing planning and building construction services and departmental operations. Administration, 13,200. Equipment, 8,800. Material supply and services, 6,500. Professional services, 110,000. Salaries, 1,743,600. Travel and training, 46,000. Total planning and building construction, 19,900,000. No, sorry, 1,928,100. Shiloh Carey, oh, sorry, New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you. So can you explain what specific services this, this section funds? So, um, it's a little unclear from the description mm -hmm. of this of the section. Uh, what this section, like basically, what service it provides, yeah. uh, member? Yeah, what the funding is dedicated yeah. to. Uh, so, uh, an overview of the section: it covers the employees and resources that are required to complete planning, design, construction, contracts, and so on. Uh, examples of building, design, construction projects uh, that uh, uh, staff in this section would work on, uh, just to name two or three, would be Sherwood Elementary School contracts, uh, Summerside Community Health Center, previously uh, the Albert Community Health Center yep. as examples. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Really appreciate that. It's very clear, Minister. I understand exactly what you're talking about. I know government at some point made a commitment to moving all of its owned, all publicly owned buildings to net zero. Um, and I'm wondering whether 
that is something that will be reflected in this section? Uh, the, the move of government buildings to net zero would, would require capital, so that would be more of a capital budget related right. item. You have Rocky Point? Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree, Wendy. Um, but that also requires planning and architectural plans and, and ways of um, ways of renovating buildings that bring us to net zero. So uh, I'm wondering whether, because I don't see a, a, a big increase in the in the cost of this department. Uh, whether that's a, there's something that is there a big push on to move us to, to net zero? There certainly should be given our commitments. Um, I would have to go back and ask in the department what the where they're at with that. To be honest. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you. Just, uh, oh. Members, it's getting a little loud. Just yeah, I appreciate that. It's right right beside New Haven Rocky Point there. So. Yeah, move closer together, that's better. <laughs> New Haven Rocky Point. <laughs> Recognizing that the, ultimately the cost is a capital one, but I'm wondering if you can give us an update on the replacement of the Kings County Memorial Hospital. Timelines on that. That would be a health PEI capital budget item. Kings County Memorial Hospital would be health PEI capital budget. Right, so you'd have no information on that. I couldn't speak to that. Okay. Shall I carry? I'm good for this section. Thank you, Chair. Shall I carry? Total public works and planning, 33749800 Shall I carry? Capital Projects Division, Traffic Operations, Appropriations provided for staffing materials, equipment and services for highway signage, pavement line parkings, traffic control lights and illumination. Administration, 30,600. Equipment, 7,300. Material supply and services, 1,322,100. Professional services, 7,500. Salaries, 2,699,100, pardon me. Travel and training, 49,100. Total traffic operations, 4,115,700. We've got uh, Borden Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right over here. Good afternoon. Uh, just looking at the, uh, the materials and supply line on, on here, mm -hmm. um, and there's almost exactly a million dollars spent over what was forecasted or budgeted. Uh, could you explain that line for me, please? Uh, yes, that was uh, uh, for uh, line materials required during the fiscal year. Gordon Concord. What, what materials? It would be marking materials or line materials. Okay. So, so why was that unanticipated? So normally in, as, um, when we're doing new road work, the cost of painting lines, line materials, markings, anything else is included in the cost of the capital cost of paving that road. Uh, as we incur additional um, if there's no capital road work being done on a road, so I, I don't know, Hillsborough Bridge, I'm going to say, for example, they have to paint the, the lines on that bridge sometimes two, three times a year, so that cost for the line materials would be in here. Um, additional line painting was done throughout the province last year in order to try and increase reflectivity and, and help people being able to see the lines. I guess I'm still a little, little unsure of, of why, you know, you know the, there was so unanticipated, I guess. I guess I'm just not clear enough with how the, the department operates and predicts its needs versus, you know, what's included in the capital line and why, why, um, why we didn't anticipate that additional million dollars being necessary. I, I'm not sure if there's anything more you could say on that that, that I could help, could help me with or, or not. It, it's just, it was the cost of last year of just the, the additional painting that we did. Okay. Thank you, Member. And just, I, I have one question I'm going to interject. This might help with your line. So, um, Thanks, there's a lot of different types of, of road signs we see out there now. Some great innovations and advancements. For example, on Rustico Road through Milton there, they've got uh, the, the, the speed radar sign that has the smiley face if you're going the right speed. It'll actually tell you what the fine is if you're going too fast. Not, someone told me that, I wouldn't know otherwise, of course. 
<laughs> yeah. But um, and then they got you know stop signs. So with the it flash. wasn't through experience. No. That, no okay, no. that's good. And then there's flashing li stop signs with the flashing lights around them and this sort of thing. Um, I mean, I would I would love to get some of those in my district. And uh, in the past, I've I've received like pushback, you know, saying, "Well, you really need that there." You know, um, do you have budget to fulfill requests like that? Like uh, I'm taught probably off the top of my head, I'm going to say, you know, five or six, upwards, maybe 10 of those types of signs in my district. Ten per district, right. Uh, <laughs> I think, you, uh, you know, it's a great question. Um, and as you can appreciate, though, uh, Chair, the number of requests that do come in right across the island for all of these things. I've said before, too, though, safety has to be paramount in the department. Things that uh, you have referenced here, certainly they contribute to the safety of our highways. So, yeah. Uh, is there... I mean, I, uh, I've got specific places yeah. where I've been advocating for years. Like in New Glasgow, at the corner where the preserve company is, you come down the hill to a stop sign, almost everybody blows through that stop sign. If we had one with the flashing lights, you know? Yeah. Anyway. So I'll, I'll take that as a, as a maybe. All right. Yeah. Morning, take Kikora. it under consideration. <laughs> morning, morning, well, I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for, for raising that. Um, those flashing signs with the lights and the numbers and, and, and I guess according to the chair, the smiley faces, I am not familiar with those signs. Mm. Um, is there, you know, is, is there an analysis done by the department to, to determine the efficacy of those signs, uh, and 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 is there money in the budget uh, to maybe expand the rollout of those further? To, to the chair's question, but I guess that would also be my question: if those are effective in light of perhaps um, troubles with highway traffic enforcement and the additional costs of highway traffic enforcement, this would seem to be a cheaper option. Because um, I also get a lot of requests in my district already for these flashing type of, of speed monitoring signs. So are we going to expand those? And is there money to do so? I think you look over the last, uh, certainly the last uh, year, couple of years, uh, member. Uh, I do spend, as yourself, a fair amount of time on the roads. Uh, certainly have seen a fair increase in the number of, uh, of uh, the speed flashing when you're coming into a speed zone that monitors your speed and flashes it up. I have seen the ones that have the smiley face or the frown if you're over and the smiley face when you're under. Uh, so yes, there has been, uh, certainly there's been an increase in, uh, in that technology, the utilization of that technology, and we will continue to be. Warren Kikora. Thank, thank you for that. Um, so the, the section includes uh, illumination. Um, so the, the, the property within Gateway Village that remains owned by the province, is that captured by this section as well, uh, signage and illumination? I believe Gateway Village is under tourism, I believe, or economic growth. So the, the whole village and the illumination within the village is falls under that then. Yeah. It's not in, in this. Not here. Okay. Okay. That's right. Uh, a quick question. Does the budget for the traffic operations include rollout of the the, the photo uh, radar, uh, both at, you know, red lights as well as for, for speed? Is that, in, is that part of this budget? No. Okay. Capital, oh, Sally Carey. Carey. Capital Projects Administration, appropriations provided for the Office of the Chief Engineer for Administration and Supervisory Staff of the Highway Capital Projects. Administration, 78,200. Equipment, 28,800. Material Supply and Services, 36,500. Professional Services, 42,000. Salaries, 2,766,100. Travel and Training, 50,900. Total Capital Projects Administration, 3 million. 2,500, shall carry. Design appropriations provided for staffing materials, equipment, and travel for road and bridge design. Equipment, uh, sorry, 
administration, 9,000, equipment, 500, material supply and services, 5,500, professional services, 4,800, salaries, 845,800, travel and training, 10,300, total design, 875,900, board and concora. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm just curious about like what the, the type of design work that's that's done by this section is it architectural? Okay. Yeah, uh, the section it provides design services for the complete highway network on PEI for reconstruction and rehabilitation purposes. Of uh, design work is prepared by section staff is utilized in the division's annual tenders and construction projects. Okay, Lord Kikora. Uh, so, so what, what would be the, the design projects that were completed last year with the allocated funds as, as, as I'm examples? Projects. Yeah. I'm just I'm trying to think of which capital projects, which capital bridges and roads so, we did So remember, that, that is outside of this section. We're talking about looking yeah. forward, and that's a, that'd be it. I mean, last year's design work is a, is a little bit out of that. I mean, you could table a written question. I'm sure yeah. they'd be happy to get that for you. No, well, I, I can jump to my next question. Okay, Board and Concord. Uh, so what projects are planned for this year? Okay. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Learn quick. So the, the projects themselves will be under the capital budget. The design work would um, that has recently gone out or would, would have been included in the recent capital budget tenders that have gone out open to public. Some of them have been closed and awarded. Um, I believe the chief engineer might have been on the news the other night talking about which projects were being, so it would be those. Yeah. So, so is that already done by now? Those decisions are made and then you see them in the paper, the advertisements, So, or do they come up even throughout the fiscal year? So the design, the there would have been design work for this year's capital projects. They would be starting to look at perhaps maybe a bridge needs to be replaced or they're, depending on what comes up at any point in time during the year. And uh, one more and I'll come back to you. Okay. Board and Concora. And this is probably my last interview, Mr. Chair. It's just how does, how does the whole idea of sustainability and uh, resiliency get taken up by this section as far as, you know, we're looking at road and bridge design climate change, different uh, types of impacts that need to be factored. Does sustainability factor into the section's uh, planning? Is there money budgeted for sustainability considerations? Uh, they would be consideration taken into effect. This would be, again, I am making an assumption I'm not a designer. Um, they would be taking that into consideration as they are doing the design of a structure or a road or a bridge. O'Leary and Vernes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I've asked this question before, and, I, and I, my understanding is of the Biddeford Bridge, and I, I actually was at an annual meeting of the Central Prince Municipality, and I was getting that question. Uh, my understanding, it was supposed to be up for replacement in 2025, so I'm just wondering about the design, because there was a lot of questions about the design and realigning roads and whatnot, so uh, are you aware if the design for the Biddeford Bridge is in this budget? This budget is for the staff that do the design. It's not actually the design. This is for the people who do the design. I'm not sure where they will be at with the planning process or the design process for the Biddeford Bridge. I, I'm, well, not sure. I'm a little confused. So you say it's, it's the budgets for the staff that do the design, but Correct. you're not sure who does the design? I, the no, no, I, I said I'm not sure where the design, where it is in stage. I, I don't oh, know that. Oh, okay, but it would be this staff that would do the work, and just yes. one final yeah. one. Okay, I'll let you next. Yeah, just, so is there a commitment that there be a community meeting uh, okay. once that design is uh, finalized by the department? Because if it is on the agenda for 2025, and I hope I didn't misrepresent that to the uh, municipality, but I think at last, time we went through the budget, it was told by me on this stage that it was for 2025, but uh, so would there be a community meeting established uh, this coming year to make sure everybody's up to understanding what's going to be done and, and what's going to look like? I can certainly take back uh, that uh, request to the department. Thank you, Minister. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, a quick question. Is there a budget for design of the old Princetown Road Bridge? that I've been waiting for for two years in my district. I think I have a voicemail on my phone right now, actually. 
Why don't yeah. check it and then ask? No. no. Uh, yes. I'll check that chair and get back to you. Thank you, Minister. Shall I carry? Carry. Bridge maintenance. Appropriations provided for staffing, materials, travel, and services to maintain small bridges. Administration, 5,200. Materials, supply, and services, 2,114,500. Professional services, 420,000. Salary, 618,800. Travel and training, 9,600. Total bridge maintenance, 3,168,100. We'll start with Charlottetown West Royalty, O'Leary, and Bress, and Board of I mean, I... We're way overspent this year. I, I know. I know why, but it, I just don't understand the budget estimate for 24-25. If we're that overspent on materials, supplies, and services, how do we only we, we overspent by over, you know, almost 22.6 million dollars? But the increase is only 200,000 for next year, Minister. How, how, how does this happen? This budget—it's not realistic. <laughs> Oh, just uh, I think uh, to attempt to answer that, to the, you know, hopefully it will satisfy the honourable member. But you look at uh, bridge maintenance section, and you look at the inspection process that takes place there. So what you have is uh, large bridge structures. They are inspected every two years. Smaller culvert type installations are inspected every six year period. So based on those inspections, you're going to see, uh, to a certain extent, especially uh, with regard to the smaller sections, yep. which would be under here, if yep. correct me if I'm wrong, yes, okay. but you're going to see a certain ebb and flow as far as what the materials required on a year-to-year -year basis will be. Charlottetown West Royalty. So you said the larger bridges are expected are inspected every six years. So every did, two years. Two years. So is that are we just in one of those ebb and flow cycles, or are we like mm -hmm. how, how these numbers? The larger bridges would fall under capital. Okay. Well, th thank you, Member. I, I understand you're concerned about all the bridges in your district, um, but uh, um, <laughs> that, let's get to the point and get these questions out. So Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, I did. I mean, there there was. You know, it, the the point is, member, is that the, the I'm looking at this budget as a whole budget, and we've talked about this in various sections. That I'm looking at the budget estimate versus 23, 24, and 24, 25, and trying to figure out what's going to happen. We're 85 million dollar in deficit, and why is that happening? And we're seeing it all throughout the budget. So that's my point there. And I I do have one bridge in my district. Thanks. O'Leary and Burness. Larry and Burnett. Pay attention. Was it you? All right, Board and Concora. <laughs> City. It took years. <laughs> Board and Concora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think you might have answered this, Minister, or, or alluded to it. I guess my first question is what the section refers to small bridges. You also, in your answer earlier, in, in re reference large bridges. What constitutes a small bridge? Um, the old Princetown Road is a good example of a small bridge. Yeah. <laughs> So a small bridge is a structure that um, there are, this section is responsible for repairs and maintenance of structures that are greater than four feet or 1.2 meter span or diameter. So just the last part of it? They're greater than a four foot span or 1.2 meters. Members, you can keep okay. it down please. Board and Concord. I was overhearing some of the conversation across the floor that just distracted me from from, <laughs> from the answer. <laughs> Uh, so, thank you for that. There was some, there, there was a report I think a few years ago that said that the, the bridges in the province were in a, in a poor state of repair. Has there been an, an updated report further to that to speak to, you know, it might help direct the, the, the budgeting for the section? Um, as the minister has just has, had said that we do do a bridge inspections every two years on large structures, six years on small structures and rotational. Um, I would have to go back to the department and see if there is a, a, a public bridge inspection report. Um, I think okay. that's what you're referring yes. to. Yeah. And if so, we will bring it back. Thank you. O'Leary and Burness. Uh, yeah, Minister. I want to comment. This section would be where you have a lot of uh, independent contractors that have a contract with government to provide uh, the upgrades. In, uh, so when does that contract expire? 
my understanding is that you've renewed it recently, which is a good thing. I I don't have the expiration date with me. I'm sorry. Oh. Or Larry Inverness. Uh, anyway, I, I guess I want to put in a plug that you know there, I've seen a lot of the projects that they do, and they do great work, and I think they're very needed. From my just in my assessment in my own district, there's an incredible need. We have a lot of these small box culverts, uh, small tiny bridges that uh, need to be maintained, and. Uh, uh, so I think there's incredible need in that. So I do get a little concerned when I see that material supplies are an underspend versus what you spent last year because we're just a, a big storm away from more problems again. Yeah. But but uh, uh, is tap drains part of this this section too? Because the the tap drains are the where the water goes after it goes through the bridge uh, sometimes to divert it away from the, the roads. And I would say that there's an incredible problem there that a lot of the government tap drains. I'm not talking. Private. I'm talking government tap drains that need to be opened up and cut open, and it might also uh, work with the forestry fire issues and stuff like that too. But is is that under this budget, and do you see a, or is that under maintenance? No, it would not be under this section. Larry um, Inverness. So I'll I'll add into this then. Just there was there's one particular bridge, and it, you, I know you're not going to know the answer. You can get back to me with it, but it's the Gaines Creek Bridge. I'll say it looks okay by me, but the person who lives beside it tends to always say that there's a problem there. Uh, and I've told him, I said, as far as I know, it's an inspector. But if you could provide me an update, because I'll be bumping into that individual at some point. Uh, so a Gaines Creek Bridge. I'm uh, happy to. We'll get that information yeah, in November. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chair. Shall Kerry? Kerry. Materials Testing Lab appropriations provided for salaries and related support costs for the Materials Testing Lab and quality assurance for maintenance and construction operations. Administration 12,400, equipment 23,800, material supply and services 9,700, professional services 5,000, salaries 1,537,600, travel and training 23,400, total materials testing lab 1,611,900. Shall it carry? Total capital projects division 12,774,100. Shall it carry? Service PEI appropriations provided for staff to deliver quality service experience and ensure Islanders have easy, consistent access to government information programs and services both in person, access PEI sites, or through contactless teleservice, contact PEI. Administration 118,900, debt 8,400, equipment 25,200, material supply and services 89,900, professional services 282,900, salaries 4,718,400, travel and training 70,100, total service PEI 5,313,800. Sal Carey? Yes, Board and Concora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a uh, short view. Uh, when will the Cornwall access PEI be up and running? Be later this year. Sal Carey? No, I nope. still. I Board and Concora? I'll, I'll keep my. <laughs> Are, are, th are there plans for other new locations? I think, uh, you know, that is something uh, that was discussed in previous sections and uh, with regard to uh, um, contracts and the like, as far as a review of government space, what is going to be required, and to uh, what space is going to be required going forward, and certainly service uh, PEI, access PEI sites. Uh, yes. Board of Concord. We'll take a look at that. Thank you. Uh, does the section here review the services that are being offered uh, regularly, and are there plans for new services to be delivered through the access PEI locations? Or are we moving more online for the delivery of the services? I would have to, and I'll ask uh, Wendy to uh, to jump in here as well. But uh, overall, and very briefly, yes, there has been at the access PEI sites themselves, uh, there have been an increase in the services that have been provided. Uh, for example, the birth certificates, things along that line. Not just to, to name one. Uh, uh, services that are provided online through contact PEI, certainly. There's been an expansion there, and I think you look back at uh, Fiona and the great work that right across government, across my department, and uh, at Access PEI, 
how they work together as far as coordinating responses. Board Gagora. So, so thank you for that. My last question on it just ties those two together. Is I hear from people who may not have the skills or the access to the online, and they're worried about a uh, deterioration of the available services at the access PEI. So I guess my question is, is it the intention to at least maintain or grow the services so we're not sort of moving everything online for those who may not have that capability? Excellent uh, question, observation, and uh, yes, uh, as long as I'm in this chair, I will not. Because I think, uh, you know, part and parcel of that is rural areas too and the access to sites uh, coupled with uh, the concern that you brought forward, members. So we have to maintain those and uh, uh, enhance them where possible. Thank you. Shall I carry? Thank you. Sure. Total service PEI, 5313800 Shall I carry? Sure. All right. Infrastructure policy and planning. Appropriations provided for delivery of various Canada, Prince Edward Island infrastructure programs as well as departmental policy and planning. Administration, 102600 Equipment, 23000 Material supply and services, 15700 Professional services, 605000 Salaries, 1367000 Travel and training, 42700 Grants, 110522200 Total infrastructure policy and planning, 112678200 Board Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, again, starting maybe with the salaries line, if you could take me through the, the fact that we underspent rather considerably, uh, and is that because there was just a challenge in getting positions filled? Uh, we had vacancies during the year. We had somebody uh, resign and, or accept, I shouldn't say resign, accept a position within, outside of this division. Uh, we did have a retirement in this division and subsequent delay in backfilling it. The position has now been backfilled. Um, so, Borden Kinkora. So, so does, does that account for the Roughly uh, so 400,000. And we do have a couple vacancies in this position. I'm sorry, I didn't quite finish that. Board okay. Kinkora. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to turn to the, the grants section there. It looks like the grants were rather significantly overspent. Uh, is, uh, okay. is there things that were, not com uh, that were completed that weren't planned? Um, the, if I compare last year's budget to the actual forecast, we're actually underspent. Last year's budget? Budget to our last year's, to the forecast. Okay. The budget is 131 million and the forecast was 100, so we're 31 million underspent. Uh, what page in the big book are you seeing that? Or? Which big book? No, you don't have the big book. No. <laughs> That's it. I'm trying to keep up along with it. Oh, page 166? Yeah, no, I'm looking at the, the bigger oh, okay. bigger handout to see that. I just can't locate it. Just while you look that up, I have a, have a quick question. Thank you. Um, are there um, plans to have uh, purchase more gravel this year to uh, help um, upgrade our, our clay roads? That uh, would have been under a previous section. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's plans under infrastructure policy and planning, whether it's it's uh, with the the feds because yeah. uh, to get more gravel, we need more gravel. Um, the funding for gravel would not be sure. part of a federal provincial okay. agreement. Okay, thank you, Warren Kikari. Are you ready? Uh, as, as I'll ever be, I guess, Mr. Chair, on it. Um, look, looking at the, the, it looks like school, electric school buses. Um, are there two lines showing there? Uh, can you, and which? I, I, again, I'm, I'm having trouble finding where I got these from. All right, member. Um, I'll give you a little more time. Yeah. But uh, we've had a lot of time to prepare. For our budget questions, so. Okay, I'll, I'll jump then. We'll, we'll 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 skip that. I guess I'm still on the on the on the school bus issue. Um, we we did purchase six diesel buses to replace to the existing fleet. 
Um, are, I guess I'm wondering, is, am I in the right section that why we, the analysis for purchasing diesel versus electric and why, why those diesel would have been purchased as opposed to electric? Um, per, perhaps I can help clarify this section here is uh, oversees the federal provincial infrastructure grants funding grants this is for grants to external or other groups um, applicant uh, people apply or groups apply to this for funding this is not a, an analysis on whether we need an electric or a school or diesel this is if somebody applies for funding for instance, uh, a water, not a watershed group, but um, the O'Leary Community Room applied for funding under this, or they received funding under this for the O'Leary Community Room. They received $109,000 in the current year um, through the ICIP, or Investing in Infrastructure Canada Plan. So I, I don't know if that helps clarify. A bit. So, yes. Call the hour. Yeah. The hour. Carey? Eric. Total infrastructure policy and planning, 112 million six hundred seventy-eight thousand two hundred. Oh, yeah. Shall it carry? It was extended. Shall it uh, carry? We didn't agree to it. Oh, you don't agree to it? No. Oh, you didn't say anything. Sorry, remember? All right. Mr. Chair, I move that the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Sal Carey? Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole house having under consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the committee be adopted. Shall carry. Here. The uh, Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the member for Rustico Emerald, the following motion that pursuant to Rule 4.4, the hours of the House be extended for the following days for the purpose of business under the routine of orders of the day, government as follows. Friday, April 19th, beginning at 2 p.m., and the business of the day concluding at 11.59 p.m. Shall carry? Carry. The Deputy Premier. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the first order of the day be now read. Shall carry? Carry. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself in the committee of the whole House to further consider the grant of supply of His Majesty. Shall carry. Our right, members will ask the member for Rustico Emerald to chair committee of the whole. to consider the grant of supply to His Majesty. Yeah, okay, I'll carry that one. Okay. All right. Welcome back, Minister. Good to be back. <laughs> would you like to, uh, would you like to bring a, a stranger onto the floor? Certainly would. All right, is the uh, House okay with that, the committee? Yes, correct. All right, good. Welcome back, stranger. Thank you. Um, so, uh, would you like to make any opening statements? Just to, you know, oh, yeah, can you say your name and position for the record, please? Sure. Wendy McDonald, Director of Finance for the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Wendy. All right, we'll continue then at uh, page 166. We're on the total infrastructure policy and planning line. 112,678,200 shall it carry. Page 166, total infrastructure policy and planning. Okay, yeah, we'll, we're, we're asking questions on that. If you have a question, member, yes, we'll yeah. entertain questions. Charlottetown, what's your Yeah, so on, under this section, the $5,525,000 for the city of Charlottetown 
the MCEG shall attend first, second, and third quarter claims for 22-23. The MCEG uh, fiscal year 22-23 fourth quarter claim payments. The MCEG uh, fiscal year 23-24 first quarter claim payments. The MCEG 23-24 second quarter claim payments. Could you give me a detailed answer on that? Uh, sure. The MCEG program is a 10% of is 10% on a municipal's capital expenditure. Um, it's on a claim by claim basis. They usually submit on a quarterly basis. Um, they are they are allowed to uh, be paid out that uh, based on their claims. I think it is. I think they have 12 months after the year end. Um, to be able to claim on that. So that is, that payment that you see there is the total of all those quarters made up. All right, um, Charlotte Town West Royalty. Okay, so then, then they, so they resubmit and then they get the finance back from the province. How much of that is provincial versus federal? The municipal capital expenditure grant is 100% provincial dollars provided back to the municipality. And all the municipal capital expenditure grant program works the same way? Yes. Child care? Oh, no. Nope. Sorry, Charlotte Town West Royalty? Um, the, the, the Tremploy ICIP CCR 2021 60 Tremploy Skill Development Center, $1.102 million. Can you give me a breakdown of that line? Uh, the ICIP program or Investing in Canada program is an application based program. Um, these would have been a, they are federal provincially funded. Uh, the dollar amount that you see there, 1.1 million, would be both federal and provincial totals uh, for that year and for the fiscal year 23 24 up until January 31st. So if they've submitted claims since the end of January, they're not included in this number. Um, this would have been a project that they have applied for, the Tremploy Skills Development Center. So that's only a portion, a nine month or 10 month portion of the project. Child Town West Royalty? Yeah, and that's great. That's in my area. Everybody's super happy about it and it's, it's fantastic. Um, so this is the provincial portion. The federal portion was much higher, I do believe, correct? This is the provincial and federal portion. Okay. Child Town West Royalty? Um, in here, when you take something like infrastructure policy and planning, um, was there, would there be anything in here um, about our contribution towards uh, the medical school building on, on campus or um, the joint initiation with the federal government on that project? There is um, part of the UPI Medical School is funded through the ICIP program. Um, they had submitted an application, were approved uh, to the end of January 31st, 2024. No claims have been submitted. That's why you're not seeing them on your listing. Um, I think, does that answer your question? Well, how much wealthy? But we see, so the, the city of Charlottetown ones, you saw them in different quarters because they were done. So this money has gone out. We just, there hasn't been any submitted because the project isn't complete, correct? It's up to the applicant to submit their, pro, their, their claims to us. So they can submit on a quarterly basis or biannual basis. Um, yeah. It, it depends on when the applicant submits. Yeah. Shout out to West Royalty. And would that be in the, the contract itself, that particular project? When are they submitting, do you know? Uh, I believe we have since received claims since the end of January. So oh. between February and March, I believe we have submitted oh. claims. But to the end of January, they've not submitted anything. Can you table those claims that they submitted? Is that possible? I don't know if I can physically table the claims because of the, some of the confidential information in them. Figured, I'll figured I'd try anyway. <laughs> but, um, um, so when we're looking at this, same thing, um, the, the Simmons Sports Center Arena, the replacement, um, is, was that what was submitted, the $7 million, seven, one, 
seven million, just over seven million dollars claimed. What was the um, estimate and is and versus the claim number that came into the province? Uh, the numbers I have with me are just what they've submitted to the end of January. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So. Shall I have much royalty? Can I have those, yeah, numbers? Pardon me? Was, it, was that the number of the seven million? Seven million is for the Simmons Arena to the end of January. Mm -hmm. So from April to January. Um, and that is, again, federal, provincial. It's the total of both. Royalty. There's, I'm just, uh, how much was, basically, how much was a project overrun? Um, we don't have that number, I guess. I, I don't have that yeah. number. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Charles, how much royalty? Um, so, m mentioned before about the, the, the school buses um, in here, but under municipalities, not for profit, profit, for profit indigenous groups under that section, Charlottetown City, it looks like we purchased uh, six used diesel buses to replace existing fleet. Was that for public transit or was that for, uh, that was for public transit, I would assume? That would be my first question. That would be the city of Charlottetown's public transit. That would be my assumption on that. Charlotte County, West Royalty. Um, and, 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 and remember, uh, the, the table has said here, the strange of that, uh, these are all external entities that have applied for money. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't expect that she'll have complete details of what every single one of these no. lines. So, yeah. Charlotte, how much royalty? Oh, and there's a lot of lines we have to go through, <laughs> Mr. Chair. So, um, no, and I was just wondering. Time now? Yeah, we have all kinds of time. Um, thanks. Yeah, so that that's half a million dollars. I'm just wondering, was there any was there any point in looking at diesel buses versus electric buses on this line why were they i that would be a city of charlottetown decision they this is the project they've applied for and we're approved for shall okay no no oh sorry charlottetown west royalty i don't know sorry i didn't have my my hand up chair i do apologize so i should be keeping it up yes, there sure. should because it's just better that way um department of education lifelong learning as mentioned uh electric school buses and electric school buses on two different lines about uh, over six million dollars um i it was it was loud in here during that time but i know my colleague uh asked about those questions could you just give me a quick breakdown of of those again why are they in two different lines okay so they are two different funding uh, applications. If you look at the descriptions, one for fiscal year 22-23, so, and the other one is for 23-24. So there were two different, that's the applications when they, they were approved and processed. Um, the dollar amount that you see out, see there, is the federal, or the, the grant portion that went for the purchase of these buses. Okay. So that was all federal money in there? That's federal money there. Wow. Charles, how much royalty? That's great. We got, uh, we because oftentimes we hear about the provincial government getting school buses, but I didn't realize they were all paid for by the federal government. So that's that's the case in, in this in this case and others. So okay. that's great. You have a question, member? Um, yeah. So are are those two different lines? Obviously, two different years. Was that were, were those the same? Was that the same company? Uh, I would have to bring that back. I don't. I, I'm not. I don't have that information with me, I'm sorry. Charlotte Town West Royalty? I know this is looking back at the past, but for 24-25, how do I, would that be in the capital budget, how many school buses we're getting? That would be under the Department of Education's okay. capital budget. Okay. Charlotte Carey? Carey. Right. Total trans, uh, infrastructure policy and planning, 112 million six hundred seventy-eight thousand two hundred. Charlotte Carey. Total Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, 240,750,200. Shall it carry? All right. Where are we going next with this? Okay. Thank you, Minister. Wendy. Thank you. All right, we're going to page. Uh, 170 now, uh, Department of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. So, of course, we'll have the minister come to the floor here. Uh, welcome, Minister. Thank you. 
Um, would you like a stranger on the floor? Yes, please. All right. Um, oh, is it all right with everybody? Shall I carry? Uh, welcome, stranger. Can you state your name and position for the record? Uh, Jed McEwen, Director of Finance. Thank you. All right. We're, did you uh, have anything you wanted to say right off the top, Minister? No. Start with general administration. Corporate management, appropriations provided for operation of the Office of Minister and Deputy Minister, policy records, management and staff development, administration 20,900, equipment 4,500, material supply and services 13,100, professional services 53,500, salaries 802,000, <coughs> travel and training 38,500, grants 400,000, total corporate management 1,332,500. Shall it carry? Questions? Gordon oh. Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Um, question on the grants line, maybe start there. Um, so going, you know, working right to left, we've got 400, 200, 400. I guess my first question is why, why did we not spend all of the money last year on the grants? This is a, it's a new uh, commitment here for portable health benefits. Uh, we're still doing some preliminary research into this. Uh, recently, the, the federal government has uh, potentially come into play here, so we're kind of awaiting that decision as well. But uh, our next step would be to uh, contact an external consultant. What would that accomplish? I'm just not familiar, sorry. What would the external consultant be tasked with doing? Uh, basically how, how the program would roll out. Uh, so this would be providing health and dental medication medical insurance for workers who may not be employed full-time. Is, is that what the entire grant allotment is for? Right now, this would have some external consulting in there as well, but... Okay. So, so the issue is tied somehow or in, in, in intrinsically with the, um, the federal dental plan? Right, we're kind of awaiting that. Uh, UConn also rolled out something recently, so we're going to see how their program... Uh, has rolled out. Okay. Sorry, Cora. Yep. Sorry, sir. I'll try and be quicker. Uh, so the section also speaks to records management, and I'm wondering what what would be the the records that are being maintained by this section. I mean, it could be it's a very broad. Uh, this would be just our regular uh, deputy minister minister's records on there. We have a. I don't believe there's staff in here. That would be funded through PSC, I think, maybe, the records clerk. Warren Kinkora. So I guess, I, I guess I'm still not sure on, on, on are, they, are they employee? This is Workforce Advanced Learning and Popular. Would it be employee records? Yeah. It would be the RIM program, but we don't house the employee. The, we have an employee, but they're not in our budget. Yeah. So, so remember, that this is the records management for the whole department. Right sits in this section, I believe, is what they're saying. So does that include the employees, all of the records of all the employees of the department? It would, yeah. So Yes, for all the department. It would look after all of the, all of our records for workforce of answering their population. So all of the employees records of the Department of, Advan of Workforce Advanced Learning Population. Yeah. Member, can you, can you what, is, what do you mean by employee records? Well, that's what I'm asking. Like files, employee files? No. Pro program files, um, it would be HR files, yeah, and anything records related. So there is a, a RIM coordinator in each division, or in each department now. So, so member, uh, I believe it's under uh, education in early years, they manage the uh, RIM program, and they can give you a full explanation on what's what's involved with RIM and, and what records are managed, if, you, if you'd like. It's a little bit outside of this department. They are required to, to manage their records as per the policy set in Department of Education in early years. Uh, but we're on the Department of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. Yeah, so they have a, an employee that manages records in that department as per the policies defined in education in early years. Okay. So, so if I was an employee of the Department of Education in early years, would my employee file be maintained by this section? No, sorry, member. Um, I, I think you, 
Okay. Records information management within government is, a, is an important function that every department is required to carry out. And each department has resources to do that within the department. Make sure that information that comes in is tracked, is stored, is archived properly. And uh, I believe that's what they're, they're saying. This, this budget is the budget for this department that's been doing that work. And if, I, I would suggest that if you want uh, a, a broader explanation of RIM and what it is, uh, that would be a great session to have scheduled outside of the, the budget debate. But uh, um, I, understand, I understand you're trying to, to learn how this all works together, too. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate I, that. I'm getting there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you have another question, Board? Uh, do you have somebody else on the list? I don't. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Charlotte. No, that's royalty. <laughs> I didn't see you over there. So. You're hiding over in the, <laughs> the corner here. Charlotte, how much Thank you very much. Um, the um, j just going through the, the the salaries looks like you underspent on salaries in corporate management. Uh, what was that underspent for? Jennifer? There there is two vacancies there. They were uh, project officers. They actually did end up uh, still with government, just in different departments now. But we are in the process of permanently filling them. Charlotte, how much royalty? So what were the projects that are, don't have officers? It's just, it's for the corporate management itself. Uh, one would be kind of working on with that portable health benefits. Portable health. Kind of thing, so yeah. Child time, what's royalty? Portable health benefits. Would that be under the records management? We just talked about that, it's under grants. Child time, what's royalty? <laughs> so grants are, were underspent. Just give me a second here, because I'm going to find. All right, I'll come back to you. Remember, no. Board and So, so in the course of of, of your records management, do, do you keep track of the employees' sick notes? <laughs> That's more of a HR question. From I can't answer that. Board and Concordia. Am I on the right track, Mr. Chair, as far as records uh, management goes? If, if the file to file materials of employees. Ah, uh, gee, I. I, mean, I can ask the minister. I, I, I honestly, I don't minister. Do you know? <laughs> we have an intervention. So anything that comes in, so as an employee of the government. So for example, if you're working in uh, a department like. If I, when I was working in communications, I kept track of everything that I worked on that came in um, that was particular to um, the role I was I was in position for, and and so that things get kept um, for reference. Forget, forgive me if it's not exactly the, the way I'm supposed to go here, but um, this is how I, I knew it. So they um, stored it correctly. It was in a good uh, spot. It's like at, at different workplaces, we've kept um, student files for seven years, for example, at Holland College. So there was a coordinator that oversaw that to ensure that we had that information in place and it was supported. The RIM coordinator, I think that's what the position is titled in our department, it has that role. So anything that... Um, things that I have uh, that I've worked on on my um, as an employee, I make sure that it, the RAM coordinator takes it, it doesn't get discarded, they store it accordingly. So it not, doesn't necessarily mean solely your employee records. It's the work you do are called records when you work for government. It's Department of Records. It's connected to that department. And, and how long are those records maintained? Again, remember, this, this is all... Uh, this is all RIM, these are all RIM management questions. Um, it's, it's really not within the, the budget here. It's, it's about, uh, these, these are like key program policy questions that I would suggest, maybe you can get a briefing from the Minister of Education early years staff on that if, you, if you're really interested. And I would imagine, you know, employee absences, if there's emails that are related to them, they probably are tracked through, through uh, records management. But uh, I'll come back to you, member. Charlotte Town West Royalty, yeah, I was you ready? Talk. Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Um, I was just talking about grants, and I was looking through the book for the grants, but I, well, I couldn't find them because I can't see them in, in, the, in the book. Yeah, they're, they're not here, so that's why I was having trouble, Chair, finding the grants in the book because I, I don't think they're here. Are they here? To date, like, as mentioned, uh, I think previously as well in other departments, this, this book is, a, is as of January 31st. So there was nothing paid to date then. There has since been some bills paid on that. So Town West Royalty. So there has been from so from 
February into March, that two month period, which is in my mind, and it, that's kind of the, the, the spend period at times when you haven't spent $400,000 worth of grants. Um, what was spent in that two month period and how much was spent towards the end of March in that period? Uh, we had us a comment over from uh, IRAC, so some of the salary dollars were spent in there. Uh, I believe it was around 15000 20000 So that's how much royalty? So I got 15000 It's It's um, said last year you spent 200000 It's budgeted for 400000 under grants. Why are we offering comments? Why are we putting them under the grant line? Well, it was mentioned to the other Ottawa member from Board and Concora. Um, the budget is in there for the program. We're kind of waiting on the federal government since they recently announced something in late February. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of a hold up there now. Charlotte, how much royalty? So what was the $185,000 outside of that that was spent till January 31st spent on? Again, we were hoping uh, to hire an external consultant. Um, we are putting that off until the federal government uh, has more out on their program. Charlotte, how much royalty? So, was there a zero spend under this line? No, I just said there's 15, 15, 20,000. So, Charlotte, how much royalty? So, we're budgeting four hundred thousand dollars for next year. Well, that will this, why are we budgeting four hundred thousand dollars? Remember that uh, question was already answered. It uh, was. It's for an external. Our next process is for an external consultant. How much royalty? For $385,000? Possibly the rollout of uh, some programs as well in there. And then those were the programs you already talked about previously, yeah. right? Okay, Child Carey? No. Oh, sorry, Child, how much royalty? I'll go to Board of Concord. Board of Concord? So does, does the department have a strategic plan? Three, five years? We don't have one, but uh, each division kind of rolls out their own. Like, uh, for instance, the population settlement had the population framework. Uh, labor industrial relations is more leg legislation based. Um, so we do more work plan stuff on that. Board and Concord? So, how do you determine um, when setting budgetary uh, numbers what, what to prioritize? Um, is it section by section? Is there no overarching policy goals to be achieved uh, if there is no strategic plan? I can help with a little bit of that. So um, when I became minister for this department, we were um, we do have a mandate letter um, that would outline goals, um, outline programs uh, that we want to help and um, for islanders and areas that we need to grow and work uh, with. So that would be some of. Um, what helps guide support where our focus goes. We also work with stakeholders and our partners from each division um, to help, uh, you know, bridge those gaps of areas that they need support. So, um, like any of our um, diversity groups that want to have access to funding, we know that's an area of need. So we we ensure that we work together to have funding supports in place. Um, additionally, Board of Concord. So you, you mentioned, Minister, like working across d d divisions. Do you, you know, does this department also work across d departments to determine needs and for, of the workforce broadly throughout, throughout government? Uh, yes, so we would work with, you know, education, we work with health, we work with transportation and identify areas that we can work together on to help uh, support, especially when advanced learning, um, for example, is an area that falls in my department. Board Concord. So, so I guess as as recently was debated on the floor, we had my bill on sick notes, mm -hmm. um, which covers everybody in the department, all the employees, everything, everybody in government, right? Well, potentially, um, and looking at the description um, of a section up ahead, which I'll, I might have some questions on as well, um, in in determining strategic priorities and balancing the needs of the Department of Health with the Minister of Health, uh, I'm sure there must be collaboration as far as how to, how to uh, you know, enhance some efficiencies within the department. You know, is, is, is the sick note issue on the radar at all with your department? So, so remember, I think your question is, because policy is covered here, is the sick note policy, is there a budget here to discuss the sick note policy is basically what you're Thanks, asking. Yeah. So, 
We would have uh, worked through an Employment Standards Act comprehensive review. Um, that took two years uh, with uh, hundreds of uh, stakeholders, employers, workers across Prince Edward Island, including government, on recommendations that turned out to be 110. Currently, uh, the um, recommendations are sitting in labor, which is not this budget, but is another one, um, and the staff are working through that. Uh, within that, that the conversation around paid sick days and and, paid, and the, the medical certificates or sick notes um, came back with two recommendations uh, from the consultations. Okay. Thank you. And, and is, it, is it the intention of the department to allocate funding uh, to get all of those recommendations? There, there were two, as, as you noted, Minister, with respect to the medical certificates. Is there, is there money available to, to advance that, uh, perhaps in conjunction with other departments? I don't, it's not, it wouldn't be in this section. Um, okay. so. so you're saying it's in the labor section, is I that would, right, Minister? Yeah, we need to look at the labor okay, section. Thank you. Uh, I'll come back to you. Member Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah. Um, so, Minister, in, in this section under, you mentioned your mandate letter. Um, in your mandate letter, is there enough funding in here to uh, grow the workforce by 90,000 jobs by 2026? In corporate management, in this section? Yeah, will you? Um, I, I think the member's saying because this is where you determine policy for the department. Wondering if you have enough budget allocated to come up with a policy that's going to allow you to grow the population, what you said, by 90,000 by, how, well, what date? 2026. In that, the that's more of a skills PEI fraction, uh, question, but there is 89,000 people in the working workforce currently, which is the highest since 1976. So in the mandate letter, you only have to improve the workforce by 1,000 people? That's not. I think that we'll continue to work uh, to ensure that we have a healthy workforce to help the guy thrive. <laughs> well, that's just it. Yeah. And, and remember, I, I think it's safe to say that they want to achieve their mandate, and so the budget provided in here is what they're comfortable with spending to achieve yeah. that mandate. Charlottetown, West Well, yeah, and it's just a matter of do you have enough employees in your, in your section to, to do that, and uh, obviously you do. Um, in your... In, in, in your mandate letter, too, it says working with UPI Student Union to continue to fund open source education resources to reduce the cost of education for post secondary students. Um, is that being done now? We currently do that. Yeah. Shout out to how much is work. there any new updates in this budget about that? It'll be in a different section. Yeah. yeah. That is, there's a post secondary and continuation section. Shout out to how much royalty? Was the, um, was the consultation or the, the grant stuff about the, the creation of a portable health benefit program? Yes. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Thank you, Member Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, in this section, um, under corporate management, there's uh, legal fees for $9,008. Uh, what were those for? Uh, just regular legal fees, HR matters. Child Carey? No. Oh, so, Charlottetown West Royalty? HR matters. Why are were those external? Legal? I think that's kind of confidential. Child Carey. Sorry. Oh, Charlotte Town West Royalty. So it's it's in the budget though. The McGinnis can put the details of it. Oh well, the you're not the person, but law, the law firm was. Oh, sorry, McGinnis Cooper. Okay, perfect question. Uh, Charlotte Town West Royalty. Um, under here, uh, the variance of forecast was forty-three thousand eight hundred ninety-three dollars. Uh, does that incorporate the grant section in, in here too? The variance from the forecast for professional services. Yeah. No. No. Child and West Royalty. What was the variance from the forecast from last year's budget? Why is it forty-three thousand eight hundred and ninety-three dollars? Uh, again, this is up till January thirty-first. Since then, we did do a, a twenty-five thousand dollars provided to the Department of Justice for their drinking and driving initiative. Um, and there's just a few other legal fees that I don't have the detail on uh, since then. Child and West Royalty. So, there, your department, Workforce Advanced Learning and Population, gave $25,000 to the Department of Justice for drinking and driving? It, it's an initiative across government. Yeah. Child Town West Royalty? I don't understand the initiative, but, but it's coming from your department and going to them. What was that money allocated for? 
I don't have those details, but I can bring that back. Yeah, and, and member, I mean, I, I think you've had offers from other, uh, from government as a whole, to meet with them to dig into the details of the drinking and driving programs and policies. I suggest you accept those invitations. I South Down West Royalty. I, I just want. Under variance of forecast, that's all it says here. And now we find out twenty-five thousand dollars is going from the Department of Advanced Learning to over to Justice. That 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 exactly. really doesn't. And I, we don't know what the program's for. We don't know why why that money's going for. Did the Minister of Finance approve it? She's the one looking at. She's the one who has all the money for this. But now it's coming from Advanced Learning to Justice. Yeah. Minister of Finance yeah. isn't involved, and I want to know what that twenty-five thousand dollars for because it's in this budget and it's under variance of forecast, and that makes no sense, Chair. So uh, I take, think you, yeah, I can take it back, but I, I think it was just an initiative across government. Uh, multiple departments had contributed to this uh, initiative for the Department of Justice, but I don't want to speak for the Department of Justice. So that, that's a, that was under the Department of Justice, where they're carrying out the program. They asked for money from the Department of Workforce, and they provided it to them. Again, I, I would suggest you take take up the offer well, this from the Minister make of Finance sense, so to learn all about these no programs. No sense, Chair. This makes so. Did all? Did, were Minister, were you? Do you know around, because you're at the, the table, did all departments give $25,000 to the Minister of Justice for this? I know what happens in this department. Okay. Uh, when we do programs related to workforce, advanced our population, and when we support other areas, I know what we're doing. Um, we can certainly find out the details and bring it back. Charlotte Thomas Royalty? I just want to, I want to know, like, initially, on you have to be ready for when you come to the floor about a $25,000 Variance of forecast. I'm going to stop you here. The uh, chair or the stranger said he will bring back information on that, and so you need to move on with your line of questioning. Charlotte, how much was that? Was twenty five thousand dollars that we're talking about, um, which we don't know. Which is which he's going to bring it back for you. That's which is fine. Very he's going to bring it back. And, yeah, and I'm yeah. not done my answer my question, but that leaves a lot more money in a variance of the budget. What was the rest of the money for in the variance to this budget? As mentioned, I, th I think there was a few legal fees that had since come in. I don't have those details around. Um, again, when we do this variance, it it is a an expected what we're going to pay. So it's. It's not 100% that we're going to spend the full 53000 but that's what we're expected at that time. Okay. Charles, how much royalty? So do the variants come in now, or I know that the budget, and, and, you, and you were here before, Jab, about we didn't get it didn't get it passed until June. Was some of the variances to do with that passing of that budget, like other departments, or was it just between... Uh, it was just for February and, and March. So this is based on our third quarter, the variance. So at the third quarter, we expected to spend the full amount. Um, we're probably going to come in about $15,000 short to actuals. Okay. Great. Saving money. Shall it carry? Carry. Total general administration, 1332500 Shall it carry? Carry. Population and settlement, appropriations provided for research, recruitment, settlement, and retention, administration, 13500 Equipment, 4500 Material supply and services, 40500 Professional services, 67500 Salaries, 598100 Travel and training, 21500 <coughs> Grants, 3569400 Total population and settlement, 4315000 Shall carry. Oh, Board and Concora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a question on the uh, professional services line. Um, HR Atlantic and Evelyn Renee Bradley, could you explain what those spends were on? Uh, HR was for uh, orientation session for Skills PEI, um, or keynote speaker. Evelyn Bradley, that's a development and delivery of uh, workshops for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Board and Concord. Thank you for that. Uh, oh, sorry. Board yeah. and Next on the, on my list would be on the grant section and why there was an underspend on that line. Again, uh, it's it's a to a point in time. Uh, we we have to have these handouts done till January thirty first. We uh, can say to date, uh, last I checked, well we did spend two point nine million dollars. So there there is a lot of funding goes out in the first quarter of uh, the calendar year. And members, just a reminder, we are on page 170. We're at the total population and settlement line. And these are budget estimates. Board and All right. So I understand um, that 
from the previous uh, stranger on the floor explained to me that the timing can sometimes create some challenges in aligning exactly the numbers just because of uh, what we know and when we know it and when these things have to be produced. So I do, I do understand that uh, um, to some extent. Uh, I guess again back to the grants and looking at you know what's what's contemplated for the uh, for the coming year on the grant spend. They'd be very similar. Again, we uh, we put in this new uh, Getty program last year, as well as the newcomer work ready program. So a lot of the grants would be be fairly similar to uh, prior year. Before one more, and I'll come back to you. Board Kikora. So just to clarify, you said newcomer. Yeah. So there's a, a newcomer work ready program, which uh, aims to ensure newcomers to PEI are able to find employment. So so immigration is now captured under this section. No, no, it's not. No. Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, um, so do we have enough staff in the department to proclaim acts under this section if there was an act that came in under this section? Uh, I haven't heard differently from the director himself, so I yeah. yes. Charlottetown West Royalty. Minister, why did it take, why is it taking two years to proclaim the foreign temporary workers legislation then? Policy and it doesn't, it's under labor, it doesn't fall under this section. So, I remember that's not in this section. Uh, that's a that's a labor. Uh, I would say that was a policy decision as opposed to a budget decision. To Charlotte, not much royalty. So, it's under the next section, labor and industry. Yes, okay, perfect. And I, I don't know, I was just wanted to know why it wasn't chair because it's been. Two years, so I didn't know if they had enough staff, but I'll Sounds ask. Sounds like that. they have enough budget, but they're making a decision on whether or not they do it. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. All right, Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you very much. So, the population framework, um, why was that so delayed, Minister? Did we not have enough staff? There, there was staff that were work, working on that. It was extensive work, it was across all of government. We're try and we were trying to use the tool and effectively build the framework to support future planning. Um, and so it, it took time for everyone to be able to work to get all that information collaborated together. Charlotte Town West Royalty. It was a promise by government to not do a framework. It was it was an action plan. It was what we were going to do. And we, we didn't find out until a standing committee uh, that it was going to be a framework. When was that decision made and switched? Um, and why was it changed? Is this a that's question? not a budget question. Okay. Um, w that's why I asked if there was enough staff there. Was it that the action plan was too expensive, then we had to just go for a framework? So the question is, was there enough budget to produce the framework? And the answer was yes. There was lots yes. of people worked on it. I'll come back to the member. Board of King oh. I just want to go back to the grant section again. Uh, and I might, um, and I, I don't know, I don't think I heard the answer, but I'm sorry if, if you did. Uh, we have the, all of the grants on the uh, WALP-5 page of the big book for 2023-2024, but there's, there's nothing for the 2024-2025 budget. Like there's, this is the first time I've seen this in the course of the review of the budget estimates where, where there's, there's a zero indication of where the... Three point five six nine million dollars is going. I guess. So they're very they're very hard to determine. So a lot of it is claim based, um, so we don't know who's going to come in and apply for some of these grants. So we do it just as a as a total. We provide who who got the grants this year. Next year we will provide the same. So you'll know this time next year who received grants for twenty four twenty five. Board Concord. So when when is the deadline for these groups to make their applications in order to know we're, we're already, well, we're April 19th now? Yeah, some, some of it is operational grants, which would be similar, but it, uh, um, the other is, like I said, the Getty program, which I believe the deadline is in the fall, and we determine in late fall of uh, the successful applicants. Board McCoy. So how is it that all of the other departments that we've gone through so far can put, you know, fill in these blanks. I can't speak for other departments. Board so, so how is it that your department can't? I, I just mentioned these are, a lot of these are claim-based. We don't know who's going to apply. 
So okay. Black Culture Society, for instance, we don't know if they're going to apply again next year for a, a Getty program. Um, they are. We do operational fund them. So we just we just don't know who's going to apply every year. Mayor, I'll come back to you, uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. So the, the the explain the difference between operational funding and why the Black Cultural Society is in here, for example, for two lines, and where's their operational funding come from? So those actually two lines in there are, neither of them are operational funding as we didn't put that out until February. Um, one is a, the event to, for Emancipation Day, the 7800. And the 18,000 is the Black Policy Conference. How much royalty? Yeah, two amazing things. And you know what, I want to actually just give you a compliment for coming on board and supporting that quickly, Minister, because, I mean, wound up today. But they, your department did come forward, and that was, again, that was one of those conferences that was historic. And people in marginalized communities don't know the process for applying for things. And I want to just give a compliment to your staff because that conference had to go, and it had to go quickly, and the money was there for them. And Emancipation Day, it pro they probably should know. Once that got legislated, I, I think that we need to have a, a budget line for that outside of grants because it's it's legislated. Mm -hmm. So can you just talk about that for a second, Minister? I think I can talk. Um, <coughs> just respect to these and, and some of the history of that, these, these are like a second year of doing, um, working with these wonderful groups through our Getty program. Uh, I think it's, as the, the member from Michelle Tamastraldi said, it is really important that we have opportunity um, to have funds available for those to have these important uh, events, and we are, are committed to ensure we are able to do that. Uh, I, I, again, I think they're so important, and, and the amount of diversity within these grants that have happened is a great, uh, great uh, investment for PEI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's take the Emancipation Day, August 1st every year. It got legislated in this um, assembly by all of us. Very, very important to the community. Can it not be removed from grants and put somewhere else with more of a consistent budget line? Um, do they have to apply for this every year? Uh, it just adds to the, 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 the event's going to happen every year. Why do they have to apply for it? I certainly can go back and talk with staff on how that how that works, uh, and certainly bring that back. Yeah, thanks very much for that. And I mean, these are two lines that I'm, I'm very excited about. The operation fund we have to talk about, what section is that in? It, it is here, we just, there was none paid out as of that point, I believe. I don't understand. So like, I don't, I don't see what their operational fund, we're, we're approving a budget. The budget spends next year but we don't have it in here for last year or next year. I don't understand. No, there was a 98,000 paid after January 31st. And member, maybe uh, part of your question would be, is there multi-year operational funding approved for the Black Culture Society? Oh, that's a good question. I could ask uh, that. For some of these, there are. For the Black Culture Society, I think we're just on a one-year agreement. Okay, so there's not one-year commitments right now, remember? That should help focus you oh, that's going to help a lot. And I appreciate the minister not letting me blow a question on that. Why didn't they get multi-year operational funding? He just said they're considering it already. No, that's not the right answer. That's what he said. Okay. Well, I, was, I was in a meeting with your staff, and that was definitely being considered afterwards. What happened that they didn't get multi-year funding this year, Minister? So I think you and I had met since then, yeah. and we talked about, you know, where they had been at, and they have um, a, a healthy board and, and, and a great advocate um, in their executive director. So as we continue to work through that, um, we'll certainly uh, reassess uh, for future. And uh, they felt quite comfortable with that as well in that, in that decision. And um, so we'll continue to work together. They're a great partner for us to have. They're an amazing partner. Were the situation they had to go through an audit, they had to do whatever. Minister, there was a frivolous complaint about this. It was completely frivolous. It was completely whatever. Would you agree with that? Was that complaint that was brought forward frivolous? It's not a budget, budget question. question. Yes, it is because, yeah. No, 
Yes, yeah, Charlottetown West Road. Because that because it affected their funding. It affected their their funding. Um, it affected their multi-year funding, which the chair just mentioned. And I I'm just trying to figure out why and. That, that happens all the time with NGOs. It happens all the time with different things. So was that, was the complaint or anything brought forward frivolous? It, it, um, Minister? I don't think that, that, like, any complaints that we get or any um, information that we receive from groups or any challenges that they're going through, I think that we um, certainly take uh, account and, and look into. I think that's a responsibility. I think to discount them or uh, not pay attention to that it puts us kind of in uh, an even harder position that, that we're not being accountable. Um, I, I think at the time when, when it happened, when stuff like that was happening, it was some of it was before my time, so I was coming into to late notice of that. Uh, and by that time, things were starting to, to turn in a much healthier direction. Um, and I think that you would say as well that uh, the executive director that's there feels that sh that it's a much more supportive environment, and that we'll continue to work on that relationship. And we certainly are committed to doing that. I'm going to come back to your members. Sure. Uh, Lauren Concor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Member from Charlottetown West Royalty a moment ago, a, minute, a few minutes ago, brought up the population um, strategy. Um, there's just a couple of questions on on that, which I don't believe have been have been asked yet. But is is there any is there any you know we've had some discussion in the house, some debate in the house with respect to to the the strategy. Is there any money allocated in the budget to sort of augment that, sort of you know beef it up, move forward from it? It, it would be part of our uh, professional services fees right now and be included in there. Do we have a, a, a number that would be attributed to that? Uh, nothing specific at this moment. Okay. So to implement the action items from that, is there funds all contained within the budget or is there funds from across different departments? Across government. Yeah. So it's a they're allocated across government. You said. Okay. Okay. So so who who's ultimately is responsible for ensuring that the recommendations are implemented? I I, I guess that would be this department. Um, phase one is complete. They are assessing what the a larger commitment would would look like. Warren Kincar. Uh, could could you expand a little bit on that? Like what? Phase one's complete. Um, what a larger commitment would look like, or does that mean planning for like 20, 20 beyond 2024, 20, 25? So, so, member, can can you relate this to the budget? Like, um, are are you saying you don't think there's enough budget to implement the recommendations, or what, what? What's your what's your question? Well, I mean that that's part of it. It's it's the planning process. Like, I, I heard it's across the department, uh, across. Various departments. Um, I heard it's the responsibility of this department to ensure that to ensure that the recommendations are implemented. <coughs> and my question is, sort of carrying off the answer I got from from the, the, the stranger on the floor, do we have enough allocated in this department to see that the recommendations are in fact achieved? If it if the buck does stop with this department to ensure success of the framework. Yes, we believe there is enough budget in here. Uh, like we as mentioned, discussions are ongoing across the government. And and is there consideration given to to future year beyond the 2024-25, given the population growth that we're seeing? That's that's part of those discussions for sure. Okay. Uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Chair. Um, in your mandate letter, it says provide a four-year core funding agreement for the Black Cultural Society of PEI and BIPOC Usher to renew their strategic plans and to ensure they can contribute to address structures and systemic racism in PEI. What, uh, does BIPOC Usher have a four-year funding agreement as per your mandate letter? Thank you. I don't have that information, member. I can take that back. Charlottetown West Royalty. So, under the under your how much 
it says $123,810 under the grant portion of this. What is that number for, on, for BIPOC Usher? That's operational funding. <coughs> Charlotte Town West Royalty. Would that, would, was that a four-year agreement? I don't have yes. that information. So remember, he, he said he is going to bring that back for you, the answer to your question. I think the minister just found out it, it, is, yes. it is part of a four-year agreement. That's a, Charlotte Town West Royalty. So the $123,000 is all they get for four years? No, no. They would get funding every year. Every year. Yeah. For, so, But they do have a four-year contract? They do. Good. Yes. Charlotte Town West Royalty. How long is, how long is Black Culture Society's agreement? It was. It's a one year currently. Charlotte Town West Royalty. So then I have to. I can come back to you, member. No. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I noticed that there's in under positions there's a gender equity and diversity advisor. Um, is does the department underdo undertake a. a a gender-based analysis over the budgeting process? Or what, I guess I'm wondering that question and what that position would do in the department. I don't have the specifics of her details, but I can look into it and take that back for you. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, Charlotte Town West Royalty. So like I was saying before, the BIPOC usher has a four-year agreement at 123. Is there is is there workings for that to look at that every year for cost adjustments to uh, cost of living and stuff? How do those work? They would be reevaluated as so. If there were additional uh, needs, we would reevaluate what their need looked like. Yeah, yeah. Charlotte and West Royalty. And I guess I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm just upset because Black Cultural Society has been around doing good work. I've been there, I've been watching this, and I can't imagine what they've been through for, not, it's not your fault, but I just don't think that, I think the province should be, I'm telling you, and I'm telling you people, they have done incredible work and they continue to do. So whatever's come in, it's been something completely frivolous. We look at that all the time, but when it comes to people who are marginalized, we have to look beyond that. Give them a four-year contract. Make sure that you can take the stress off them and show them support. And I mean, I'm sure the minister will do that. Um, but I've been around with this for for a long time, and it's been it's it's I don't know. It's not it's not easy for them. So I know how passionate you are, um, I member. I do, and you and I have met on this, and we'll continue to meet always. Any time that you want to discuss, I work uh, closely with them as well. We'll we'll keep. Uh, ensuring that staff are, are reaching out to to work with them and to, so that they can continue to grow and that their ED feels supported. That is really important and I, I certainly think that she um, is feeling that way um, more so than in the past and that is essential and I, I know that that is a big passion of yours. Please know that we are going to work know. on this. We are. Yeah. And I I want to well, thank your staff working. for coming in. And basically, what I want to say is, like, I'm, I've never seen anybody, a leader like, like her. I've never seen anybody who is a, the leader of the board right now. They are doing amazing things, and it's hard for them every single day. And I want them to realize that it's take a little bit of stress off their shoulders that I'm going to be here for them, and so are you, Minister, and I appreciate that. Um, Charlotte Town West Royalty. Thank you very much. So, um, Looking at this, uh, when you look at just under here, it says just UPEI, and there's a grant for six thousand two hundred dollars under that grant program. What was that for? If it hasn't already been asked, that was part of the uh, Getty program. Okay. Shall I carry? Um, j just a sec. Um, so, Charlotte Town West Royalty. The population framework is out now. It, it was out. W what happens to those? Uh, what happens to those employees that worked on that? that population plan because it's it's out it's released what what, what has happened or do we still have the whole entire team intact yes yeah, so they're they're part of our staff um that are very dedicated to continuing that much needed work to help provide forecasts and supports and working across government yeah. to ensure that we continue to move in the right direction okay. so, the town west royalty the numbers that came out attached to that population plan can you confirm that the numbers the same day this came out that the premier uh, re reduced numbers on immigration. 
uh, that came in, that those were those numbers were not attached to the population framework, correct? It's it's not a budget question, but I am going to have a bit of this conversation. So, um, immigration falls within my department, as does the population framework. We worked collaboratively together to look at how we, as this department, can somewhat address some of the the gaps that we're experiencing in our in our most exhausted sectors. I would say, like health housing, um, and we've talked endless about the education needs here. The only way, supports that we were able to help provide with that is, you know, we're trying to amp up to get our framework, but also we need to be able to slow a little bit down. That is the only option that we, that we really could do from our department to help. Um, other than also infusing, and this is further on, into our education programs to help those that want to study in the areas that we desperately need. And so we're trying to collaborate, work together to commit to that. We need to make those changes. We need to continue to help EI thrive. You, you and I both are extremely passionate about living here and watching our families grow here and ensuring that they do. In order to do that, some really hard um, decisions. We're talking about people. When we talk about all these things, we're talking about people. And they are very hard decisions that we make. Um, so I can appreciate the questions and the passion around that. I absolutely can. Charlotte, I appreciate it. We had a good conversation the other day, and it's important to, to, to have it again because what I find in the province, it's not only your government, our government, we've been coming in to allow people to come here to, to get something, to a two or three year period, and then they're gone. And I'm tired of it. <laughs> I'm tired of it. You know, other, we, 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 we want people to live and stay here, and, and that's the thing. So if we reduce our numbers, we have to work harder at retention. And retention's under this section too, as well, um, because I've lost a lot of good friends that have moved away, and 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 people that are amazing leaders in Prince Edward Island. We have to do a better job. Other, we're, we're we keep people coming in for two years, or we slow it down and bring people here for longer. And I think that's where we are. So, can you just talk to me about what we're going to do as a retention strategy? Because this section is population settlement what we're doing right now to improve our retention of people that do get to stay here and that have, have successfully completed the PR process. Absolutely. So I, I'm gonna, can I entertain this, Chair? Is that okay? Oh, absolutely. Really yes. So yeah. what I would say is the continued investment in programs and in um, NGO groups and, and support groups and our newcomers, uh, Ursa, and to work with those that come here to help supply areas for them to find a place here. Some of this isn't in this section of the budget. Sure. The other avenues around that is I think it's really important to remember that we need to continue to, to help support and invest in upskilling and reskilling and, and getting um, our workers uh, allowing them to continue to grow. I think the, gener the generation of workforce we're in right now, not generation age-wise, but generation of workforce, everywhere that I look, and, and I would be an example of this, is about opportunity. So they move around to where the opportunity is. We want the opportunity to be here. Yeah. So we're trying, you know, we continue to communicate with them to find out what is their driver and what is the opportunity. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's not. Yeah. It's community, it's services, exactly. it's programs, it's supports, it's, it's all kinds of uh, amenities and yeah. infrastructure. Those are all things that build that community. Yeah. So I think across government-wise, and everybody in this room, when we're, when we're hearing from our constituents, what do we need or what, how do we help build this to keep them, mm -hmm. that's where these, these programs come from. Mm -hmm. That's what re good retention looks like, is to ensure that they feel wholesome, that they feel like they can thrive here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Charlotte Thomas Royalty. And I'm glad to hear you say that. I'll just pick up on Ursa. They do such a great job. They're, they're there. Um, they, they, they work very hard. They're under a lot of pressure, too. Are we funding Ursa enough? I know the federal government funds them quite extensively. What's the provincial role and is, is funding in under here for, for them to do their incredible work? Is there a grant or? It's operational funding. It is in the uh, handouts you have, so they do have operational funding there of 335. What was last year? I don't have that information with me, sorry. Charlotte, West Royalty? Yeah, no, just maybe we can get that back. What, what was it last year, or the year before this year, and then just, just so I can see um, what, what pattern we're doing as a province if we're, put, if we're putting our money where our mouth is to make sure we're supporting them. So I, I, uh, I appreciate that. All right, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned there, and I appreciate the questions from Charlotte Town West Royalty, um, that the URSA number there, 335,000, was an operational grant. 
Um, and then when we are told, ask questions about some of the other specifics, they're not operational grants, they're for specific events. So my questions here are more general about, I see the figure that we have for this year's budget is very, very specific, 3,569,400. And yet we we're told that this is going to be based on the applications that come in. So I'm wondering where that figure comes from. Is it a percentage increase over last year? It works out to about 3.5% over last year, or is it, where does that come from? The ERSA funding itself? No, the, sorry, Chair, the, the 3,569 is a very specific figure, and yet you're saying that's going to be dependent on the number of applications that come in. I just, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to understand the process by which we're being asked to approve that number without understanding what it is going to be used for. Yeah, so some of it is uh, federal programs, as mentioned, like the newcomer uh, work ready program. Other is operational funding. Um, others is the Getty program. That's where we don't really know if it's how much is going to come in. We do have 500,000 set aside for that. Um, going forward, I, I will commit. I can probably try to separate out the operational funding better for you guys in the handout. So, uh, Thank you, Heather. You have your hockey point? Uh, yeah, I would really appreciate that, Jeb. It just it allows us to, to understand where we're making an approval for a budget expenditure. Sure. Um, I want to ask specifically about, and it's the smallest, almost the smallest one here. There are two that are under 2,000. It's the Under the Spire Music Festival. Now, I, uh, just a bit of background on this. Um, festivals, music festivals are being cut at a federal level quite substantially. And I know there are concerns from a number of organizations, and Under the Spire would be one of them. Um, the, the grants that they rely on federally are not going to be where they were in previous years. So could you tell me firstly what that 1500 is for and secondly if they were to make an application to you for let's say 5000, it is one of the lowest grants here on the page, is that something that you would entertain given that they're losing funding federally? I don't want to speak for the director itself but I think that's something that we entertain. Uh, that funding itself is 25% uh, remaining for the Getty program. So the Getty program, we fund 75% up front. It comes in as a claim, and then we release the remaining 25%. Okay. Even Rocky Point? No, I, I've, I think I've, I, okay. I've asked all I need to. Thank you for your, for your commitment to make a change for next year. Thank Michelle you. Carey? Carey. Total population and settlement, 4,315,000. Shall Carey? Labor and industrial relations. Appropriations provided for industrial relations services to employers, unions, and individuals. The Labor Relations Board, the Employment Standards Board, the Office of the Worker Advisor, the Office of the Employer Advisor, and the Workers' Compensation Appeals Tri Tribunal. Administration, 43,900. Equipment, 17,000. Material supply and services, 27,200. Professional services, 262,000. Salaries, 1,111,900. Travel and training, 31,600. Grants, 2,500. Total labor and industrial relations, 1,496,100. Gordon Kikora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Office of the Worker Advisor and the Office of the Employer Advisor, were they consulted uh, with respect to the recent bill uh, on medical certificates? I don't know that, but I can take that back for you. Thank you. I'd appreciate if you, if, if you could. Thank you. Uh, with respect to the underspend on professional services in the last fiscal, could you explain that, please? Sorry, I was just making some notes here. Yeah, sure, um, sure. I should have let you finish your, your note taking there. Uh, <coughs> budgeted 232 and uh, spent 150 on the professional services line. Yeah, it's just it's less hearings in the year, um, so I do have some stats on that. So, in 2022, there were 27 total hearings for WCAT, LRB, and ESB, and in 2023, there was only 17. So they can fluctuate year to year. What do you think, Are those boards fully staffed? Uh, right now, we are. Right now, we are missing a workers' advisor lawyer in the workers' advisor committee. Warren uh, 
On the Employment Standards Act side of it, when will that new draft of the Act be coming to the floor? Is it close to being ready? Yes. So currently the staff are working through the 110 recommendations. Um, so with that number of recommendations, they will be drafting a new Employment Standards Act. It will go to public consultation um, late summer, early, early fall. Um, it goes out to public for, for feedback. Um, and then um, once we gather all the feedback, um, it'll then come to the fall legislature. Uh, Charlotte Thomas Royalty? Uh, yeah, so uh, under this section, uh, uh, I noticed that there's uh, a reduction, a little bit of uh, underspend in salaries. Um, can you just talk about that? Yeah, I just, I just kind of mentioned that. It's a, we are vac have a worker's advisor, lawyer vacant. Charlotte Thomas Royalty? Um, how many people would be working in this section for the foreign temporary worker legislation to get it enacted? We do have uh, one temporary foreign worker staff hired uh, this year, I believe. So, Thomas Royalty? So, one staff was hired this year? Yes. So, Thomas Royalty? What did we do before that staff was hired? We have one staff to work on a piece of legislation this big? Minister, what? It, it was probably spread out amongst the very staff in this division. Charlotte Town West Royalty. Um, so did, did that staff work on the surveys? Uh, there were surveys that were supposed to be attached to that. Are the surveys done? I don't. I can take that back. Charlotte Town West Royalty. We don't even know if the surveys were done. I thought, I'm, I'm waiting for them to come back. <laughs> Remember, do you have a question? Yeah. When that, when did that staff member get hired? I don't have that information either. I can take that back. Board of Concord. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just going back to the, the, uh, the, the worker advisor and the employer advisor, do we keep stats on how many employees are assisted by the worker advisor and how many employers are assisted by the employer advisor. And again, Mr. Chair, that would feed into the budgeting process. No, that, that's fair. Are, are you talking about hearings or? Uh, uh, no, I, mean, I, I assume there must be more to their roles than, than, than hearings. Are, are they they're only engaged in the course of a hearing, are they those individuals? Uh, I'm not pervy as to actually what uh, each employee, uh, their job descriptions, but I, I can definitely take some back for you. Okay, if you, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Um, um, and moving on to, to WCAT, um, do we know how many files were open, open and closed last year? Uh, I do know there was nine hearings uh, in 2023. Do we know if that's staying consistent, the trending on that? There was, there was 12 in 2022. Okay. So it's down Board three. Okay. Okay. Um, um, what about the Employment Standards Board? Uh, there's obviously, there's stats kept with respect to um, inquiries. Is there, is there, what, what do we keep with that? Uh, there was four meetings last year, or in 2022, sorry. There was five in 2023. Most of them related to uh, minimum wage. But most of what? The minimum wage and applications for uh, exemptions to standard work week. Okay, okay. Charlotte Thomas Royalty? Mr. In your mandate letter, which we were talking about, which you brought up, it says establish the necessary regulations to proclaim the Temporary Foreign Workers Protection Act and add a temporary foreign worker protection officer position to ensure temporary foreign workers are treated with respect and fairness. Have you added that position? I, I think we have. I think it's a, as a temporary position right now. It's not a permanent, but I, I can double check that for you, member. Um, yeah. I do have a, a, one little note on that, that oh. it was a temporary, so I will I'll double questions. check that with you. Chair, can I add uh, something? Minister? Also, I just want to add, so just for clarity, temporary foreign workers are in and I want them to know this, and, and we need to do a better job to let them know this, that they're entitled to the same rights as anyone working on PEI. Also, they need to know, because I think this came up, um, and it's really important for everyone that's working to know, is that the process that are connected to them are confidential. 
So when things come forward, they need to come forward or we won't know. I don't know if something's happening if we're not told um, or we can't hear. So it, the most important message from that is that they have the exact same rights as anyone that's working. This is really important work that, that is coming. I have been back to the department. We've, uh, when it was here in question period, I think uh, you and I had uh, debated a bit on that, but, um, and I went back, we need to get this done right away. The department knows the urgency. They want to make sure it's done right. Um, and I know you hear that and think that that takes too long in time, but this is really important. It, it is about protecting people. Charlotte Town West Royalty. But we don't even know what position we hired for. <laughs> we don't even know. I, 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 it's, it's, it's in your mandate letter. So that was over a year ago for you to get that done. I know that, that you're talking about their different rights, but we don't know what it's like to be a foreign temporary where you get recruited to come to another place and in, in places that if you poke your head up at different times, it's very difficult. So it's a different world, and I know that they have rights and stuff. I'm just asking about stuff in the budget. Yeah. So. So, um, so, remember, I mean, she just spoke directly to yeah. your, your statement there. Do you have a question? Yes. Yeah, so, do we have the person, because in your mandate letter it says establish the necessary regulations to proclaim the temporary foreign workers act. Do we have that employee that can help us get to there? Because you said that act was going to be proclaimed this year. I believe that position was filled a couple months ago. Believe this. Well, I, I have a don't, do I have a note there. It's probably not in the salary sheets because I don't I can't yeah. recall if it was a temporary position or full time. But and, and, and member of the stranger already said he is going to bring back information yeah. for you on this topic. Gordon Concord. Oh, good job. So I guess just continuing on with the temporary foreign worker theme, um, is there money allocated in the act to 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 ensure that the provisions and rights made available under the act are, are respected There's additional st additional staff um, member that was very similar to the question I was just asked I can answer some of this but uh, the minister does have a response there is a, a full-time temporary form work position uh, that is filled permanently currently also there is staff that are supporting um, those workers that that need the support there is support within that department to help and that, that really, that provides a bit of an answer to both sets of questions here. Warren Kinkora? Okay. Uh, I, I can come back to you. No, no, Charlie? no, I, I have no. it. I, I, I do have it. I was just clearing, clearing my throat. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do have it. All right, go ahead. <laughs> the, so, so as far as the inspections, the inspectors that are going to be, be present to do, are they, you know, is it, is it looking at the housing conditions? Because I know, is, that is, is there... So are you have an answer? Yeah, so the, the, that person doesn't, I don't know if, I'm trying to word this correctly. If there's a, if there's a concern around um, living conditions, it, it doesn't fall here, but I have worked with other departments to have some of those conversations. So if, if we do, or somebody notifies me that they have a concern, I do reach out to colleagues. I do think it's important to uh, immediately get help. I do want people to come and work here, uh, and while they're here, um, that they have good living conditions, but it, some of that falls within the department. We do let them know right away. Again, the, the concerns that come in from temporary for workers, that's where it would start, and then the reach out would happen from there. Okay. Warren Kinkora. Okay, uh, and this is a broad question. I'm gonna do two parts, like specific to the temporary foreign workers and its concerns education to make, you know, to, to make the workers aware of their rights under the legislation. So education with respect to the TFWs, but also education with respect to workers' rights generally. Is there money in the budget to support education campaigns so that workers, whether they be TFWs or island workers, know what their rights are under the legislation? That may be applicable to those particular workers. Yeah, I mean, we, we increase our uh, professional services budget this year as well, so... We, we definitely have money in the budget. Gordon Kinkara. So I, I hear it's, it's, it's increased, but is it allocated or earmarked yeah. for education? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, Child Care. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to watch Royal. Well, is, it, was, is the education specific to what the member was just talking about? Is what? Definitely, how much? Yeah, and remember, we, we just heard the minister give a long diatribe about how important it is that temporary ferry foreign workers understand their rights and know what's going on. So 
I, I think you can infer from that as well, but Charlottetown West Road. No, it's not up to the worker. Don't put this on the worker. To It's up to us to let them know when we come to PEI that they are supported. It's not up to the worker, I Minister. I want you to retract to that statement because we're putting it back on the worker the same question and it's not on the worker. Again. I didn't ask the same question. All right. It is not on the Roy, worker. Do you have a question, member? Child yeah. Carey. No. Carey. No. Do you have a question, Member? Yes. Minister, you said this was coming in a phased in approach. Can you talk about the phases you were talking about? So uh, it, that's connected to licensing around recruiters and employers, yeah. and those processes are, are working their way into place um, so that recruiters would register. Um, it helps manage and, and ensure that good quality uh, recruitment is happening. Um, employers will be this will be the same formula um, to help with our temporary foreign workers. Shall Carey? Carey. Total Labor and Industrial Relations. Shall it Carey? Workforce Development Skills PEI appropriations provided for administration delivery programs targeted at improving the Prince Edward Island labor market. Administration 537,000, equipment 24,000, material supply and services 133,500, professional services 162,300, salaries 4,281,900, travel and training 43,000. Grants, Workforce Development Agreement, $1,781,100. Labor Market Development Agreement, $19,220,400. Essential sales training, there may be a small typo in the bill. I'm assuming that's essential skills training, $456,000. Atlantic Workforce Partnership, $186,300. Work PEI, $286,200. Provincial Program, $7,423,200. Total skills PEI, 34,539,900. Warden Kinkora. What is essential skills training? Uh, it's a project in partnership with PEI Literacy Alliance uh, designed to help individuals at all skill levels improve their foundational and transferable skills to better prepare, prepare for, get, and keep a job. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. That sums it up pretty well. Uh, with respect to nurses, um, I, I believe there were discussions with UPEI to explore ways to, to address the nursing shortage. Is there any funding in the budget with respect to addressing that particular item? So we implemented a 100% uh, tuition subsidy for uh, the RN, RCW, and uh, primary care, primary medicine last year. Is, is that continuing on? Yes. Okay. Okay. Any any, any any other labor sectors that are going to receive similar incentives? So I'm, I'm thinking specifically ones that are chronic shortages. Uh, right now, the concentration is on health care. Um, we do fund uh, the carpentry and trade side quite a bit as well. Concord. So, so that, that was what was car carpentry trade? Carpentry and, and other trades, yes. And other trades, yeah. okay, thank you. Okay. Shall I care? I had, oh, I, still, still plugging along here, Mr. Chair. Um, pr provincial projects is increasing um, considerably, I think up to $4 million. Uh, what, what's that going towards? It was 653 and now we're going to $4 million? Uh, I'm not sure where you're looking. The uh, the budget has stayed the same at 7.4 last year, at 7.4 this year. Okay, I'm going to come back to you. O'Leary and Burness. Uh, yeah. Just a little more explanation on the, the essential skills training. Um, I sort of get it sounds like a little bit like Career Bridges, but is that what Career Bridges is funded through? No, it, it is fully funded through the federal government through uh, Employment and Social Development Canada, though. O'Leary and Burness. And w where are those programs offered at? It's, it's, I don't have where they're offered. Uh, I think we just have a partnership with PEI Literacy Alliance. Um, they would probably, the applications would fall through them. It's a, it's a 12 week program of on the job administered. O'Leary and Burnett? Uh, it sounds like a great program, um, but is it, is it offered in West Prince or Prince County? Uh, cause I, to be honest, I'm not aware of it, and I would argue that uh, 
probably the, the more rural areas is where you would need such a program to be at least based out of because most people that have literacy challenges probably traveling distances isn't their strong suit either so yeah I, I don't have the details of where it's funded but I can take that back for you on we can bring that back uh, well, Larry, and the Atlantic Workforce Partnership what exactly is that Uh, that is the um, that's the assist the province in preparing for changing skill requirements and anticipated labor demands. Uh, this past year, PEI was just chair, so. Oh, Larry and Vernes. So it's more of a consulting hub, and, and each province rotates through, right. uh, yeah. giving it direction. What what kind of is accomplished from that? Do they? Uh, we contribute to several projects, uh, the Atlantic Apprenticeship Harmonization Program, Atlantic Immigration Program, um, and assisting provinces in the negotiation of the workforce development agreements and labor market development agreements. Okay. Oh, Larry and Bernas? And just, I just, when I look at the LMDA, and I, like I said, I, I like a lot of the work that Skills PEI is doing, but it seems like you're kind of cutting some of the, there's not too many budget lines that are increased of what you spent last year. Not what, your for, what the estimate was, but what was considered spending. Um, do you feel that there's less need for those types of programs in the coming year? Or? No, uh, this is actually a reduction in the, in the federal funding. So, okay. Larry Inverness. So, well, and the province has no interest or desire to top it up? Uh, we are looking at that internally. Oh. Uh, right now we're able to uh, offset some of the, some of the decline with the timing of when we contract out some. Hmm. Just, just as a final, just to, I would encourage you to consider that. I mean, if you're not contributing, this is all federal money, uh, then, you know, try to see what you can do to help that out. Because my sense of, in my area anyway, seem to have a few more people showing up looking for work than I haven't before and before. And I've mentioned to many employers that I've been in contact with, I said, you know, the, the labor pool might be getting a little, a little more depth to it. Yeah. And, that's good from an employer perspective, but I just think that there's sometimes people have numerous challenges, and sometimes we have to provide a little bit of support to uh, um, get them get them in, ingrained into a workplace, and and uh, then be more productive as time goes on. And that little wage subsidy can sometimes make a big difference. Thanks, Chair. Shall I carry? We're on page 172 now. Apprenticeship appropriations provided for administration of apprenticeship training and certification of tradespersons. Administration 13,100, equipment 4,500, material supply and services 10,000, professional services 50,000, salaries 583,500, travel and training 23,400, grants 145,000, total apprenticeship 829,500. Shall I carry? Oh, Board and Concora. Uh, just a few on this section, please, Mr. Chair. Just um, a few years ago, the department was working towards like a harmonization of exams, common exams within the Atlantic provinces. Has that continued or been concluded? That's specific to the trades. I'm not sure if you're talking about the the system itself, apprenticeship management system. What was uh, apprenticeship management system? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, Mr. Uh, no, no, I guess with respect to the a common exam throughout the Atlantic region, if that rings any bells, to just sort of expedite the uh, accreditation and certification process for trades within the Atlantic region? Unless you're talking about the, the GED. No, I, don't, I think I don't it's Red so. Seal, but I think what we can do is we can certainly look in to bring more details back. Red Seal is, um, so the idea is it's recognized um, across the country, but as a symbol to say that you're a specialized skills person within that trade, um, each province and territory has a certain kind of method on how they administer their Red Seal program. So I haven't heard yet any further detail on harmonization. I certainly can look into it and, and follow back with you. Okay. No. And, and, and I appreciate your questions, Margaret, but I do want to make sure we stay focused on the budget, and, and I also appreciate there's a a lot of information that you want to get from the minister and I I'd highly recommend scheduling meetings outside 
the budget process to find out all this information and dig right into it so that you can hold the government to account. Board and Concord. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Specific to the budget, is there any funding to support um, employment in, in construction, uh, women in the trades? That, that was in skills PEI, so yes, there is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Board and Concord. So would it also be within skills PEI, you know, my, my specific question was like to support the, the, the women in trades and also what about spe specific initiatives that would improve our, our wages and, and to make our construction industry a little more competitive here in PEI wa wage grid related? Yeah, so on the first one on women in trades, I think it's uh, super important to mention that we do work really closely with Trade Horizons. It is a very successful program uh, to translate women into the industry uh, and to continue to support them when they get there um, as, as sometimes they're a less represented gender and so it's really important for that. Um, the second question is we work closely with our industry to talk about wages and, and what are they hearing and what are the supports that we uh, we talk about regularly. So we work closely with Construction Association of PEI but with that we have their board and their board has are all folks that work within the trades, own businesses that have employees that come and they are um, really good to share with us what are some of their pinch points. And I'd like just to interject here as well, and I wanted to congratulate Sally Pino, who's representing PI at the Nationals Skills Canada Carpentry Competition, the first woman to represent PI at the national level. So congratulations to Sally Pino. Very incredible. You may hear more about that in the House as well. All right, uh, O'Leary and Burnett. Okay, we're yeah apprenticeship program. I see we went from 165,000 last year to 145. I would once again say that I would be surprised that there would be fewer people wanting to uh, receive grants for the apprenticeship uh, training. Is there a rationale why you're looking at that? Not only is it uh, what was spent last year, it was what was you, you fully spent what you estimated. Yeah, that, that's actually the uh, apprenticeship management system agreement. So the payments have been. Fully done for 23-24 and 24-25. It's uh, just a regular payment we'll be making to the Council of Atlantic Premiers. O'Leary and Renes. So, so how how does that correlate to the people who deliver the apprenticeship trades program and certifications? Is, you're saying that's just a membership fee? That that is a, a hosting fee. A hosting yeah. fee. Yeah. O'Leary and Renes. Maybe you could explain that. So it's an online apprenticeship system uh, developed by provinces PEI, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Manitoba. It's uh, part of a major initiative to maximize similarities among apprenticeships authorities and modernization apprenticeship management services. Um, we're hoping the benefits will be uh, improved reporting and cost efficiencies through the shared funding. Larry and Burnett. So, so it's not a, a place where somebody gets training, like in other words, somebody's trying to get an electrician's uh, uh, appre apprenticeship or an electrician's license. So this has nothing to do with that. No. So, so where is that under? Is, is that what this apprenticeship is? That that'd be more skills. Uh, the the details are in here for the red seals and the blocks and all that. But uh, the the employees help that out as well. But the the funding for that would be in skills. It, so that was under, say, provincial programs, is it, or is it? Yeah. Okay, well, I, I've erred in that. You've got one by me. Shall, shall carry. I'll, I'll hold you. Total workforce development, 35,369,400. Shall carry. Post-secondary and continuing education. General, appropriations provided for post-secondary coordination, the regulation of private training businesses, and the administration of the division. Administration 23,600, equipment 900, material supplies and services 24,800, professional services 30,000, salaries 930,300, travel and training 7,500, total general 1,070,100, Board Concord. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at UPEI, we've had a, a rough, a little bit of a rough patch um, at, uh, at UPEI that we've come through. Um, is it time to do a review of the University Act and has there been consideration in the budget estimates to, for that purpose? I think um, what I can say to that is they did um, an action plan uh, responding to uh, the Roman Tomlinson report. Um, they have an advisory uh, board that is working actively with, with that with the university um, and so we have been collaborating and working with them very closely on this. 
um, and know how important it is uh, to have that uh, very fair and safe learning and working um, academic campus. Oh, Board and Concord. So you mentioned Minister the Reuben Tomlinson report, um, which which largely criticized the governance and and oversight processes or lack thereof. Um, you you mentioned there's is there something established to provide external oversight now that the department has in place? There is. Yeah, that's in our, our next section there in UPI restricted funding. Board and Concord. So it's in the it's in the, the grants yes. section on that one. Okay. Um, Board and Concord. Just quickly then, <clears throat> on the professional services side, um, is was that the full extent that I'm seeing there? Uh, what's articulated? The thirty thousand, and it's. I guess my big question would be on the GED testing services. What's has there been something changed there? No. So that's that's, that's last year. Yeah, so there's there's GED testing fees, so we would pay uh, for whoever to take upgrade their GED. It's a, I think it amounts to twenty four dollars US. Or do you think Cora? How, how come there's nothing budgeted going forward on the profession? Well, there's thirty thousand budget, but there's nothing itemized. There's no descriptions. Uh, here in the handouts here. Again, it, it would be something similar to the population and settlement, where we just um, unsure on that. I mean, we could put an estimate there. I just want to make sure. Yeah, so we just have a total budget of 30000 for professional services. Board and Okay, no, I, I guess my, my only comment would be in closing on this section would be sort of echo the concern um, as expressed from the member from New Haven, Rocky Point, is, is the legislature is being asked to approve lines. I know it's only $30,000, um, but there's no indication of what the money is going to be spent for. It's based on an anticipated spend or a prediction or a, a guesstimate. And I guess I, I haven't seen that before until we've gotten to this department where we're being asked to approve uh, public expenditure without actually knowing what the money's for. So that's why well, I'm that's Rocky. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just what exactly the appropriation provided for post-secondary coordination? Um, what would that entail? Like, what, what what are we? What is the government's role in that? Are they developing the budget? What? Uh, we we are a funding partner with our post-secondary institutions, so that's it. We we. We regularly have meetings with UPEI, Holland College, College of Lille to uh, determine their needs. So you're the regulator, so that means that there's there's oversight for that money in this section. So they, correct? So yeah, each of our agreements, we have agreements in place that uh, they would have some reporting requirements back to us. Yeah. And remember, there's $109 million that go into our post-secondary institutions, and so I mean, this is just for the oversight of that money within the department, right? Charlotte, how much royalty? Yeah, and there was two positions hired, one a liaison for Holland College and one a liaison for UPI. Is that correct? Can you tell me about those positions in this section? I'm not quite sure. So through us, through post-secondary? I don't know. Um... Sorry, what positions are you, are you referring to? Well, it's, it's funny because I don't really know what they are either, <laughs> Mr. Chair, but I knew that there was a, a government announced a few months ago, several months ago, that they were going to have a coordinator that, that goes from the government to Holland College and the government to UPEI. And I'm asking about those positions. So I believe one, it's, it is in the next section in the grants, but I believe one is through the uh, the member from Borden Concora talked about uh, in the EDI SVR program. Um, the Holland College one, I, I would have to look into that. Charles Thomas Royalty? So that program would be under under this section? No, it's in the grants. It's just Yeah. Which is the next section, member? Yeah. So maybe we will be no, well, I talk about it more there. Yeah. Charles Thomas Royalty. But why wouldn't it be that's why I asked for the appropriation provided to then the coordination of the funds would be in this section, but in the next section, if I if I let if I let this go, 
this is money going to the schools. So what you're saying is the schools provide funding for that officer out of their operating grants? We'll certainly take back the details on that. Charlotte, not much royalty? Well, I don't know if we can take back the details. So I pass this section, which is where they, the funding should be. And I want to know what are their roles as a minister. You're responsible for this. Um, there, there was no funding agreements for a very long time uh, in Prince Edward Island. We've been through this in the Standing Committee. And I want to know uh, what their roles are. Are they, are they, are they in your department? So, so member, your point is well taken. Do you think they should be in this section? No, no. They I, are currently budgeted in the next section, and she's going to bring back information for you. And she may even have that information by the time we get to the next section. So I, 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 I don't think you're, you're, you know, it's untoward to pass this section and move on to the next one. You're going to get your information. I, I, they're they're not well. a direct salary of, of the province or a post-secondary. It's a, it's a valid suggestion. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. It's not the way the budget's structured right now, though. Yeah. Yeah. Charlton West Royalty. Yeah, because then why is the Premier announcing on, on August 8, 2023, he announced the senior management team changes and released the minister's mandate letters, and it's in under the minister, it's in under uh, the Premier of the province's mandate letters. I don't, I don't, I'm just, I'm confused by that, and I just don't, I don't know um, how when this is a coordination. So I guess my question would be, you underspent in this section. Um, you budgeted 915,000, and uh, you only spent 787,000, and you're 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 moving up to normal budget again. Um, were those were those salaries already talked about? No. Well, talk so, about? so that was a our executive director retired, uh, so it was kind of a domino effect. We did have an acting person in there, which somebody was acting in his position, so it was a it was a domino effect. Yeah. Um, there is a vacancy currently as a bilingual policy coordinator. Charlotte Thomas Royalty. Bilingual policy coordinator. Okay, so there's two positions down in that section. Um, and in this section, I guess, if they're coordinating, if they're coordinating things in this section and there was an, an MOA sign potentially. Would that be where I'd ask about this, or do I wait to the to the the university section about the med school? Um, med school is the next section. Med school, so I can ask about it in that section, even though the. Shall carry. Post-secondary grants, appropriations provided for post-secondary educational institutions, student assistance, adult basic education, literacy training, and the community service bursary program. Palage de Lille. Core operating grant, 383000 Student tuition subsidy, 69200 Restricted funding, 661100 Total, $1,113,300. Shall it carry? Okay. Or actually, just, I want to ask the clerk, do I need to, to uh, pass this institution by institution? No, I, I'm going to go through it all, uh, member. And, Holland College, core operating grant, $23,870,800. Student tuition subsidy, $6,155,800. Restricted funding, $7,791,900. Total, Holland College, $37,818,500. University of Prince Edward Island, core operating grant, $43,220,200. Restricted funding, $13,289,900. Total University of Prince Edward Island, 56,510,100. Atlantic Veterinary College, 9,868,300. Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission, 2,389,400. Lifelong Learning Grants, 393,100. ,393, Total post secondary grants, 108,092,700. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I appreciate being able to sort of do this as a whole. That was great. great. Makes, yeah, makes, I, my, my apologies. It makes it a lot easier, uh, I think. Uh, the, the 2023 Auditor General's report noted a lot of challenges and deficiencies with respect to the post-secondary funding agreements. Um, I have some of the text from it here. I'll just pick out there was concerns that there was no formal agreements in place with UPEI or Holland College for the funding provided that the recent funding agreement with UPEI expired March 31, 
2021. No funding agreement with Holland College has been in place for a number of years. Are there updated funding agreements we do for have, these grants? We do have agreements in place. Sorry? We do have agreements in place for all these now. Okay. Can, can those be provided and tabled? I can check back. There might be some confidentiality uh, purposes, but I can certainly check into that and take it back. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, what about with respect to UPEI specifically? Um, the Premier had indicated that there might be more details around the arrangements for UPEI. Do you know if there are funds <coughs> allocated in the budget to support those changes that may be inherent with the UPEI funding agreement? Are you talking about the as a result of the EPI action plan? Yes, please. Yeah, so there's a new uh, item there in restricted grants of 1.5 million. Could you could, could you explain what that might be intended to address? It's a uh, operational cost to support the funding for uh, EDI and the SV Pro as a result of the action plan. Oh, one more member, I'm going to move to some others on the list. Sure. So, so what were the acronyms you wrote, you? Indicated there, e EDI diversity, yeah, equity, diversity, inclusion, and sexual violence prevention. So. Sorry, I'm at a standstill here for the uh, SV Pro. It's sexual violence prevention. Office, but I'm trying to be uh, okay, okay. Okay. Something off of. So just a quick follow-up. So, so the 1.5 million, is that the right number? Yep. Was earmarked to further those two particular initiatives? Correct. Okay. O'Leary and Burnett. Uh, Figure out a little bit. I think it's under lifelong learning grants, but do we have any programs between our institutions like Holland College and, and UPEI, uh, like a career pathways program that takes people, like say, that are LPNs now or they're in that course now, and then they can do some online training and as their hours build up, that they can transfer over to say UPEI and that there's a continuum of uh, lifelong learning? So um, there, I'd have to see what they've updated since. Um, there was a, uh, like an articulation agreement with Holland College that those students that graduate from the licensed um, practical nursing program could come into our, the RN program and get credit for studies already occurred. I'd have to find out the exact math on how, where it's at right now and what, what kind of credit they get for that. At the time, it was a two and a three. And the reason it was two and three is because the clinical components for the registered nursing program is quite long. So they weren't able to get um, like the credit voided for that. Do you know what I mean? So they, have, they need, still need to do the theory part. And that's the two-year part. Okay. And so as far as you're aware, that doesn't exist at the moment. You're trying it, to work. That does exist. I just don't know if it's changed to, I know that's, uh, you know, in the past students would look for two plus two is generally how an articulation was working for a lot of Holland College's programs. Just with the nursing program, the clinical part we were having, um, we were having a hard time trying to ensure that they would still get the clinical part they need, which is really important, and how we could give credit for that. Mm -hmm. well, there See, I'm told that there's other provinces have a, a, an arrangement around that, and it works quite good. There's a lot of online learning that's uh, associated with that, and it seems to uh, have a pretty good way of increasing your amount of nurses, because I would, I would argue that UPI, I think I was told UPI had over 400 people applied to the RN program. So, you know, and some of them would have been LPN. So how do we try to get those people to a, up to a standard where they can administer work? And as an employer, as a major employer, you, you should be able to uh, take advantage of things of that nature. But I'm, I'm told uh, that it doesn't quite exist in that form. But uh, anyway, if you could get me some more information on uh, an RN career pathways with LPNs and RNs, uh, I'd appreciate that. Definitely. Thank you, Chair. Leader of the third party? 
Thank you, Chair. The, you kind of answered part of my question on the, the post-secondary institution sexual violence policy. I was going to ask how much money was earmarked for that. And you had mentioned $1.5 million. Is that specifically for um, campuses and PEI, across PEI? That's for UPEI. Yeah. That's just for UPEI. Yeah. What about the other, the other um, institutions? So there is funding that's been um, allocated also with Holland College for their, their student, um, their new wellness center. And so the components of that that, have, that are being presented at UPI will be part, um, similar at Holland College. They'll have those supports. They're, um, they have a huge campaign on right now as well. And so they're building a facility, like they're redoing a facility that will be front and center, making it accessible for students, making it more um, comfortable to enter. Um, because we can make it as accessible, but if it's not comfortable gender, they won't come. Um, so they're, they're working on that right now. And I do have what the are. Sexual Violence uh, Prevention and Response Office, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you for that. And, and so I'm wondering if there's been any increase from last year, because uh, in the UPEI review it made it very clear that um, the uh, Sexual Violence Prevention Response Office was underfunded. So has that been, is, has that gotten more funding in this budget? It's, it's, it's brand new funding of yeah, the 1.5 million. Oh, okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, uh, so. I can come back to you, member. Oh, I uh, think I'm good. Charlotte Town Watch Royalty. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Um, last year we talked about this and, and uh, there was a motion called and I wrote to you, Minister, um, and I had three specific things based on a motion that was passed in here and it has a little bit to do with this. But in that, and I never got a response back, um, but that's okay. Uh, the, the motion did pass in the legislature about the, the events that was happening. So that was a year ago and now we're just finding out today that, you know, things, things are moving along, but in there, uh, in response to the motion, you stated your expectation was for UPI to develop an action plan with timelines to rebuild the trust with the university community and the public. That was number one. Share weekly updates with yourself and your deputy on the progress being made towards the action plan. Looking back, was that happening on a weekly basis? So our uh, office was meeting with them. I'd have to go back and look exactly what's exact weekly. They do meet bi-weekly still now. Um, and the action plan is on like, UPI's website as well currently, like yeah. they, they released. Um, but we, we stay in close contact yeah. and watch. I, it's not just about the funding we provide. No. Uh, it's about the uh, students and the staff that are working on that campus yeah. um, and taking care of islanders. So we certainly stay close now. And thank you for entertaining that. But I mean, I mean that was, uh, I mean, Let's make sure we always relate it back to the budget. I don't want to get off track, that's all. Yeah. Okay, so the budget, is there budget in here? Um, that was, it was, part of that was a third party be named by government to audit and monitor the progress of the action plan. Was there a third party in place and is it, is it budgeted in this budget to audit, to audit the plan? I'd have to find it, get back to you on the exact of the details of how that's going, but I, I do believe that is the case. So I just I would need to confirm just yeah. the details of that. Okay, perfect. Yeah, great. No, uh, Charlotte, how much? Yeah, it's good because I mean our, our job is to to keep to keep government to account, and um, I know this was uh, this was a situation where you know we're the we're a funding partner, and and I mean. So here we have the equity and diversion, and I want to say uh, congratulations to Dr. Sylvia Alphazad, who got appointed today in that position. She was the she, she was the executive director of BIPOC Usher, and will do an amazing job, amazing person to fill that position. So congratulations to her. Um, uh, but it is it, we're we're in. Uh, it, it took a long time, and the thing is, I wanted to make sure that we're accountable. Are we? What is UPI contributing towards this? If we're putting $1.5 million into this, basically this office, the government taxpayers are putting money into this office. Um, do you know if UPI is contributing any into this office as well? Or are we? I, I don't have that details, but I can yeah. certainly take it back. Yeah. Charlton West Royalty. Well, welcome, welcome, Chair. No, I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to have that because it's that's a, a pretty big office, pretty big undertaking. And it takes them a while to get going, and it's just a matter of are we are we making 
the action items when it took us this long to, to hire the, the vice, I think it's the vice president position, maybe potentially. I think that's what it is. So, um, moving on, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, the Faculty of Medicine in 2023 and 24, the forecast, it's, it's uh, $7.999 million. I remember seeing in the budget last year, I think it was a, a, a line for $4 million. Uh, was that line, that was the forecast spend, but is, and now we're spending $8 million? Is that correct? So the agreement for 24-25 is actually 9.725. You'll see the 5.725. Uh, the $4 million was uh, advanced before March 31st, which was expected. But it didn't read that way for us in the budget. It read we were going to give four four million dollars last year, but now we see that we we gave we contributed eight million, correct? Yeah, which of four million relates to really twenty four twenty five year? We just knew they were they spent three point nine and twenty three twenty four. Um, we knew they were going to spend that, so we ended up uh, advancing it before March thirty first. Charlottetown West Realty, last one of your set. So if that's the case, we've got in here $5.72 million for next year. They've already got an advance on that. No, sorry, sorry to interrupt here. Um, the total agreement for 24-25 is 9.7, but the funding, the remaining funding for 24-25 will be 5.7. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I know government had made announcements for people working in certain fields, um, some tuition announcements. And so I'm just wondering where we would find the costs of those reflected. Um, in, like there's the construction ones, the health care ones. That would have been ones. skills. That would have been skills. Oh, okay. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm wondering, college, college, Collège de Lille recently announced that they were suspending some of their French language um, health care programs. And I'm wondering if there's any funding in here to help in the efforts to, to get those back. Uh, none strictly related to that. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, and what are, what are the restricted funding projects under Collège? Um, sorry, maybe there is some fun. Uh, one is uh, official languages education, and for the five hundred thousand, and the other is uh, official language education complementary for one hundred and sixty. Both of these are, are federal funds as well, so they just it's just a flow through. Okay. Here's third party. Thank you, Chair. And the one thousand one hundred under mental health funding. That seems like an awfully small number. Is yeah, I don't know where that came from. Um, if it's anything like the other post-secondary institutions, uh, I believe we allocate uh, fifty dollars per student. Um, I, I think it's some, probably something similar, but I can take it back to be sure. Okay. You're a third party. Thank last you. one you're okay. set. Um, so I'm wondering. Actually, can you just put me back on the list, Chair? I was kind of. Morgan Kinkora. Thank you, Chair. Um, my my questions are going to be all in the UPEI side of it, if that's of any help. So UPEI recently increased um, tuition by about 5%, if I remember right. Do we know if they reached out for any additional operational funding that might have been able to allow them to, to avoid that increase? Um, we worked with UPEI again in the fall. Um, we're, we're a funding partner. We don't uh, allocate them to, to uh, what their tuition increase would be, but we did provide them with a, an operating increase of 3% uh, this year. Board and King Cora. How, how does that get determined? Uh, like I said, there's, there's some, a lot of back and forth with their department and UPEI and the, and the institutions, and 3% uh, is, is where we finalize it. Board and King Cora. So the, the assumption being that they in any negotiation, you'd come in wanting more, and there was back and forth, give uh, and take. A little bit, yeah, a little give and take, yeah, for sure. That, that's where that's where it landed. Yeah. Board and Kinkara. With respect to the medical 
faculty of medicine, I guess to use the proper term for it, there was there's less than six million coming this year, but last year there was eight million. Uh, I think the member from Charlottetown West Rodley just did he cover all of that yeah. particular yeah. things? I didn't I didn't no. quite hear all of that exchange. Um, so going forward with the school, is there a sense of what the longer term needs are going to be at this stage to, you know, by way of what might be required for, for operational grants to come from government? Or are we just sort of going year year by year? It, it is year by year right now, yeah. Board and King Cora, last one of your set. So with a project of that magnitude, though, is there not a, a plan of some sort beyond year to year that... You would, we, you would we are working very closely with UPEI in regards to this. Um, I, I can say that I think their annualized costs uh, from this year's uh, budget, like based on timing of hires, would be about $10 million on their compensation. I think that was the last one in my set, Mr. Yeah, Chair, but if um, I could be put you back. You do have more, and you want to be back on the list? Well, no, if I could go back on the list. Okay. Charlottetown West Royalty? Yeah, thanks. Um, so... Just getting back to that line, so a $3.9 million advance in 23-24, how does that happen? Do they have to submit um, submit a, uh, a form in? Do you have formal talks? Is there an agreement signed for that money? For what? Sorry, I missed which one. So, so um, we, we, the province of Prince Edward Island advanced the, the uh, Munn School of Medicine or the, the School of Medicine at UPEI. <laughs> We advanced them $3.9 million in 23-24, which I didn't know about. I, I, I'm just finding out about now. Um, how, how do you go about, how did that process happen? There is discussion with the UPEI for sure. Um, there is, like I said, there is agreements in place for all these restricted fundings and well, as well as the operational grants. So there is, there is agreements in place and with reporting requirements. Charlotte and West Royalty? So there is an... MO, is there an MOA signed between UPEI and uh, the government of Prince Edward Island? Yes. Charlie Thomas Royalty. Will you, can you table a minister? I think it was already asked and I'll look into it. I don't know if there's, I mean, we're a funding partner as well. We'd have to yeah. chat with UPEI and yeah. the confidentiality of that. So. Exactly. Charlie Thomas Royalty. So then out of the $9.7 million we're allocating this year, what happens if, if they need an advance too? Is there a formula to, to ask for an advance or do, do they think that's So, so now it would be claim based, so they would come back to us and uh, you know, determine what they have hired and, and what their needs are for, for next quarter. Okay. okay. Charlotte, how much royalty? And this being under restricted funding, um, can you guarantee that some of the concerns, because we're talking about core funding is separate, and I think the minister knows where I'm going to go. Some of the faculty are concerned that as the price of the medical school goes up, it might affect existing services under the core operating grant because the province only has so much money. Um, can you guarantee? <laughs> can you guarantee that this will not the school of medicine will will not affect programming existing programming at the University of Prince Edward Island? It's a question that I'm getting from faculty. Yeah, so so this would be those would be UPI decisions, and they would base programs on demand for yeah. one. Um, but that it would be a UPI decision, uh, which I would presume they would have they would share with us. Um, but that is decisions that they would make in the best interest of their university. Yeah, and and maybe one more. And I'll, I'll okay. Back okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And these are. Uh, a great discussion here. So, um, around that, so the, 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 it doesn't open till 2025, or it opens next year. I could look at it as it opens in the fall next year. It doesn't seem like $10 million will cover enough base because we did give them $8 million this year and it wasn't open. It's opening next year. Um, it, it's, $9.7 million does not seem like enough from the government of Prince Edward Island to the, the med school. Minister, is this number understated? Are we going to come back here next year and the number is going to balloon? I, I, again, I think that's discussions we'll have with UPEI in the fall and their, their expected budget for 25-26. Morning, Kinkora. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, 
so the the spindle report identified some challenges with respect to further to some questioning from Charlottetown West Royalty. Is there okay. is there anything in the budget here to address what, some of those issues if they come up and, and how to navigate through them? So the the money that we've allocated to support UPEI goes into their budget and they work through um, what they need to do for for the, the medical school. Um, the money that we're giving is we're investing in the opportunity for students to study there. Board of Concord. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move on, on from that. Um, staying though with the, the I say the UPEI, UPI Wellness, UPI Wellness Center is getting 1.1 million in restricted funding. Is that for the patient medical home, 10,000 10, patient medical home? That's uh, operational costs to support the, the funding for the Wellness Center. And is that is that what is that the patient medical home wellness center patient medical home? I, I get those confused all the time I think people call different things um, yeah. so I don't think it's a patient medical home uh, in all fairness that is a little bit outside their uh, portfolio but they do all the money's going to the wellness center right no, I mean I don't know if Minister Health could interject but I I mean a patient medical home is probably within the wellness center but or in Concordia well, I don't, I don't want to assume. I don't know if that's something you'd want to take back, just to confirm that that 1.1 is going to to what we have been referring to in this chamber as a medical home. I, th I think it would be good maybe if we just had clar clarity on that, sure. if, if we could. Uh, All right, they'll bring that back for you. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so do we have an idea when that's going to be operational, if that is what we're talking about? So that is a, a part of the the faculty of the medical uh, medical school. It's in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, faculty of Indigenous Knowledge, Education, Research, and Applied Students is getting no funding um, this year. Uh, sorry, no. That uh, was just moved to UPEI's core this fiscal. Okay. So it's contained. It's, with, it's in the core. Oh, uh, okay. That's why it's not jumping out. <coughs> Correct. Uh, members, can we? Uh, it's getting a little uh, loud in here, if we could just speak in whispers. Sorry, thank you. Morgan Kikora. No, it's fine for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Charlotte Town West Royalty. So, just picking up on that from Borden Kikora, if the Faculty of Indigenous Knowledge and Education moved from there to core funding, are they received, was the same amount in core funding? And was there, because the way it looks is that you gave UPEI a certain amount more money in operating costs, but I didn't realize you put the Faculty of Indigenous Affairs and research supplied in that core funding as well. Can you talk about that difference? The increase. So there's a there's a three percent increase as mentioned. Yeah. Uh, the faculty of Indigenous knowledge uh, has moved to core as well as the uh, nursing uh, expansion of nursing programs in, included in core as well. Charlotte, how much royalty? Is that on here? No, because it's in it's in core operating grant. It's new okay. new funding. Okay. What's that? Um, Charlotte, how much royalty? Yeah, no, I appreciate that because I'm just trying to say, like, if, if I'm, I'm glad. I know that you increased the funding. I just wanted to make sure exactly how much. And and just picking up on that line, the this budget was done before we lost, I don't know, we're going to lose between maybe seven and 800 international students. And that's, I don't know, maybe less, maybe more. Nobody knows, uh, potentially. But that will affect a lot of revenue from, from both Holland College and UPEI. Minister, have you talked to the universities about if the core funding from the pr provincial government is enough to cover the difference in those numbers? So we are having conversations with all of our um, publicly funded post-secondary institutions. Yeah. We won't know the full effect until students are here. So from a recruitment perspective, um, all of our uh, public institutions are working really hard and they're being very creative uh, and working closely with students to secure that student. So the method of recruitment has changed internationally is what's, is what's really happened. And we did express to the federal government, um, for lack of a better word, like dis displeasure in how, when it's happening and how it's happening because it was so late in the recruitment cycle. Um, but they are working really hard to secure those students. The numbers that they are getting are numbers that we would have on our, you know, try to have on our campuses. 
but we just don't have the ability to recruit massive amounts to ensure that number gets there. So they're going to work really hard strategically to do that. Once we see what happens, then we will have to have those real conversations. We won't know then until students are here um, what the impacts will be. Yeah. And we'll continue to work with our federal partners, and we continue to now to express you know, what, what needs to happen for PEI. Shall I have how much royalty? And that's good, Mr. And, I'm, and uh, you're the right person for that part of this job because we need a strong minister in there because you will have to go back to the federal government and say that, hey, you know what? There is a deficit here. The, the you, double tuition, you, you, you know, international students pay double tuition and we're going to cut by in the hundreds. Um, so that, that's, that's what's going on. So have you, have you made that aware to the provincial or federal government and are you in a position that if, if the universities need more than their core funding, um, are, are you able to take action in that in this budget? Is there flexibility to assist our post-secondary institutions if they so need? On the first part, I am committed to continue to work with our federal partners yeah. on this. I think that there was um, just not some total clarity of understanding of what the process would look like if they if you haven't really done it. So I was quite aware of the process and how this work rolls out. So yeah. um, that was a very good benefit for, for PEI, I think, to, to be able to have that uh, very wholesome conversation. And the second part is we'll continue to talk with our post-secondary institutions um, and, and work through whatever challenges are, are presented, but we'll continue to work with them. Yeah. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering about, um, does what percentage of revenue does the do student fees make up for Holland College? Is that something you'd have really quick? Okay, I'll just leave it for now then. Um, thank party. you, Chair. Uh, I was what? So there was equipment purchased last year for three point six million dollars, and I'm just wondering. It was under restricted funding. Just wondering if. You could just talk a bit about what that might be for Holland College. Yeah. Oh, so there was three large items there. Um, Two million of it was energy saving retrofits. Um, almost a million dollars was for the health and wellness center, capital equipment, and 250,000 for the Andrews property. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And the Justice Institute, uh, the funding was decreased from 450,000 to 164,000. I'm guessing with everything happening there, it might be put into a different section. No, it was just one of the, so there's two separate grants in there. One was for $286,000, which ended last fiscal. Uh, so the other is the 164, which actually ends this year. Board Kikora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my final couple of questions that I would have would be with respect to the Atlantic Veterinary College. Um, and I note there is a decrease. It's not a huge decrease, but it's still a de decrease, um, 400,000. And my, I guess I'd wonder why that is. First of all, first question would be, why, why, why is there a decrease? Actually, there's an increase. Uh, if you look in budget to budget, uh, in the forecast, uh, we allocated 800000 for some capital upgrades for them. Uh, Morning, Kikora. So, so where, where would I see that? Because all I see here is the... <coughs> Is, is, you know, last year's so if you're looking at the budget book itself, you'll see budget estimate uh, 9.459. Yep. And then the budget estimate for 24-25 is 9.8. Okay, I guess maybe I should approach it from what was actually spent to spend on spent. it. Spent, so yeah, it was it was $800,000 extra for uh, capital advances, uh, 600000 and for the central infrastructure upgrades to the electrical and central ventilation system. And another two hundred thousand for equipment, um, and these were essential for the accreditation. Board of Concordia. Yeah, I guess I guess sort of the, the nub the nub of what I'm driving at here is that you know we've known or we've been hearing for a couple of years about the shortage of veterinarians, especially when it comes to large animals. And um, my concern would be whether we're planning to to try and increase the the graduates by supporting that institution because otherwise you know it's 
So we're not, there, we're, not addressing, we're not addressing that particular problem. So there is a, a new agreement in the works. Uh, the current agreement expired, and the, in that agreement, there is a uh, one new seat being allocated to PEI as well. Okay. Board of Concord. Just, just the, the one one new seat. When, when, when do these agreements normally get negotiated? How? They, it, it's pretty well at the final stages now. Um, so it, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks, it should be all finalized. But all the provinces. Board of Concord. How frequently do these go? Is this an annual? Uh... So the last agreement was a 10-year. Uh, this one, I believe, is a five or six. Okay. Board can correct. So for the next five or six years, depending on the term of that agreement, we're held to one only one new seat for PEI vets. One new, yeah, current new seat. So right now, I believe there's... 40 seats, so every year, so which would be the four years, so 10 per seat. So every year we'd have an additional seat. By the end of four years, we would have 44 seats. Okay, thank you. Charlottetown West Royalty. Does the province of Prince Edward Island have an MOU or an MOA with Memorial School of Medicine? Uh, with Memorial, no, I believe that's with Health PEI. We have one with Dalhousie. Charlottetown West Royalty? But nothing for the the future uh, med school here. There's nothing signed with Memorial in your shop, Minister, nothing? I'd have to I'd have to go back and get some clarification for you. But okay. Charlottetown West so. Royalty? <clears throat> in the MOU signed between Memorial and UPEI, there's a $3 million, um, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, maybe a curriculum kind of fee I don't know if that would what it be called who's have you have you heard from that fee or, or is the province of Prince Earl I'm paying that or like I said I I think the Memorial University that's with health PEI okay okay perfect shall carry no nope. oh, sorry time I, um, I asked you about open source just a quick question on open source uh, um, <coughs> I guess the chair would actually know more about open source information. Uh, $50,000 last year, 50000 this year. I know when things get open sourced, it, there might not, I don't know if it, it becomes more expensive or less expensive, but I know that the budget line's 50000 last year, 50000 this year. Can you say, is that, is that enough money to, to uh, open source everything we need? We're certainly committed to, to watch and ensure that it is covering what it needs to cover. So we'll, we'll keep a close watch on that. And any investment we make into our post-secondary to help remove those barriers, mm -hmm. uh, we pay pretty close attention to. Shall I carry? No, just a second. Oh, sorry. Shall um, I We talked about it today. There was a letter from the PEITF uh, about the need for French teachers in Prince Edward Island. The program here, and, and I think there was a talk about uh, a lot of students are coming in from Quebec getting their uh, degrees and then moving back but here what I find surprising is that the the budget and restricted funding for the uh, French Bachelor of Education is three hundred and eighty thousand dollars and that that money is flat um, there's no increase in that but we need a demand for that um, uh, wh why why didn't we look is that restricted funding from the federal government is that what it's a partnership with the federal government all 380 Three. I I, uh, I don't have the details of what the federal government contributes, but our contribution is 380. Charlotte, how much royalty? It's the 380. I'm uh, just wondering, is is there any room for that to be uh, in, in, increased? Are, are we full? Do we have enough stu stu island students promoting French uh, language education in Prince Edward Island? Because it's it's a it was clear today in that letter that it's a it's a, it's a real problem. I think the university uh, works hard on, on their recruitment efforts, and it's their, like those are their programming. We certainly would stay in tune to that and have those conversations. They would be working uh, diligently to, to fill those seats, knowing that we have that gap here. They'd also work very close with CSLF and, and public schools branch to ensure what do the spaces look like. That drives, uh, you know, your educational and yeah. workforce. So they would be working hard to 
promote also I would think you know um, from a, a past recruiter is that when we know there's an identified gap I'm in the high schools and I'm talking to students about those opportunities and we're finding ways we have added additional investments again this year to George Coles we're trying to remove as many you know financial barriers that might present themselves mm -hmm. um, but to continue I think to educate what positions look like mm -hmm. what does it mean to be a teacher a nurse because I think that oftentimes we just promote them but we don't educate on actually what that means and we want them to be the right fit and to make those good decisions. Exactly. Okay. Charlotte Carey. Thank you. Carey. Total post oh, sorry. Total Department of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. No. Pardon me. Total post secondary and continuing education. 109 million 109,800. Charlotte Carey. Total Department of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. 151 million 622,800. Charlotte Carey. All right. Congratulations, Minister. Okay. No, one more? Two. EDA one and SFA. Ah, yes, the Employment Development Agency. <laughs> We're, on. <laughs> We're on page 175 here, members. Uh, general appropriations provided for administration of program delivery, budget management, and payment processing. Administration 7100, equipment 2700. Material supplies and services 700, professional services 5,000, salaries 196,100, travel and training 6,000, total general 270,600. Shall it carry? Okay. Community and business projects. Oh. No, I'll carry that. <laughs> Community and business projects appropriations provided for wages of individuals hired by businesses and nonprofit organizations to work on approved projects, the majority of which are rural based. Special projects program, 3,450,100. Job creation program, 689,600. Jobs for youth program, 1,875,300. Rural enhancement employment program, 922,900. Total community and business projects, 6,937,900. O'Leary and Burness. First, I want to give a shout out to Elliot Dean, one of the workers in your department that uh, uh, sort of helps work through these programs and helps fund people employment. So I, I want to, he, he does a great job and, and he seems to know how to fit things, so I appreciate that. But I, I do, uh, that was an issue that was sort of in the past and it may, it may be addressed by now, but there's the Rural Enhancement Program. It seems like that was under somebody else, uh, that was under our growth, Rural Growth Initiative person. So, I, 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 is this now going to be under Elliot moving yes, forward? This now program falls under Workforce and Answering Population. Yeah. Well, Larry so, and Burness. So, okay. So from now on, it would be Elliot that we would deal with when it comes to, in my writing, I guess uh, that for a REAP application. I would have to confirm that, but I would think so. Yeah. Well, that. Well, Larry and Burness. Yeah, and that logically makes a lot of sense because that was the problem last time. We kind of had. Uh, duplications of applications and it was a bit confused and who to get what so I, I'd want to commend on that and the only other little concern I'm going to add up on is as far as special projects I'm assuming the increase in that is really only based on the fact that the minimum wage has increased correct yeah and I Larry and Burnett. so my only little concern in that I, I I sort of feel that there's a little more pressure coming on on a program like that uh, nonprofits seem to be more challenged in trying to Op, be operational, and, uh, and I've had conversations with Elliot, and he said, well, I don't know if we can handle many more applications that come in based on, on what we're dealing with with the existing people that are in programs that are there. So I'm just wondering, is that uh, an issue that you're seeing in other districts that, that may be a challenge, or, and, and I'm concerned whether there be enough money. I, I haven't heard this feedback just yet. I do know that these programs are, are detrimental um, island spread. Um, I do know that they're used um, effectively and they're important to, to your area for sure. Um, but we'll certainly um, keep listening uh, and our goal is to help people. So we'll certainly continue to listen to that. Um, I for one have a message I wanted to send to the <laughs> minister. So. Thank you. O'Leary and Burness. And is there anything that can be done? Like one of the problems I find is that once people seem to get into the program and with a nonprofit, they they never leave. 
And that puts a lot of act on the new people kind of coming into the program. And I know the REAP program is a little bit of a help towards that, but uh, do you have any kind of a contingency plan for how long this continues for individuals, especially as they get up into, I'll say, more senior age? Like I say, it's very complicated in trying to uh, deal with those issues. We've certainly um, done some work around criteria, because uh, like you say, you, you don't necessarily need want to be the, the salary line in, in people's areas. Um, you do want to help people where you can. Uh, new organizations, especially that haven't had access before, that would really like opportunity. Um, we have had um, quite a number that have applied this year that uh, are looking for some supports, and we'll continue to work uh, together with our department on that. I, I guess my final point, just I, I see that's an issue. I, I wonder, I hope that if there was a case that you were at a budget, limit that there would be some flexibility to try to uh, uh, accommodate people who are in a certain sense of need. Because if they're not on your budget, I can pretty well tell you that the member walking in front of you is probably the budget it's going to be on. Warden <laughs> <laughs> Concora. Warden <laughs> Concora, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so in, in my district, we have the Central Development Corporation. Does that fall under this at all for funding? No. No? Okay. Morning, Pinkar. So, further on that, would the Central Development Corporation be eligible to receive funding under this program to then disperse out in so any there, way? There'd be different criteria under each program. So, EDA and, and the Employment Development Agency is like the umbrella. Within that umbrella, there are programs underneath. So, Jobs for Youth is one, Special Projects, you know, our Jobs Creation Partnership, and, and REAP. Um, so, and then there's like a student program that now falls into uh, under skills, but they could certainly look into the different categories to um, look at what access they could have to apply to programs. Okay. And, and I understand, remember, these are important programs, and I, I would highly recommend you ask for a full briefing from the department on them to help your constituents. But go ahead, Bob Barton, Cora. Okay, sure. So you mentioned, Minister, the special projects program, which I believe is capped at, is it 13 consecutive weeks? For that to be eligible for that program? I guess my, my question, if that's true, and I'll give you time to look, I just want to try and speed things along. If that's true, why do we have the limit set at that, at that 13 weeks? And if we could maybe put some more funding towards it, yeah. it's not uh, a very long period of time. Yeah, it's, it's actually capped at, uh, it's based on 12 weeks. And we, we, you and I can certainly sit down another time. We can go through all the programs um, and, and what's the rationale behind how they're developed and what the targets are for sure. Shall I carry? Sure. Total Employment Development Agency, 7155500 Shall I carry? Sure. All right. PEI Student Financial Assistance Corporation. General, appropriations provided for student assistance in the Community Service Bursary Program, administration 750 15,000, debt 1,284,600, equipment 115,000, professional services 20,000, grants 12,515,000, provision for loan losses 355,000, total general 15 million 4,600. We're on page 177, members. Board and Concora. So this is obviously, doesn't say it in the description, but it's post-secondary assistance. Yeah, it, this is where we uh, administer the PEI student loan portfolio. Okay. Board and Concor? So, so for, for high school graduates pursuing post-secondary education? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how often do the terms of that program get examined? I mean, I, I've had a concern from a constituent who says that it doesn't apply to him because of the, the parameters. Um, you know, he's being forced into a, a financial loan with a, with a financial institution. And I guess I'm, I'm just wondering if, if there's been review done to determine that the allocated funding available through this is actually meeting the needs of, of the student population today, given the financial pressures on, uh, you know, cost of living, uh, accommodations, you know, it, it, is it meeting the needs of students in 2024? Yeah, so I, there are a number of bursaries in here. One, as the Minister mentioned, uh, the George Coles, which we did increase this year from 3000 to $3,200. Um, there's other bursaries, 
uh, such as debt when they finish school or when they're first starting school um, or when they're in high school, such as community service bursary, um, to work towards some, um, excuse me, sorry, uh, volunteering their community, but we provide a, a maximum per student uh, based on, I think it's $10 an hour. Uh, Board of Concord. You, you mentioned the George Coles bursary, but I think that's only eligible for for their their first first degree. I don't think if you're if you're continuing on with your education. Correct. Uh, is, is there consideration given to expanding the 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 eligibility of that because it's an important bursary? So I guess I was wondering if if it's also again my question meeting the needs in today's student population. So what I would say right now is George Coles was designed to. Um, help encourage students to stay and study in, in PEI um, from the beginning. Um, also to remove barriers where we could. Um, I think that um, we, would, we would look into future investments um, potentially, but right now we're, we're trying to you know, help them remove barriers to get them into their first uh, career outside of their education. Um, so that's where the investment is focused currently. Board Concord. What, what about the, the Island Advantage program? Um, I don't think I'm seeing new funding here for that this year, and I, I think that's you know, I, for students who need it the most, right? most you know, disadvantaged students coming through. And I guess my question as it pertains to the budget, Mr. Chair, is how come we're not further investing into that particular program? So that one is designed on needs based. So that's we, we whoever's asking and accessing it. So we wouldn't um, cut a budget that's being used. Um, we would ensure that those that are reaching out would be eligible to. There'd be money there for them to access. So it is needs based and reviewed regularly. Morning, King So there is money there for it, but there's nothing specifically earmarked for the. Yeah, there's. There's, there's 3.3 million earmarked for it. Yes. Warren Kinkara. And do, do you keep data on the student on the on that so in order to, to know if that's an appropriate amount? Do you, yes. you, you keep the, the metrics on that? Absolutely. Yeah. So there, this year, last year, I guess there was over uh, 1,200 students. 12. Over 1,200 students. Okay. Warren Kinkara. Okay. Thank you. Just a couple more of them, might, Mr. Chair. Uh, what, what's a capture of the relief programs? What's that included? <coughs> Uh, where are you at, sir? Where are you seeing Sorry, that? sorry, where you see the... You don't, you don't... We're just wondering where you see... Oh, sorry, that's the, that's the debt reduction. Uh, so that is paid to reduce uh, student loan, PEI student loans upon graduation. Okay. Board Concord. And, and, and... What, what eligibility criteria is there for, for that? Is that needs-based as well? Is it an application process? No, it would be an application. I, I think the only criteria that I know, but all of this would be probably available online, but is a, uh, you must be living on PEI six months after graduation. Okay. That would be the big criteria that I can recall. Okay. Warren Kinkora. No, thank you for that. I was just, I wasn't sure what that pertained to, but it's the debt forgiveness. Um, and, and then my last question or two would be about the healthcare related field line for $530,000. I guess I'm wondering what healthcare related fields are included uh, in that line. So it's, it's a new bursary that we're still working on. It's, um, it's hoping to similar the George Coles, but it's just, we're not gonna call it the George Coles. Uh, it's for students working their first undergraduate undergraduate degree who are attending schools off island in a health related field. Boring Concord? So say off island in a health related field? Right. Nova Scotia and New Brunswick would be the first series that they're examining right now to help um, students that are studying there. Uh, we're still working on how the process will work um, to ensure that the students will have access. Okay. Boring Concord? Did you indicate what field of studies? We're we're concentrating health related right now when we're on the rollout, but we don't we don't have the certain programs identified yet. Okay. Uh, final question, just as it pertains to that, that's very interesting. Is it um, are there are there strings attached to that, such as a return for service? It's it's expected, but again, we're we're still working that out. Okay. Child care. Thank you. Care.
Total PEI Student Financial Assistance Corporation, 15,004,600. Shall it carry? Total PEI Student Financial Assistance Corporation, 15,004,600. Shall it carry? Oh. Thank you, members, and uh, thank you, Minister. So I believe we're going to Executive Council next, which is uh, page 69, or no, 68. So the Honourable Premier is coming to the floor. Welcome, Premier. Thank you. Uh, would you like a stranger? I would love to bring a stranger, please. Right. Is that the will of the committee? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Carried. Hello and welcome. If you could uh, state your name and position for the record, please. Kelly Bulger, Director of Finance for the Executive Council Office. Welcome, Kelly. Uh, did you want to make a statement at all, or should we just get right into it? No. I've, made, I've made enough statements in here, uh, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Office of the Premier. Appropriations provided for the operation of an office to support the Premier in carrying out responsibilities as Leader of Government and as President of the Executive Council. Employees provide program and policy advice, administrative support and organization, and liaise with the public and the media. Administration, 22,000. Equipment, 3,500. Material supplies and services, 5,500. Salaries, 1,138,200. Travel and training, 69,200. Total office of the Premier, 1,238,400. Shall it carry? Oh, leader of the third party. So, um, welcome to the floor. Thank you. Uh, the, the Premier's office budget was 633000 before um, before he took office. Premier now, it's almost $1.2 <coughs> almost double. I'm wondering if you can just comment on, on this increase. I don't know what to say other than we will probably have more people and expanded uh, requirements. Leader of the third party? It's been five years since you've been in here as well. Um, how many communication staff does the Premier's office have? There's just one digital communication staff in the Premier's office. Leader of the third party? Thank you, Chair. And no other communications? I believe there's one assigned by the D Departmental Communications section. So when we get there, um, that person supports the Premier's office as well. Yeah. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Is the principal secretary the main comms person now? I would say no. I think the principal <coughs> secretary certainly oversees the CAPE organ, CAPE group and interacts with uh, executive council with those offices. But principal secretary has many, many duties and uh, overseeing communications will be one of them. Leader of the third party. In the chief of staff and principal secretary. Do you want to read that? Because I don't have my glasses. <laughs> <And Kelly>. uh, <laughs> I just wonder, can you relate that to the budget? Um, I'm not sure if that's really a budget yes. question or not. Well, I'm yeah. just just looking at a budget line, just wondering about a question about the, the position itself. Kelly that's has a, Kelly has a okay. we can read that. Okay. So the chief of staff, staff works with, uh, make sure all department, sorry. <laughs> All operations are implemented on a daily basis. They work with the deputy ministers on a daily basis to ensure direction of government is set out, um, per the speech from the throne, it, and ensures that those commitments are implemented. And the principal secretary interacts with the le legislative arm to make sure bills, motions, along with working with various department <coughs> leads on a number of issues. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And I'm just wondering um, about the the Premier's office in Summerside, about the, the cost for that. I just don't see it. Um, I don't budget. have the cost broken out by office. We had one support added last year, a, a salary ad added last year. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So that so there's one staff then in that office? Yep, yes, we have one position. And one more, but there's two. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And and I'm I'm wondering, <coughs> would you have uh, an, any idea of, of what other costs would come out of that for the Summerside office, whether it be programming or? It would mainly just be like office supply costs, telephones, those sorts of things, administrative costs. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Actually, I'm I'm good for that. Shall carry. <laughs> Total office of the Premier one million two hundred thirty-eight thousand four hundred. Shall carry. 
Executive Council Office appropriations provided for the operation of the Office of the Clerk and the Executive Council, responsible for the administration of Cabinet processes and management of Cabinet records, the Cabinet Committee on Policy and Priorities, responsible to direct and oversee the legislative and policy work required to fill government's plan, and align it with fiscal and governmental agendas. Cabinet Committee on Housing, responsible to direct and oversee housing priorities within the province and engage PEI. Administration 33,300, equipment 5,000, material supply and services 29,700, professional services 65,600, salaries 2,216,300, travel and training 11,000, total Executive Council Office 2,360,900. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so last year, Executive Council had hired uh, an anti-racism policy uh, advisor. It's the, not under this section in particular. Is that how does is but is that part of your it, part of the executive council office? Yes. So there's a separate anti-racism office in a following section. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's just on page seventy. Okay. Do you want to prepare for that? Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you just give us a brief um, overview of what came out of the strategic planning professional service for thirty-one thousand? So it was supports provided to Executive Council for planning and operations, facilitating, and supports for the Deputy Minister's Committee, um, expertise and advice for priority initiatives. Either the third party, one more, and I'm going to go to okay. Scott. Great, thank you. Um, so the, the recent uh, equality report card that came out raised concerns about the province's um, not quite meeting the, the threshold for gender parity with respect to appointments on chairs, uh, or sorry, on boards and agencies. And I'm wondering if there's any, any monies in this budget to, to deal with that. Nothing specific. Um, were it to be consultant costs, we, we do have a consultant budget. It's for uh, items as they, as they arise, so that's not specific to any particular um, initiative. So if we had to hire, we would be able to do so. Uh, Charlotte Town West Royalty. Uh, thank you. Um, just wanted to ask about how, um, I don't know what you can talk about, the, the Cabinet Committee on Housing, how that's helped the housing in Prince Edward Island. Do you find it's, it's streamlined there or is it, has it put extra barriers in place to that? Uh, it certainly hasn't put any extra barriers. I think it brings everybody together to make sure we're working together as much as possible to deal with housing. Charlotte Town West Royalty. What are the, I don't know, like, I know it's confidential, but is there any milestones or is it, is it just picking up the pace of housing? Um, um, I'm not sure what goes through just, there. Just a reminder, <clears throat> try and relate it back to the budget if you can. Well, it's just in the uh, description, Cabinet Committee on Housing responsible to direct and oversee housing priorities within the province. So, so you're, you're I'm just asking how how does that direct and oversee? Is the budget enough for them to be effective? Is that what you're asking? Or? Well, you, I guess you could do that. I just want to know why there's no housing being built. At a, like, yeah, I mean, and that, that, my, that speaks directly to my point. <laughs> That's not a budget. Well, it's for the question. private sector. I want to know. So, are we are we doing enough social housing? Are we building a new housing? Uh, social housing. So if you are could relate it back for, to the budget, member, I would be very grateful. Well, it's hired in this section, but I'll. Carrie, I'll Carrie, <clears throat> what Carrie, I want. Uh, member, you have the floor, Charlotte. Oh, do I? Charlotte. Okay, great. Um, the the minister of social development uh, is not on that committee, as far as I know. That was a split between Department of Housing and Social Development. You split those. And I, made, I had some concerns about that split to help our uh, most vulnerable people in Prince Edward Island. Is the Minister of Social Development still not on that Cabinet Committee, or, or did you make that change? Uh, the Committee has remained what it has been since we started. Okay. Shall I carry? Carry. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the Cabinet Committee on Policy and Priorities, um, I know they oversee the legislative work, and we've seen a significant decrease in the number of bills that we were told would be coming to the floor, many of which have passed first reading. And I'm wondering if, so um, 
I, I know this isn't quite related to budget, so I guess I'll have to change my question a little bit. I was wondering if the committee recommended the bills not come forward, but I'm wondering how, like, how do they, what compensation, do they get compensation for that, for that to be on that committee, or, or what's the budget line for that? CCOP? No, that's part of your duties as a cabinet member. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> What's that? Oh, I didn't say anything. Sorry. It wasn't so remember, you have the floor. Leader of the third <laughs> Thank party. You, Chair. It wasn't me. <laughs> uh, uh, someone said something over there. Uh, so, Cabinet Committee on Housing. Uh, I know the member asked a couple of questions on that, but is there a budget for that committee? No, it's it's like Treasury Board or CCOP, where the ministers come together. It's a table where they can bring in individuals to make sure things are moving forward, to ask questions, and, and to move files forward. It's, it's not a it's not a benefit. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. It's operational. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I guess then um, um, I will save the rest of my questions for a later time. Charlotte Town West Royalty. Just under professional services, what's the six? What what do we spend the seventy four thousand dollars on specifically? So that was our forecast. We spoke earlier about some work we had on strategic planning. Um, we had some external legal services. We had some policy guidance. Uh, we had a contract related to the Policy Capacity Development Forum. Uh, we had a contract related to a workshop for executive council staff on roles and responsibilities and how they can support cabinet and, and government. Um, we had uh, social priorities setting engagement session for deputy ministers. Okay. Sorry, how much I'm just confirming, I know the, the the Caroline Donnelly contract was under the Department of Housing, but the minister, the Premier was on record to say that she was a special <coughs> advisor to him uh, at one point. Uh, can you clarify that there was no money in this, in this uh, area for that? I, I don't believe so. I didn't catch no. the contractor name, but... Okay. Or from the Premier's office in any way? <laughs> Nothing in the Premier's office either. Okay. Yeah. Shall carry? <coughs> Total Executive Council Office, 2,360,900. Shall carry? Carry. Intergovernmental and Public Affairs, Intergovernmental Affairs Secretariat, appropriations <coughs> provided for research, consultation, and analysis of cross government issues, provision of support and advice. <laughs> In preparation of briefing documents on strategic intergovernmental issues and opportunities to ensure that the interests and priorities of the province are pre pre presented in dealing with other governments. Administration 4,400, equipment 2,000, material supply and services 2,000, salaries 876,900, travel and training 40,500, grants 93,400, total intergovernmental affairs secretariat 1,019,200. Um, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering, the, what are the, the intergovernmental priorities that are being funded in this section? Do you have a, a, like a high, high level? Just high level for Executive Council? Yeah. Um, uh, so work with Cabinet Committees to work with Departments to ensure that the business of Cabinet and its committees is conducted in a timely and efficient manner. Welcome approaches that prioritize collaboration with Departments and help improve processes across government. Um, inter, uh, intergovernmental affairs specifically, um, build capacity and expand departmental engagement to prepare for hosting the Council of the Federation in 2526 and to provide lasting internal communications improvements and create and strengthen island to island relations. Uh, Charlotte Town West Royalty. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks. Just just to, to pick up on this, um, so the, just, just to confirm, the anti-racism office is separate of Indigenous Affairs, correct? It's a separate office, separate section, yes. And, and a member of that section is on page 70, anti-racism office. Just, oh, yeah, all right. See it. If you wanted to save your questions to then, or That's if you 70. have other ones. <clears throat> but go ahead, you have the floor. Okay, so intergovernmental affairs, is Indigenous relations under that section? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's coming Any next, of that? Indigenous relations secretariat. Okay. Perfect. Uh, Charlotte Town West Royal. Thank you very much. So it looks like we underspent on salaries on intergovernmental affairs. Can you can you talk about that? We had a vacant um, assistant deputy minister position. Charlotte Town West Royalty. Um, has that position been filled? 
It has not. There is somebody acting or performing the, the role, not as ADM, but um, supporting the Deputy Minister. Charlotte Town West Royalty. So, is there a job competition out for that? No, it would be by appointment. By appointment. Okay. Charlotte Town West Royalty. Um, <clears throat> looking at this, that um, under the grant section, it looks flat. What are the grants under this section? So, those are PEI's contributions to the Intergovernmental Affairs Secretariats. <laughs> so, that would be the Council of Atlantic Premiers, the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council the Canadian Intergovernmental Conference Secretariat, the Council of the Federation, and the Eastern Canadian Premier Secretariat. Charlotte Town West Royalty? 67,000 is, is a lot to, to be part of that group. Is, is that just the, what it costs, I guess, to be a, a Premier in the province? That seems like a lot to, what does that money go for? What do we get out of that? Atlantic Premier? Well, I, it funds various different uh, positions and activities. There's a director for higher education. There's a number of different positions over there. Uh, Mary Mazinski, who you would know, yeah. worked in that uh, capacity, and this would be one of the revenues that would uh, fund those positions. Perfect. This would be our contribution yeah. on a percentage type basis on okay. an annual basis. Chanel Carey? Carey. Indigenous Relations Secretariat, appropriations provided to fund consultations and negotiations under the Canada PEI Mi'kmaq <coughs> Partnership Agreement and Framework Agreement as the Indigenous Relations Secretariat facilitates, coordinates and leads all discussions with First Nations on behalf of the government of Prince Edward Island. The Secretariat provides funds to Indigenous specific programs and initiatives with grants to Abiquit First Nation, Aboriginal Women's Association of PEI, Abiquit Assembly of Councils, MCPEI and Illinois, Lennox Island First Nation and Native Council of PEI in support of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls capacity building work, core funding and infrastructure. Administration 4800, equipment 4600, material supply and services 3100, professional services 338,000, salaries 587,000, travel and training 14,600, grants 1,390,000, Total Indigenous, Indigenous Relations Secretary, 2,342,100. I'm going to go to old Larry and Burness. Uh, yeah, I'd be, I guess I'd be remiss on behalf of uh, Lennox Island First Nations in my district to not ask at least a little bit of a question on this. And I guess I'll, I'll pretty much stem back a little bit to the issue around the duty to consult process. <coughs> so do you have uh, certain staff that are affiliated with this duty to consult process? And how... how how does that work, or what's the role? When you decide you want to uh, pat or get rid of a particular property, that person then contacts Le Nue or, or Mi'kmaq Confederacy, or who do they approach? Yeah, there is a very formal process yeah, that is set sure. up, and a lot of it is through the Department of Transportation, but it's through a variety of different departments as well. But any time there would be a piece of land that the government was looking to divest, the process generally is... Uh, we do go through the duty to consult process first, if whether or not one of the First Nations or a group might want to identify a need or a historical, uh, you know, uh, component to that. And uh, um, so it, it's kind of all throughout government, but it's lar largely a lot through uh, transportation. Mm -hmm. Larry and Burnett. So is it a staff person that they contact within your your Indigenous Secretariat, or is it the... Uh, I'm just, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of... I would, I would have to take back the actual process. I, I don't think it's in this department, but I will, okay. I can bring that back for you. And only and Burnett. just one final question, just so of the $587,000, uh, how many people would that be that works in that section of your department? Kelly will tell you. Yeah, and I'm sure she will. <laughs> um, we uh, have... Get good O'Leary roots, that yes. lady. <laughs> we have uh, six positions here. Six, is it? Okay. Thank that's it. Leader of the third party? Thank you, Chair. So I'm wondering about um, where we are in terms of implementing the um, TRC calls to action. So I don't know if you have that in there. I have, uh, a, I have a little bit. Oh, okay, 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 excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So the IRS is working <laughs> with departments um, to draft the annual report. It is scheduled to be released on May 5th during Redress Day. Some highlights include senior management training was provided, again this year by Indigenous Relations to all 12 departments, um, an online reconciliation learning series to educate public servants on Indigenous awareness and, and reconciliation. Um, there's a dedicated annual fund of $500,000 
to support the Indigenous Working Group um, to engage and collaborate with the province on work related to gender-based violence and MMIWG. Um, the DTI worked with On the Way to project manage a $4.3 million project in Scotchford. Pages. It's pretty lengthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the leader of the third party. If you, if if you, could you table that? I can check for sure. <clears throat> yep. Because rather, it, and I believe it probably will be in the report that's coming yeah. out next May month. 5th. We do an annual report, yeah. as you know. So, yeah. Which was. So are you not satisfied Full with credit to the former leader of the uh, of the official opposition because it was his recommendation that we do an annual report. Yeah. So. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Okay, that's that will be that will be fine. I'd be happy to wait for that. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering specifically about one of the the calls to action, number 62, about indigenizing education. Do you, would you have um, any update on that one in particular? I don't believe I do. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, we could probably, if that, that uh, if that's not in the report, we can bring that back for sure. Yeah. And, and I, I appreciate your questions, Thank Remember, you. I, you know, I'm trying to get things focused on budget, and, and you know, and if you were saying, is there enough budget to achieve the goals, <laughs> for example, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any. I know the Premier and I we've talked about um, UNDRIP before, um, and I'm wondering if there's any money allocated in this budget for for looking at um, that. I'm doubtful if it would be undrip specific, but perhaps some of the uh, line items might catch components of that. I, I, I'm doubtful unless Kelly corrects me that there's something directly for undrip itself. No. But, yeah. I, I leave third party one more, and I'm just going to go. Okay. So. Um, another thing that we had talked about before, Premier, is how unindigenized <coughs> this room is, and we had <laughs> talked about like different things that potentially yeah. we could do. And, and I know that legislative assemblies across Canada are really, some of them are really impressive and they're working. That's kind of one of their goals to indigenize the, the province house. Now, I, are there their legislative assemblies? I recognize moving back over there, there will probably be a lot more. But is, uh, would there be anything in this budget to kind of increase the, the visual presence I guess would be that that would be through the legislative assembly budget but I would say quite honestly and openly if there was a recommendation from the legislative assembly through the committee on committees or alleged management that says we could put some money into uh, making uh, more indigenous art and history uh, available in here in some way shape or form I would be very happy to find a way to put that in the budget yes okay Charlotte Thomas royalty uh, thank you. When you're hiring staff in this section, do you have targeted hiring, Mr. Premier? Are, are, are the staff there Indigenous? Um, I, don't you? I didn't quite catch the question. Are the staff Indigenous? Oh, yeah, yeah, Lord, yeah. There are some for sure. I mean, obviously, uh, we would try very hard and lean very hard into making sure that we have as much of that representation of individual uh, um, uh, as possible. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there are some, but. So Tom West Royalty. The reason I ask that is because we try, try our best to, to have the indigenous communities, um, you know, being able to be at the forefront and, and lead this. And I was just wondering about uh, that at, at that level. Um, I would say in my in uh, I have tried numerous times to bring people in yeah. from other organizations, for example, uh, who uh, many who I've asked have felt they could serve their communities better by in the positions they were. But yeah. so as I, I have made, I know exactly what you're saying. I have made many efforts to yeah. uh, to bring in as many good people as I can across the Charlotte Thomas, well, uh, and I appreciate that's hard because what what you're seeing in that role and and. Is that the the, the, the pool that, that that there's so much talent, but there's there's they're in so demand both the, in this section and the next section. So I, that's why I asked about targeted hiring as something that the federal government does it. Um, we don't do it. We have job pools in the PSC, and and that's that's great. But I'd like to see, especially at something this important, and it's something that maybe you could consider looking into and, and looking at the federal model and potentially using it here. 
So I have, I have some. I would. Go ahead, I, Charlotte. Can I watch royalty? Um, so I, I like to see the the grants uh, improve. But how much of this is is uh, federal dollars? Do you know the breakdown between federal and um, that comes through so that, the, or is it all provincial? This is mostly provincial. Yeah. Um, so we do have a relationship here with the interministerial women's secretariat who is receiving funding um, under the. Maybe. The National Action Plan to End Gender-Based Violence. Mm -hmm. So um, there's $250,000 to the MMIWG organizations that's related to that plan. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Shout out to Tom Westworld. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and I'll ask in this section is that um, there is no involvement in the anti-racism office that reports into the Indigenous Relations Secretary whatsoever or the Indigenous Manager whatsoever. Is that correct? I didn't quite understand yeah, the question. I think the member is trying to understand how the Indigenous Relations Secretariat and the Anti-Racism Office work together. No, no. No? Go ahead, member. You reword yeah. it then. Um, <laughs> um, is the, there, there's a, a director of Indigenous, the Indigenous Affairs, correct? Correct. So the Anti-Racism mm -hmm. Manager would not have ever reported into or changed to report into that director, correct? Uh, I, I don't believe, but we did a reorganization within that department, as you know. And I know it was brought up in question period on one of the days I wasn't here. Uh, but um, so I'm not sure of the individual who's in charge of one or the other, uh, but we did make some reorganizations in there. So I, I, I could bring back the org chart for you if that helps. Charlotte, how much Charlotte? Who made that reorganization? Because the budget doesn't reflect that reorganization. Uh, we did. I said when Rochelle Gallant retired as the ADM, we uh, we replaced that position and we uh, we brought the uh, we the what do we want to call it? The the assistant clerk. We combined the, uh, assistant. Combined the assistant clerk with uh, with the uh, minister of uh, the deputy minister. So we took two and made it into one role. And there would have been some trickle down through that. Uh, shall I have us faulty? One more, and I'm going to uh, leave okay. it. There and I'll, I'll ask both in this section and the next section. I just have to ask these because sure. these questions. And um, um, who made that decision to reorg Indigenous in the Indigenous director that that anti-racism affairs would be under that? That. Yeah, that would have been conversations with myself, with the clerk of executive council, and some senior manager of, of my team, uh, and recommendations would come from that. Leader of the third party? Um, so the, the $200,000 under professional services for legal services, um, the Aboriginal Agreement Frameworks and General Consultation, um, can you give us um, an update on what that was for? So that's general um, advice. Um, I can just give you a little bit more. So it's when we need to contract for external legal legal expertise on indig indigenous laws and other matters. Primary focus is on consultation relating to the framework agreement. Leave it to the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we know the. Uh, the Mi'kmaq and PEI have one of the smallest land holdings in the country. And I'm just wondering if there's any initiatives funded in here to help acquire with new land holdings. Would that be in this? There's nothing specific related to land in this budget. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the, the renaming of Confederation, Confederation Bridge to Epicuit Crossing. I'm wondering if there's a bit of an update on that, and is there any is there any monies reflected in the budget needed for that even? No, I mean the Confederation Bridge is obviously federally operated. Um, uh, the legislature passed a motion; uh, we passed it on. We raise it in our intergovernmental affairs meetings, uh, but um, it wouldn't require any funding from us at this point. I would suspect if it changes. Uh, we would need to update some of the signing leading to the bridge, for example, uh, et cetera, like that. But I think that could be easily picked up within existing budgets uh, of, in transportation. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And what about signs? Um, like for, you know how we were renaming different communities? We would have the sign like Bedak and mm -hmm. Aptek, I think yeah. Bedak is. Um, do we have any more budget money in the budget for more? signs? Uh, I think we have increased that. I'm not sure if it's increased this year, but we have certainly over the last couple of years added to that. But uh, 
I don't know if that's a direct line item through our department. Not or through this department. Might be through transportation. transportation. Yeah. Okay. But it has increased in over a couple, the last couple of years. For sure. Yeah. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's any uh, reflection in the budget on one of Own the Way's uh, election asks, which was the change to the table of precedence to enshrine Mi'kmaq voices at official provincial <laughs> events and ceremonies. Uh, I don't know if it's a budget line, uh, but we could bring an update on where that's at. Leader of the, th Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And I'm wondering if there's any funding planned for Mi'kmaq specific business equity uh, funds for long-term projects that um, to help with prosperity and, and long-term well-being of First Nations communities in the province. There's nothing specific in this budget. I think there's some federal access yeah. to federal dollars. And there's a lot of the grants that we would have provided in some of the previous sections that would be going to specific enterprises such as that. A lot of these would probably be more efficiently dealt with on a one-off type of basis if the concept would come forward. They would need X number of dollars of provincial development. Could we help them access federal money, that type of thing? So, but I don't think there's anything specific in this particular budget for that. Thanks, Chair. Um, shall carry? All right, Anti-Racism Office, really appropriations provided to support the Provincial Anti-Racism Office and initiatives including the Anti-Racism Table, implementation of the Anti-Racism Action Plan, and grants to support community-led anti-racism projects. Administration, 14,400, equipment, 3,000, material supply and services, 8,000, professional services, 60,000, salaries, 313,200, travel and training, 14,700, grants, 375,000, Totally, total anti-racism office, 788300 Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, well, first of all, thanks for increasing the grants for next year. Um, that's fantastic. Um, I think that's a good positive start, and I think you kind of know, maybe know where my questions will go along this, this line, and I'm just trying to stay calm, but it, it affects... It, it affects... Um, the community and this is the last line of defense so we underspent on salaries um why did we underspend on salaries so we had a vacant uh, position which ultimately will be a project manager position oh sorry how much royalty pardon me so that vacant position, and I'm looking at the job description right now, and I've looked at it a million times over, was not filled, but my understanding was there was a successful candidate. There was somebody that was a successful candidate, went through all the positions. Was that, is that the case? And why wasn't that person hired? And who ended the competition? I think that's when I talk about the reorganization, that's uh, when the reorganization would have taken place. I don't know about the specifics you talk about about the interview process or whatever but uh, we there was a reorganization of the office and West royalty I don't understand a reorganization of an office they only had two people <coughs> I mean it does the office didn't need to be reorganized it needed to have a direct stream to deal with anti-racism stuff to go to you mr. premier now they have now they're reorganized through indigenous affairs and they have to report to a manager which reports to a director which report the, actually the manager is not even there anymore because he left why did the anti-racism manager the one position that was there for this why did he leave uh, this position which he cared about dramatically uh, I think he accepted the job out of the province for his own Charlottetown West royalty could it have been because of a reorganization uh, I wouldn't want to presuppose any of that I wouldn't know the individuals feelings or probably wouldn't be fair for me to comment on them one more member point. I'm gonna to go to the leader of the third party and come back to you Charlottetown West Royalty who has um, who has the authority to stop a competition about such an important role in your office I, I, I have to know that I've asked the Minister of Finance this question she said that she was going to ask you to bring it back. 
I asked her again on the floor of the legislature. I still don't have a response. And I, I just need a response to this because I want you to succeed in this role, uh, Mr. Premier. I want you to succeed. This is exactly where it needs to be. I'm just, I'm just, I just don't understand here what, what's, what's happening. And I know it's not your fault. I know it's I just, I just want independence so that, that you, that the people who are marginalized in Prince Edward I have a direct line to you, Mr. Premier. Um, to get make sure that they have their voices heard and that's where my problem is on all this and I hope you can understand that and I just want the answers Thank you leader of the third party. Thank you chair um, So I'm wondering about the plans to develop an anti-racism strategy There was thirty thousand dollars dedicated to the action plan last year um, and then 25,000 for community engagement, 5,000 for Indigenous engagement. I'm just wondering um, what this engagement looked like and, and, and what kind of the top, what we're looking at here. So that was for the purposes of developing the, the um, action plan, which was released last June. Um, and I do a progress report if, if that's helpful. Okay. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, sorry. Sorry. Um, so, um, there were three pillars under the action plan, one related to inclusive culture and, and cohesion um, in terms of progress towards that. Uh, one of the actions was to the on rec online reconciliation series um, that was to educate public servants um, that was launched in October of 2023. Um, one action was to establish the anti-racism office, which was completed in 2023. One was to create an anti-racism page on the government website, which was completed in fall of 2023. Um, the second pillar related to BIPOC representation and advancement. And um, one of the actions was to implement recruitment efforts directed at racialized and indigenous communities in collaboration with the PSC and support of their diversity and inclusion strategy. And work has been initiated. Uh, second action was to establish a baseline, baseline and measure progress in the representation of racialized and indigenous communities at all levels within the provincial public service and work has been initiated and encourage and support racialized and indigenous staff to participate in leadership development opportunities and work is under, ongoing. Um, there was an action to update the provincial government harassment policy to include discrimination and that was completed in 2023. There was an action to implement strategies to increase diversity in ABCs <coughs> agencies, boards, and commissions. That's ongoing and work will be go happening in spring of 2024. And there was an uh, action to address barriers to entry to public service. Um, and that was ongoing and work will be happening also in spring 2024. The third pillar relates to leadership legislation, program and policy review. And there was an action that the ARO would work collaboratively with departments to advise on strategies and tools to address systemic racism. And that is ongoing. Um, next action is reviewing policies and procedures through an equity lens. And that is ongoing. There was an action to review proposals for newer substantive amendments to legislation. And that is ongoing. And there was work completed and started in fall 2023. Um, there was an action to review government process to address barriers to racialized and indigenous communities. And that is ongoing. And finally, um, there was an action to deliver an annual progress report, and so that is expected to happen in the next coming in the coming months. Leader of the third party. Great, thank you. That was very informative, and I look forward to, to the progress report. Um, so, uh, the anti-racism table. Uh, how much funding is dedicated to that? So we added thirty-four thousand dollars in twenty-two twenty-three. 18,600 in 2324. Leader of the third party. And how much are members paid for their participation? I believe the chair is per meeting $113 and a member is 63, 73, something like that. Leader of the third party. Thank you, chair. Uh, and I'm just wondering. Uh, if it's a funding problem, why there haven't been any reports about the anti-racism table recommendations to government. We haven't really seen anything there. I don't have any information on that, but I can check in on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
uh, Charlottetown West Royalty? Yeah, there was one, and it was it was good. And that's a good question, though, because it's um, again once you set up tables, which are good, and it was part of the petition. So congratulations, to the manager, on doing that. Um, but but they, they their recommendations really have to be looked at seriously. So and and I, I appreciate that eighteen thousand that you talked about was that an additional money to the thirty four thousand? So that was brand new funding when the when the table was established the first year twenty two twenty three. Cut. Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, Sorry. We uh, is there somebody currently acting as the manager of anti racism uh, affairs? Right now, because we don't have one. I don't think uh, I don't, specifically. I'll bring West. back the org chart for you, so you'll know who's there. Yeah. Charlottetown West Royal. Uh, I, I kind of I, I know this org chart, but I know that the manager is not there. I know what I do know is that there's a competition out, and I think you do have a lot of candidates. I think the, I think there's a good, healthy amount of candidates, as far as I know. 16, I think. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> my my question, I guess, is. <sighs> I have, I have two two questions. First one I'm going to ask right now is that there is that competition out there. Will you not only look for one position, but will you look for the second position there at the same time, if it's possible, go back and make a special equity decision to look at, at hiring two people out of that, one for the manager position, one for the position that remains vacant. I don't even know if that's possible, but that's what equity looks like in, in Prince Edward Island, and that's how you do it. I would have to make sure that the Public Service Commission yeah. would be, there's processes and procedures that they would go through. I would hope that if someone was identified in that uh, uh, trove of applications that would be uh, a good employee elsewhere in government, yeah. I hope that would get passed through the system quickly. So. And remember, just before you continue, I just want to give everyone a heads up. We're going to have a 10-minute uh, recess at 5.20 um, because there's some audiovisual work that has to be done. Okay. And uh, then we'll, we'll come back in here uh, at 5.30. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure there's no surprises. Okay. Go ahead, Charlottetown West Royal. And thanks for entertaining that. I know it's harder than just an ask. I know you'll have to check with the Minister of Finance, but it, there's some various things that could go on for a long time in this. But what I want to say is that you can't put anti-racism and indigenous affairs together under one shop. You can't do it because the indigenous community has come to me and said they it's it's separate. It's separate. And this is what's happened here at the highest level. It's not reflected that in the budget, but I know what's going on. And I want to make that to make that clear that Mr. Mr. Premier that we need to separate these and I would like to see them separated because they both do incredible work but they're separate and we need that's what equity is. Let them speak on their own devices. Let them talk and, and, and get the clearest direction to you as the Premier of Prince Edward Island. That's what I'll be supporting for the next few years. So I look Appreciate forward, I look forward to that. Thank you, Mr. Premier. Shall I carry? Total intergovernmental and public Close. affairs, 4,149,600. Shall I carry? Communications and public engagement, departmental communications and public engagement, appropriations provided for departmental communications officers, and public engagement support. Administration 21,700, equipment 15,800, material supplies and services 16,000, salaries 2,472,200, travel and training 15,200, total departmental communications and public engagement 2,540,900, leader of the third party. A lot of salaries under this section, 2.5 million. Wondering how many staff this division has? I believe 24 or 25. So those are senior communications officers and public engagement officers. So each department has um, communications people, but it's paid under one roof and they're just burst the yeah. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, and on that, uh, just a question about that. So communication officers for departments, just so I'm clear, are funded through Executive Council? Uh, leader of the third party. Um, so why, or who do depart, who do they, sorry, who do departmental communications officers report to? Is it their deputy ministers or is it directly to the Premier's office? It would be joint. So there's a senior manager um, within this section as well as they would have, of course, daily reporting um, to the deputy minister of the department they're assigned to. 
Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So, so when you first started in government, Premier, the salaries were 1.44 million. Now they're 2.5 million, and I'm just wondering why we're seeing such so much growth here, despite the limited, like not many more positions being added. Yeah, obviously, when the collective process takes place and there's increases, uh, that would be reflected here for sure. Uh, I think over the course of a few years, the, uh, a few positions have been added. <coughs> I would think mainly it would be picked up just with the, uh, whenever there's public sector increases that would get passed on through there. All right, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, just seems like a lot. So is there funding in this division to help fund the public engagement event that the Minister of Health committed to have in Summerside for an update on the Prince County Hospital ICU? Uh, I would assume that would be done through uh, the minister's department or health PEI or a combination of both, uh, but, but I, don't, I but doubt there's a direct line item for that meeting that we wouldn't have known was being held until yesterday or so. <laughs> Leader of the third party. Just making sure that there is funding for that meeting. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be, uh, the, the, each department would have operational dollars to host meetings, public engagements, etc. So. Shall I carry? Uh, oh, sorry. Shall I Tom Westworld? Well, no, I, maybe I'll just ask. I just have one question left in the whole section, so I don't know if I can uh, ask it here. Uh, well, sure. Shall I carry? Yeah, sure. Strategic communication and outreach appropriations provided for a range of services such as communications, planning, and strategy development, advertising, photography, and video production, editorial, media, web, social media, and public outreach to all government departments and agencies and the Legislative Assembly. Administration 21,600, 21,600, pardon me. Equipment 62,800. Material supply and services 567,400. Professional services 32,000. Salaries 1,580,900. Travel and training 16,800. Total strategic communications and outreach 2,281,500. Excuse me. Um, shall I carry? A leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm wondering the difference between strategic communication and departmental communications. What would be what, what would be the bigger like in in the budget? Is there a bigger line item there? Like, is one more expensive than the other? And it, and would you be able to speak to any of the differences between the two? So the departmental communications are as we spoke about, like the the senior communications officers, the public engagement officers that are deployed to departments. In this section, we have, um, we have staff related to um, public outreach, uh, writers and editors, communications officers, web content, advertising strategists, web content strategists, multimedia, graphic designers, um, photographers, those sorts of positions. So this is a creative side versus the communications side. Uh, member, how many questions do you have? I'm just trying to decide whether I just push off the recess for a couple of minutes. I've got here. three or four more questions. Well, I think we can hold right. on, yeah. That's it. I think you can hold on for a All right, go ahead. Leave right, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm wondering if you can explain the underspend in salaries here last year. So we had some temporary vacancies, a photographer position, a social media coordinator, a web content strategist. So I know the photographer position is, is filled now, and I believe the web content strategist position is filled now. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And do you happen to know the province's annual advertising budget? Mm -hmm. We generally get asked every year, yeah. so I think we have. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the across yeah. all departments, yeah, for sure. For hours, yeah. um, but we have $524,000 in this section for media advertising. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And are advertising costs borne by Executive Council, or is it borne by each department? It's a combination of the two. So there are costs that are incurred and, and continue to be recorded here. There are also costs that are um, billed back to individual departments. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so I see on Facebook there's daily updates from the Premier. And I'm wondering <laughs> how much how much is, is spent on the Premier's <laughs> Facebook page? Whatever it is is way too much. I, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't know. Do, do. Uh, specifically, no. Not, not as spe specific as that. Yeah. We do have 
I know the question will be well, asked, but, I, yes. I believe. Um, so we have 92% of the advertising within this section um, is traditional or local, and the, the balance 8% is digital. Charlotte Town West Royal. Yeah, just one question. Um, I forgot to ask before. Uh, there was a, a quarter of a million dollar payment to a lawyer in Indigenous Affairs. What firm did they belong to? Uh, oh, it's Cox and Palmer. Cox Palmer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Charlotte Carey. 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 We done? Total communications and public engagement, four million eight hundred twenty-two thousand four hundred. Shall it carry? Great job. Total executive council, twelve million five hundred seventy-one thousand three hundred. Shall it carry? All right. So we're going to uh, recess now, and I'd ask everybody to be back at uh, five thirty-three and twenty seconds.